Yes, sir. And yes, ma'am. You had better get them up. Get them going. It is Tuesday. I'll hook them up with Ian Rod B. Five hour. Texas football conversation. We'll sprinkle in some other things, but obviously the Longhorns have a championship to play for on Saturday. And their final ever contest as a member of the Big 12 Conference, and it could be for the championship of the Big 12 Conference on their way out. We'll certainly talk about it here from Steve Sarkeesian, his weekly Monday news avail- media availability yesterday. Uh, we'll what team where they're headed in the Oklahoma State Cowboys, the opponent. Also, uh, week 13 or week 12, I should say, in the NFL wrapped up last night. Quite the dud on Monday Night Football. But uh, – Week 13 kicks off in Arlington with the Cowboys game. We'll get you details on that as we crank this thing up on uh, this 28th of November. We appreciate you being there wherever you find us here on Hook'em Up. Uh, could be on 1019 on the FM dial, maybe AM 1260. And, of course, streaming on our Horn app. We're always there on our smart speaker as well. Sometimes we uh, stream it on X or Twitter, whichever we're calling it right now. But uh, uh, I'll let, find out from TY if that is the case today on this a Tuesday. And uh, today with uh, no Rod Babers this morning. Rod Babers uh, under the weather. I was running a pretty high fever yesterday, the last check, and hopefully he's going to be okay. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and uh, man the ship today with uh, without our man, our shutdown corner. Hope he gets better and gets back with us here just as soon as he can. Hopefully for uh, Saturday in the Big 12 championship game and all of our coverage between now and then. So Ty Henderson will join me from the studio. Got a great guest lined up today. We'll talk to Ari Temkin at the bottom of the hour. Ari, of course, uh, former colleague of ours, but now man in the ship at uh, Sirius XM's Big 12 radio. Does the morning show there. We'll preview the Big 12 championship game, talk some Big 12 football with Ari. Uh, we'll also talk to Jerry Hamilton next hour from inside Texas. we got our buddy Mike Craven from Dave Campbell's Texas football. He was down in College Station yesterday where Mike Elko was introduced as the new head coach of the Texas A&M. Aggies. Uh, a lot of coaching conversations around the state of Texas involving uh, schools that, that he covers with Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine, uh, Aggieland, Houston, uh, Dave Aranda going to stay at Baylor. So we'll certainly talk about that uh, carousel as it heats up uh, here in late November, looking into December now. Uh, Ty Henderson is in the Horde headquarters. Ty, how are we doing back there uh, uh, on the banks of 360? All good? We're here in the uh, South Austin Onion Creek Studios cranking it up from our end. Yeah, feeling good and getting excited for game day Saturday. Game day is coming around the corner. Yeah, we hope Rod's okay. Rod reported 101.8 fever uh, yesterday to us and said, well, I said, you need to stay where you are. Uh, and we will uh, man the ship and man the show. But uh, hopefully he's going to get better and uh, be right back in here. But he would also at this point say thanks to those who serve. Thanks for those who get up and uh, first responders and, uh, you know, serve us in, uh, in any role or aspect, school teachers and uh, administrators in the, in the schools, of course. We've also got our first responders and our military, of course, doing what they do around uh, the state, around the country, and around the world so we can do what we do, which is talk sports and get you ready for a Big 12 championship game. Uh, you can also hit us on our text line. That's always open, 512-447-3776. Uh, that was a good way to, to communicate with us. We'll certainly talk about the Longhorns in this game. Hear from Sark coming up as we uh, get things ready. Also hear from Mike Gundy because uh, Mike Gundy is the opposition. Uh, kind of fitting that the Longhorns uh, get Mike Gundy on their way out of the Big 12, right? That was the one team uh, they didn't face in the regular season that has been a, a nemesis to the Longhorns and a longtime thorn in the, the, the Texas side. Uh, to have that opportunity, and as we said yesterday, Longhorns have a chance out because Oklahoma's traveling with Texas to the uh, SEC, of course. So you know, they lost to them this year, but you get to see them again next October. Uh, these teams that the Longhorns uh, won't face anymore, they're, they're posting victories. And uh, as we say, keeping, keeping the receipt, forever bragging rights uh, over the likes of uh, Baylor and Texas Tech with the big win last Friday. Uh, TCU, they got the win there. Of course, uh, Kansas State, Kansas on their way out. So you own the, uh, the all-time receipt on that. And now you have a chance to uh, take the bragging rights from Oklahoma State, who have really been a thorn on the Longhorn side, as I mentioned. They've won six of the last eight, I believe, against Texas, including last year's game up in Stillwater, where a uh, roller coaster of a game for the Horns, but they were in full control of that game and then uh, end up losing at Oklahoma State, and that would be the fear of this game on Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. Longhorns favored by more than two touchdowns now by the odds makers out in Vegas. They are the better football team, but you got to go execute for 60 minutes, and uh, as they have this year, find ways to win games. Uh, if you do, you're going to be a champion, and then you sit back and see what the uh, College Football Playoff Committee decides on Sunday morning. But it's uh, going to be a busy week, so we appreciate you being there. Let's start with our headlines, our top stories to get you cranked up. Make sure you're fully in the know as you get up and out to start your Tuesday morning. Top Gun Reynolds and Lawn Equipment bringing you the top stories, and it starts with college football. Seventh Rank Longhorns now in full prep mode for their showdown with Oklahoma State on Saturday in Arlington. Uh, Longhorns looking to seek their fourth Big 12 championship, their first since 2009. At his weekly Monday media availability yesterday, head coach Steve Sarkeesian described the team as focused and business as usual as they look to complete the mission. 
we're headed to Arlington Saturday, you know, 11 a.m. competing for, for a Big 12 championship. You know, quite frankly, that's been our mission and that's been our focus all year was to be champions this year. And we've earned that right. Um, and we've got ourselves in position to do that, uh, to think. In the last 27 he years here at Texas, there's only been three conference championships. Uh, and so we, we don't take this lightly. Uh, we know the challenge that it is to A, make it to the game, and then B, to ultimately win that game. Uh, so to be the fourth team to do it here in 27 years would, would be a heck of a deal if we could get it done. Uh All right, we'll hear more from Sark uh, coming up throughout the morning from his availability yesterday. Win or lose Saturday, the game will be the Longhorns' final ever in the Big 12 Conference. We know that. Word yesterday that the SEC plans to unveil the conference's entire 2024 schedule sometime in December, the first that will include Texas and Oklahoma in the expanded 16-team league. Ahead of the full release next month, ESPN's Chris Lowe revealed a number of dates of some of the bigger matchups yesterday, including three for the Longhorns. According to Lowe, Texas will host the Georgia Bulldogs on October the 19th of 2024. That will likely be one week after the annual showdown with Oklahoma at the Cotton Bowl. Texas will also make a trip to Arkansas on November the 16th and renew their rivalry with Texas A&M after a 12-year hiatus in College Station on Saturday, November 30th. And to close the regular season, that would be two days after Thanksgiving. The 2024 non-conference schedule for the Longhorns, we know, already includes home games with Colorado State, UTSA, and UL Monroe, plus that early September road game at Michigan. Speaking of Texas A&M, Aggies made it official yesterday, introduced Mike Elko as the program's new head football coach, replacing Jimbo Fisher. Elko left uh, A&M to take his first head coaching job at Duke after the 2021 season went 16-9 and in two years in Durham. Uh, Blue Devils had won just 10 games combined the previous three years. He takes the reins in Aggieland. Quite, NFL, quite the stinker. On Monday Night Football to wrap up Week 12 in Minnesota, Cairo Santos made a 30-yard field goal with 10 seconds left to give the Bears a 12-10 win over the Minnesota Vikings. Chicago improves to Four and eight without scoring a touchdown. Their defense intercepted Vikings quarterback Josh Dobbs four times. Minnesota falls to six and six. Week 13 in the NFL kicks off this Thursday night in Arlington. It's where the surging Cowboys host the six and five Seattle Seahawks in a good one to uh, launch the weekend. Pink slips in Carolina yesterday. Panthers fired head coach Frank Reich just 11 games into his tenure as their head coach. Reich, who replaced Matt Rule this past offseason, led Carolina to an NFL worst one and ten so far. Team also dismissed quarterbacks coach Josh McCown and assistant head coach Deuce Staley. Horn Headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Double up discounts this month by getting 5% off any rental or purchase of steel outdoor power equipment by donating two non-perishable food items from Capital Area Food Bank. TopGun.net, we'll shoot you straight. All right, there you go. Yeah, the FCC, we've already got some uh, some glimpses at the schedule, and obviously it's uh, it's what you expect. I mean, the Longhorns are you know looking to wrap up their tenure in the Big 12, one of the founding flagship members of the Big 12 Conference when it was founded in the mid-'90s. You heard Steve Sarkeesian say it, and it does, you know, you hear, you know, looking for their fourth championship in 27 years, not nearly enough. I mean, not nearly enough. We know the early part of the Texas run in the Big 12 was, you know, the John Makovic era, and they won the first won the first Big 12 championship back in the mid-90s, beat Nebraska in that huge upset, a 21-point underdog, found a way to win that game. And, um, you know, you turn around and you, you think, okay, now we're going to win many of these. We found this conference along with Oklahoma, Nebraska and A&M, as far as the, the founding members. And, you know, what do you know? Here we are 27 years later, and they've only won three. Uh, won um, two in the, in the 2010s, of course, 2005 and 2009. And, uh, but it's been a long drought. Uh, we're in the game in 2018 where they lost to Oklahoma. Uh, but this is the first trip back since then. And a big opportunity for Texas to uh, finish what has been an underachieving run in the Big 12, but certainly uh, finish it with an exclamation point on Saturday with a win and get to 12-1. and one. And then, as we say, sit back and see what the college football playoff uh, committee decides and how things fall on championship Saturday and Friday as if we're looking at the Pac-12. Uh, but, man, it's, it's a lot of storylines because, obviously, beyond this game will be next year, which is in the Southeastern Conference, which is a whole new uh, frontier for Texas. And uh, you just glance at the Chris Lowe's report yesterday and you realize what Texas and, and all the schools in the SEC are in for as a 16-team conference. Very difficult schedule, to say the least, uh, when you're talking about a September that will include a road trip to Ann Arbor, Michigan. I mean, look if you look at the Texas schedule for 2024 that we now are aware of, uh, you're playing, you know, number one and two in the country, at least in this year's, you know, 2023 standings. Uh, Georgia here in October, right after the Oklahoma game. You're playing Michigan at Ann Arbor. That'll be a new look team, obviously. There's talk to Jim Harbaugh, maybe looking at the National Football League, including that maybe that Carolina Panthers job that just came open yesterday with the dismissal of, of Frank Reich. But either way, we know we know what's going on in Michigan. 
They're one of the most talented rosters in the country. Uh, so that will be a huge challenge for Texas in September, much like this year's trip to Alabama was a huge challenge to start the season. So they've got that game. And then, of course, you look at October, uh, what we do know of. You've got uh, Oklahoma, traditionally Cotton Bowl, second Saturday of, of, of October, to be followed up now by a game with Georgia. And the Bulldogs with Kirby Smart. That game would be here. What a huge road home game, home, home tilt that will be. Uh, kind of thing you're looking forward to when you join the SEC. But then November uh, featuring road trips to Fayetteville to play Arkansas on the 16th. And then uh, wrap it up with the 30th with Texas A&M. We'll have a new head coach, Mike Elko, uh, who was introduced yesterday. What do you think about that, T.Y.? How about uh, the first, the, the re-engagement of Texas and Texas A&M uh, after 12 years, a dozen years not playing, finally going to play in College Station. You good with, uh, if that report is accurate, the uh, the Saturday after Thanksgiving for the uh, for, for the date of that ball game? That'll do. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they'll, they'll work it into the day after Thanksgiving soon enough. You think right? so? Yeah, I mean, because this is out now. They, could, they certainly could do that and make it a Friday game, one of those standalone, you know, huge contests, which, look, this is what the SEC wants when they're adding Texas and Oklahoma. They want these rivalry games. They want uh, the big brands. That's what sells, obviously, for the advertising to pay the, the, uh, the, the, the multi-billion dollar contracts that they're paying to, to have the rights to, te- to, to, to the Southeastern Conference. Those are the kind of matchups you want, and they're going to have a ton of them, including Texas with, with A&M, Texas with Georgia, Texas with with uh, Arkansas re-engaging with their old Southwest Conference foes. What were we going to say, Ty? Wasn't A&M pushing before, like, when, when all this SEC, uh, Texas and Oklahoma joining initially happened? Were they like, oh, LSU's our rival now? We play LSU that week? <clears throat> yeah, they, well, that's what they want. But, uh, that, <laughs> by the way, that LSU, that, that, uh, that LSU game for them will now be in September. Uh, that, according to the Chris Lowe report yesterday, that that game, that will slide into to, to a conference game for them in September. And then Texas will replace LSU at the end to wrap up their regular season, which is the right way. Aggies can say what they want, but that's that's what's right uh, to have that. You know, you want to play that game on rivalry weekend. We just came off rivalry weekend where the Ohio State Michigan game and uh, the Iron Bowl and all of them across the country. That's where that game belongs. And you know, I think the SEC will go ahead and tell Texas A&M to tamp down. This is where we're going to put this game. We'll put LSU uh, earlier. Uh, also, when you glance at that Chris Lowe, Chris Lowe report um, and story out yesterday. Got it some advance word on, on the schedule that will be released in December. How about this, Ty? You know, Alabama is another featured attraction. Um, you know, Alabama with, with Nick Saban. Of course, Longhorns beat them early in the year, and they haven't lost since. But for next year, how about this? Uh, Alabama will face uh, Georgia in a regular season game. That hadn't happened in a while. i got to look at the last time they played in the regular season. Uh, that typically is the SEC championship game because one's east, one's west. Uh, they're going to play a regular season game next year, September the 28th. Uh, Alabama is also going to face Tennessee in Knoxville on October 19th. Uh, Alabama will also play at LSU on November 9th because that's going to be one of their annual rivals. And then they're going to play at Oklahoma. Uh, on November the 23rd. So, uh, you know, Alabama will get both Texas – or they got Texas last year. They'll get Oklahoma this year. Longhorns play them in the non-con, but Texas won't face Oklahoma. They will face Georgia. So, yeah, man, it's uh, this is what, you know, the you know Kevin L. Kevin L. Teif, the uh, Texas System Board of Regents, Jay Hartzell, school president, Chris Del Conte, this was the, this was the mission. This was the goal. Well, speaking of missions, the Texas Big 12 championship game. Uh, but this was what the, the idea was, uh, to join the Southeastern Conference and create these huge you know, conference matchups, home games, home schedule. And there's no doubt it's more robust than what, what's been going on in the Big 12 Conference. And um, it does feel like, Ty, that uh, the Longhorns have built this program under Steve Sarkeesian in three years to be ready uh, to handle the rigors of that. I mean, not it's a much tougher schedule next year than it was this year. There's no doubt about that, uh, and that's to be expected. But uh, heading in the right direction and a chance to finish off this year with a Big 12 championship. No, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy where this team's at, where Steve's gotten this team at in the past few years, especially after that performance in Fayetteville uh, a few years ago where the, the lines of scrimmage clearly weren't, weren't SEC ready. Yeah, think about that. I mean, that's a good good place to point. I mean, the first year, go five and seven. But, yeah, the humbling loss at Arkansas. And think about the fate of those two programs since that game. I mean, that was that was a Sam Pittman team uh, that just humbled the Longhorns, who were not ready for the line of scrimmage, as you mentioned, Ty. Uh, it was an embarrassing game. It was uh, you know, Houston Street at quarter – excuse me, Hudson Card at quarterback, Houston Street. Hudson Card at quarterback in uh, Texas has built. And Steve Sarkeesian has flipped over the roster and, uh, you know, recruited very, very well and developed players very, very well and added players through the transfer portal. Arkansas has fallen on, on really, really hard times uh, since that game. They have not grown, and they are, you know, that all of a sudden doesn't look like much of a daunting game coming up at Fayetteville next November. Sam Pittman looks like he's going to hang on and remain the coach there, but, uh, man, it has been a rough year for them 
in Fayetteville. Uh, but I mean, to your point, I mean, Steve Sarkeesian's done a great job to, to turn the program, turn the talent, which is what it's about, uh, to be ready for uh, the, the lines of scrimmage of that league, the overall talent in that league. And, uh, and when your schedule includes Michigan and Oklahoma, then Georgia, uh, there's also, a, you know, the, when the full schedule is out, I believe the Longhorns have a trip to Gainesville, Florida. Uh, I believe that's going to be on the first schedule, if memory serves, when we, we got a glimpse of the, the games. That will be, you know, a, a huge challenge as well. But Billy Napier, the head coach at Florida, looks like he's going to stick along, you know, in the SEC. They're going to fire some defensive coordinators and staff uh, to rebuild the defense. But Billy Napier, uh, another guy who's, who's struggling in the Southeastern Conference right now. Longhorns will try their hand at it beginning next year. So we'll take your thoughts on that uh, here on Hook'em Up with Ian Rod B. As you're just tuning in, Rod out this morning, not feeling well. Ty will be chiming in. We've got uh, Mike Craven coming up, uh, coming up in the 8 o'clock hour. Jerry Hamilton will join us. And, of course, Ari Temkin, bottom of this hour to preview the Big 12 championship game, which um, how are we feeling on this game, Ty? I mean, I, I mentioned yesterday, for me, uh, we've covered this team all year long and, you know, you know with a microscope, this feels like, to me, the Michigan-Iowa game and the Big Ten championship game. It's, it shouldn't be that close of a game. Um, you know, if you think, can Iowa beat Michigan as a 10-2 and two team? And obviously, uh, my, my opinion on the Big Ten championship game is the winner. You know, only, the only team that can beat Michigan in that game is Michigan. Uh, Iowa doesn't have the firepower. They don't average 20 points a game. Um, you know, they don't. Uh, Oklahoma State, I don't believe, can beat Texas. You know, Texas can beat Texas in that game if they kick the ball around and fumble and uh, throw interceptions and make mistakes, but I don't think they have the firepower beyond Ali Gordon to really threaten Texas, who's the number seven team in the country. Am I uh, underselling this uh, Oklahoma State team there, Mr. Mr. T.Y.? I don't think so, especially when you look at what they do well in running the ball with Ali Gordon, like you said, and te what Texas does well on defense, stopping the ball. Uh, I'm cutting through this Mike Gundy press conference right now, and I mean he mentions that Texas defense averages uh, or gives up 2.7 yards a carry. Uh, that's that's what I would consider an elite for a rush defense. So I, I think I, what's like a 13, 14 point spread right now. I think they should be able to cover that. I, I don't think it'll be as bad as a tech game, but I I think a two to three score win should be expected. Yeah, they're nine and three, and and look, as you know, Rod said yesterday, and he's right. This is one of Mike Gundy's best coaching jobs. There's no doubt about that, because if you go back to early, I think you just dismiss what happened in September for them. Their first four games, where they beat Central Arkansas, but that was only by 13 points or 14 points. They then beat Arizona State out in uh, out in the desert. Got it was a win there, 27. It was terrible. Uh, bad football team. Uh, then they lost to South Alabama uh, and in Stillwater, 33-7. to And then they lost at Iowa State to start conference play, 34-27. So they were 2-2. Two and two, And you'll hear Sark coming up throughout the morning and throughout the week talking about their philosophical to change. They, you know, back in September, they were rotating three different quarterbacks, trying to settle on one. And of course, of course, Spencer Sanders had been their starting quarterback at Oklahoma State. He transferred out to Ole Miss. By the way, Ty, who advised him to transfer to Ole Miss? Any idea? He didn't even get oh. to play. <laughs> he transferred through the portal to go to Ole Miss and, and didn't even play for the Rebels. Uh, he obviously could have stayed and been the quarterback. I don't know if there was a kind of a falling out with Mike Gundy after all the years for Spencer Sanders in Stillwater. But either way, they were looking for a quarterback. And Alan Bowman, uh, the Texas Tech transfer by way of Michigan, uh, Bowman was at Texas Tech, went to Michigan, and then transferred to, to Oklahoma State. He ended up earning that job, and and you know, then, so they settled on a quarterback, and they also settled on handing the ball to Ollie Gordon, uh, this tremendous young running back out of Fort Worth, Texas, and you know he's the Big 12's leading rusher and has been phenomenal. He's one of those backs who gets better as the game goes on. Uh, he had a five touchdown performance last week in their win, their comfort behind win in overtime over BYU. Had the game clinching touchdown in OT. Um, but that's where their philosophical change happened. And to be fair to Mike Gundy and the Cowboys, if you're just going to look at the two months from September 23rd, after, you know, out of their bye week, that game at Iowa State that they lost 37 or 34-27 was their bye week. Uh, and at, coming out the bye week, October 6th, they've gone eight and one. Uh, the only loss was a was a you know, really unpredictable loss at Central Florida where they got drilled in the rain 45-3. to uh, That was coming off the huge win over Oklahoma in the final Bedlam game. Uh, but that's their only loss since October. Uh, and they've beaten K-State. They beat Kansas. They beat West Virginia. Uh, they beat Cincinnati and Oklahoma to win the Bedlam game. They beat Houston and, and BYU. Uh, they haven't been pretty. I mean, the Houston game, they had to come from behind and win it and pull away late down at Houston. They, they As we said with BYU, they fell behind 18 points. In a, in a rainy day in Stillwater, came back and won that game. Uh, but, you know, facts are facts. Uh, Ty, they, they've won 
you know, eight and, they've gone eight and one. Uh, since they're seven and one since their bye week, so they had to be taken seriously. But I think, as you said, uh, if you prepare and do what you've done all year to get yourself to to where they are, the Longhorns, this is a team that you match up favorably with because you do have the the uh, the premier run defense in the conference, one of the premier run defenses in the in the in the in the nation, quite honestly, with Devondre Sweat and Byron Murphy up front. If you can uh, corral Ali Gordon. And, you know, you're not going to stop him cold. Man, I don't think this is going to be one of those games like Iowa State where they held Iowa State to nine rushing yards. Uh, I think that would be you know, a little bit uh, wishful thinking if you to do that. But uh, we've seen a lot of Texas do that to teams like K-State and Iowa State, teams that like to run the ball, just completely take it away from them. If you can do that to this team, this will be a very one-sided game. But control Ollie Gordon and uh, give yourself a chance uh, to, you know, because you're going to score points against this Oklahoma State defense. They're They're decent. Uh, but they're not great on defense. Texas should be able to score points. So early look at Oak State. We'll hear from Sark. We'll talk to Ari Temkin. Ari, of course, has covered the entire Big 12 all year, so he's got a good feel of this Oklahoma State team and what Mike Gundy has done to turn the tide. Uh, give credit to Gundy uh, to be in this game for the second time in three years and uh, have a chance to really upset the apple cart. That's going to be their mission, uh, obviously, in Stillwater. Uh, coming to Arlington, Texas, of course, looking to cap off a, uh, a heck of a season, their final in Big 12 play. So we'll talk more about it. Also more on the Aggies hiring Mike Elko. Is that the right decision after moving on from Jimbo Fisher? Uh, you know, there, there certainly is, a, you know, a rant there if you're an Aggie fan that, uh, you know, if you, if you didn't know who you wanted to hire when you decided to buy out your coach for $80 million, um, was it worth it? Uh, that becomes the question for Aggie fans and for college football. Ty, what's your gut on that? Uh, if, if you told Aggie fans they were going to do this and you're going to end up with Mike Elko, would that have been enough uh, to, to move on from Jimbo Fisher, or did it just need to happen? And, um, you know, you, you bring back the former defensive coordinator. Is this a win for the Aggies? I don't think so. I think it was probably plan C or D. Uh, I mean, he is a name that we all three of us mentioned on the show from, from the start when they did fire Jimbo Fisher. But I, like I said yesterday, I think it's just kind of a, a lateral move in, in the sense that with culture and just how – the national media looks at you. I'm sure they're going to keep a decent amount of guys from Jimbo staff. Um, I, I mean, I, that, that's just complete. I don't, I don't know, but I don't know. I, I just, I don't think it's, it was a, I, they definitely wanted to hit a home run with Ryan day or Dan Lanning or one of those guys. And they struck out. Well, I mean, here's the one thing, uh, because of course they tried to go get uh, you know, Dan Lanning, not interested. There was talk of Jeff Dabo Swinney at one point, that's the name that I had been told that the, the, the powers that be at A&M, the big money, and some of the brass wanted to, to make say no, and I think they did with the Clemson coach, who there was a thought maybe was, you know, growing a little thin with what's going on at Clemson. Also, I mean, those schools in the ACC, like Clemson, Florida State, we know they're clamoring as programs to get out of the ACC, you know, ACC and be a part of this new look SEC or the Big Ten or wherever so they can keep up with the, you know, the, the financial <laughs> – future of college football uh, so maybe there was a thought that Dabo would be interested because he you know it's gonna be hard for Clemson to get out of their deal with the ACC maybe stuck there um, as the SEC and the Big Ten transform and maybe there would be an opportunity but obviously that didn't happen uh, Dan Lanning you know, probably kicked the tires on that at Oregon but I'll say this um, for, and, and we'll talk with our friend Mike Craven of Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine the senior writer coming up in our eight o'clock hour he was at the press conference yesterday so we'll certainly ask him that same question for Aggie fans out there you know, sometimes to tie the, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't, right? I mean, they know Mike Elko. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, they, the every, he just left in 2021. Uh, he had built one of the better and more stingier defenses in the Southeastern Conference. Nobody was clamoring with Mike Elko when he left. Uh, they were clamoring at Jimbo Fisher because, he, you know, the antiquated offense he was running and the lack of development of quarterbacks and the ability to keep a quarterback healthy has been a problem. It wasn't the defense. Uh, it was in Mike Elko. That was the strength of the football team. Uh, without a doubt, and that's why he earned the, the Duke job. He's very well liked on that campus. He's very well liked in that locker room, uh, which was a big problem for Jimbo Fisher, whose you know, the culture had waned, uh, without a doubt, well, under Jimbo Fisher's run, without Mike Elko there. So, you know, I think you, there is that, that you know what you're dealing with. You know the players. He helped recruit a lot of that roster, which is going to be important now with the transfer portal, roster management, and keeping some guys and trying to build some cohesion. And I think you're right. He'll try to keep some of the staff. Uh, that, that, that are doing a good job. So uh, we'll see where that goes. So we'll take your thoughts on that from the Aggie side. Did, you know, it's a fair narrative to say, man, you, you bought out a guy for $80 million and you settled for your second or third or fourth choice. Uh, we'll, we'll see because you know, they're now in a bad spot because Texas enters the Southeastern Conference potentially on a high, uh, on a real high. I mean, Longworth could be a Final Four team when it's all said and done. Obviously, Texas A&M nowhere near that right now. 
Texas priming themselves to be ready for the trip into the SEC. Texas A&M going in the wrong direction. There's also the recruiting side of that, too, where Texas comes in hot on the recruiting trail. Um, you know, Oklahoma uh, comes in off a 10-win season for uh, – uh, for Brett Venables as well, uh, A&M not coming in. They're coming in with a brand-new coach and uh, another rough year down in College Station. So those are all conversations on a Tuesday morning. Glad you're with us. Rod Babers hopefully gets back to us as soon as he can. We come back, we will talk to Ari Temkin of uh, Sirius XM's Big 12 Radio. His thoughts on this game. Is Texas a rightfully a more than two-touchdown favorite in this game? We'll also dive into some what the facts for the end of the hour. Hour one of our five-hour conversation here on Hook'em Up on 101.9 AM 1260. Streaming on the Horn app on your smart speaker and at hornfm.com.
Hook them up. 1019 AM 1260. The Horn. It is Hook them up with uh, Ian Rod B. No beat. Uh, Rod B today. Rod under the weather. Running a fever yesterday. So uh, we'll be cautious and uh, give him some time to rest. Want to get that baby sick either as well as baby Monroe. Uh, at his place. That happens, Ty. You know, you uh, come off of the holidays. He said there are 15, 20 people rolling in. Uh, to to visit for the holidays and you know that's how that that's how that happens right and hopefully Rod's gonna be okay and uh, we wish him well Ty Henderson back at the Horn headquarters I'm bringing it to you from the uh, South Austin Onion Creek Studios and uh, Rod will rejoin us whenever he can we'll get our what the facts before the uh, wrap it up uh, shame on the NFL can I just say this again we'll you know, we'll get Rod's rant coming up but. Uh, uh, the NFL, uh, I don't know why they would change a rule, which they did. They adopted a rule last offseason that starting with week 12, which this weekend was, Thanksgiving weekend, was a 12th week of NFL action. There is the ability to flex Monday night football games, to flex a better game into the Monday night football window. And they had every opportunity to do that, and they didn't. Uh, you know, As Rod and I argued for last week, they could have flexed that Jacksonville-Houston game uh, for the battle at the top of the AFC South into Monday night. Gosh, much better football game. And I I, mean, I think you knew what was coming last night when you get the Bears with Josh Dobbs, excuse me, the Bears with uh, with Justin Fields against Josh Dobbs and the Vikings. Uh, unwatchable, unwatchable. Uh, the Bears won the game without a touchdown. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's the NFL. I mean, they do most things pretty right. I just think that was the one. I don't know why you would adopt a rule and then, you know, Dylan, I'm sure Monday Night Football wasn't thrilled about it. They could have gotten a better game uh, as far as eyeballs, but uh, there was very little interest in that game. And if you did tune in, probably didn't keep your interest for very long if you weren't a fan of the Vikings or the Bears. Uh, uh, speaking of that, let's uh, – speaking of fans, he, he grew up in Chicago, uh, went to the University of Kansas and uh, used to work with us, and now he is uh, the man on the Vaqueros hotline. He is a big part of the Sirius XM um, – uh, he's not on yet? No, no. I thought, I thought you said he needed some time. Oh, no. Uh, did you? Did, he's going to call you, Ty, when he's ready to go. Okay, he has not uh, called he, us yet. All right, when he calls, we'll talk to Ari Temkin from Sirius XM's Big 12 Radio. Get his thoughts on this game. He, of course, covers uh, the entire Big 12 Conference on the daily and uh, talks to coaches and uh, insiders from around the Big 12. His thoughts on Oklahoma State and the matchup. Can they derail Texas' and run to a fourth Big 12 Conference title? Uh, you with me on that, T.Y., the uh, the game uh, last night? I mean, I, I, I will be honest with you. I didn't watch a lot of that football game. I had no interest in it. And, you know, waking up this morning, looking at the score, and then there wasn't much to miss. Uh, why didn't they change that? I, that, that somebody – with the NFL, that's why you adopted the rule, right? That was the exact reason that last offseason at owners' meetings and you worked with your TV partners to to create that opportunity after week 12 to flex better games because uh, it's hard to predict when the season begins, you know, who's going to get hurt, so, you know, how teams are going to perform. Uh, so you're trying to pick good Monday night matchups and, you know, you know, Sunday night matchups, but you just don't know. And uh, that would have been an opportunity. Like you didn't know that Houston would be this far ahead and this, this good and exciting to watch. Uh, and Jacksonville, that turned into a heck of a football game. Uh, would have been a much better primetime spot. So, a little rant, a little rant aside. But did you watch any of that game last night? Uh, I watched a little bit at the beginning, and then I watched, like, the last four drives. So, I saw two Justin Fields fumbles. Um, <laughs> four Josh Jobs interceptions yeah. later. Yeah. I, I saw one God. of the Josh Jobs interceptions at the beginning, and then I turned it back on. I was like, wow, okay, well, I guess he's not the uh, Superman hero coming in to save the Vikings like everyone thought. Excuse me. Well, and- more, more, you know, he, he's Josh Jobs for a reason. It was a great Cinderella story when it began, and he won a couple games. It was pretty cool. When Kirk Cousins got hurt, I think they were playing with with emotion and riding the emotion of that, and uh, you know, it does come crashing down uh, for, the, for the Minnesota Vikings, who are now 6-6. Six and six. Bears are 4-8. and eight. And as we said, he's a guy who grew up in Chicago. Maybe he watched that game last night on Monday Night Football. Uh, pretty dreadful as it was. But he's also a, a proud graduate of Kansas, former employee with us and colleague with us, now doing great things at Sirius XM's Big 12 Radio. He is Ari Temkin. Hello, Ari. Good morning. What's going on? Man, we are we are cranking. Uh, Longhorns are gearing up. The fans headed, getting ready to head to Arlington and uh, play for a Big 12 championship. It is hard to believe. You you lived here in Austin and worked with us, Ari, and covered this program. Uh, it really is hard to believe the 27 years of this conference. This is only their fourth appearance in the Big 12 championship game. By, you know, based on its resources and what they, what they have, it, not nearly enough, but uh, pretty cool for Longhorn fans to get one more look at it on their way out. Well, yeah, and, and you know, yeah, I think the the relevance this year of the schedule, you know, is so impactful and important on this, you know, quote unquote revenge tour for Texas. I mean, you know, you think about the last decade plus of this football program and the way in which teams in this conference have 
you know, really victimized Texas. And I mean, you think about the the loss to Kansas a couple of years ago at home and how much that's made te- Texas the, the brunt of jokes and their record against TCU since TCU joined the conference, their record against Oklahoma State, you know, Texas Tech fans. I mean, think about their, their schedule this year, E. They play Baylor, Houston, K-State, TCU, Iowa State, Texas Tech, Kansas. So pretty much the entire Southwest Conference Big 12 foes they've had over the years. And the only one they didn't have is Oklahoma State, the team they're getting in the Big 12 championship. But they've beaten every one of them. Obviously, Oklahoma, the one that they didn't, but they're moving out of the SEC with them. They have handled business, Texas has, against the teams that have victimized them over the last decade plus. And Oklahoma State is probably the one that's victimized them the most over the last decade plus. Yeah, you're right about that. And uh, we're kind of the keeping receipts to her, right? Longhorns will own, uh, since they are moving off to the SEC, the, the forever bragging rights on these teams, whether – However, it went for the last, uh, we know the last 12, 13 years of Texas football has not been up to, up to par. Uh, that's the hope that Steve Sarkeesian and the staff have turned it on their way to the SEC and get one, one last uh, trophy on your way out. Not enough, but uh, still would at least um, you know, finish it strong. <coughs> All right, what about Oklahoma State? Uh, puzzling team. Certainly at the beginning of the year, there was talk of what's going on with Mike Gundy. You know, we know he's not a big fan of NIL. Um, you know, his roster got turned over. He's looking for a quarterback. And it felt like September he treated like a preseason, like he was rotating three quarterbacks. They were trying to figure out what their identity was. Um, but, you know, they, they lost their first conference game to Iowa State and then had a bye week, and they came out of that and uh, were 2-2 two and two and have gone 7-1. and one. Uh, And, if, you know, they've got the one really inexplicable loss at Central Florida but have, have won seven other ball games. Uh, with, with, you know, maybe one of Mike Gundy's best coaching jobs to get this thing into Arlington on Saturday. Yeah, it's it's been a remarkable year for Oklahoma State, to say the least. You know, I picked them as the Big 12 champion uh, before the season started, and I did that because, you know, I wasn't sure about a lot of the coaches in this league. This is a league of parity. I expected that we were going to see that again, and I just kind of thought, let's go with the coach that we know, and, you know, I really liked what Oklahoma State had coming back. Now, with that being said, the first three games didn't inspire much confidence because of what you mentioned, which is that Mike Gundy really did treat that like a preseason where he was rotating three quarterbacks through, even though we heard all offseason about how good Alan Bowman looked. He also only gave 19 carries to Ali Gordon the first three games, and now he's a leading rusher in college football. So, you know, look, Mike Gundy has a lot of things. I think certainly this year there was some luck involved in their success, but um, he's also – type of coach that's not afraid to change and change in season and the adaptions that they, the adaptations that they've gone through over the course of the season offensively defensively are nothing short of remarkable um and yeah, obviously they they've built their offense around the running game and Allie Gordon who's been spectacular but they they're good up front they're really good along their offensive line they've got good schemes their fullback you know handles blocking for them well too so it's not just Gordon it's about what they have up front and that's why I think this game is going to be so intriguing it is strength on strength it is strength on strength, and uh, as you talk about the uh, the, the Oklahoma State, um, you know, thorn in the side of Texas. I mean, it's really. I mean, the, the last ten games, the o- Oklahoma State's won seven. The Longhorns are three and seven in their last ten matchups with the Cowboys. They're more than two touchdowns a favorite in this game, and that that, Ari, that seems to me about right. I mean, I've said uh, to our audience here that th- th- this game feels like the uh, the Big Ten championship game to me. Michigan Iowa. That I want to say it's a formality, but if you show up, handle business. The only team that can beat Michigan Saturday would be Michigan, and I think the only thing, team that can beat Texas on Saturday is Texas. Yeah, no, look, I mean, I, I, I agree to you to agree to a certain degree. I think, I mean, I, I, Oklahoma State has a lot more uh, firepower than Iowa on yeah, offense. That's but, true. Yeah, I mean, that's look, true. I, but, but I not think the defense exactly, that Iowa brings. Right. No, no doubt about that. I just, I would be shocked if Michigan lost. I would be less shocked if Oklahoma State won. Now, granted, what you said is 100% true. The, Texas is far and away better. And we said that going into the year. I mean, I remember when, when we talked about this coming into the season. Like the question marks around Texas were more on Sark and some of the things we hadn't seen yet. And they've done that this year. They have finished games in a lot of different ways and things that we, I certainly question coming into the season about Sark. You know, he's, he's done an unbelievable job to, you know, instill this culture and, to, uh, you know, nurture the culture. And, and, you know, now we're seeing the fruits of that labor. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I mean, Texas up front of both lines of scrimmage is, is really good. We knew that coming into the season, I think defensively, They've been even better than we expected. Offensive line's been really good. You know, so many weapons. Um, and then, you know, we saw Arch Manning on, on Saturday. Not just not that I expect to see him this Saturday, but, man, I, you can't help but wonder what next year's going to look like because he is an athletic freak. 
Yeah, uh, good arm. We just showed, showed the speed to get to the corner in that game uh, in his work in the fourth quarter of the big win over Texas Tech. Ari Temkin is with us. Ari, you, you gave us the great stat. I did not realize that uh, on, on Oklahoma State. Ollie Gordon, who may win the Doak Walker Award, he's kind of a fringe Heisman candidate, candidate right now after his five-touchdown performance in the win over BYU Saturday. Um, you know, he only had 19 carries in their first three games. Uh, he has burst on the scene here. Um, you know, well, what's the story here? Is that a Fort Worth? He's a guy that uh, wasn't the highest recruit. But, man, give me your give me your thumbnail and scouting report on Ollie Gordon and what makes him special. Yeah, from Ulysses Trinity. Um, Texas apparently got in on him late, and he was firm in his commitment to Oklahoma State. He's a tall running back, runs with great balance, about six foot one. Um, and, look, I mean, I – you know, he's, you know, the idea here is, and Sark mentioned this yesterday, you know, he gets stronger as the game goes on. I think it's more about, you know, how he maintains his level and yet other teams, you know, disappear. He had five touchdowns, as you mentioned, last week, but all five came in the second half in overtime. He had three touchdowns the week before that, and they went over Houston all in the second half. So, if you look at the second half of games the last two weeks, he's had eight touchdowns uh, out of his 20 in the last two weeks. And, uh, I mean, two weeks ago against Houston, they went away from him in the first half. It was kind of bizarre. And uh, and they, they found themselves in a hole, but they, they were able to dig out in the second half by just handing him the football. He's He's been, again, nothing short of spectacular. He's the main catalyst and reason for why this team is here. And it's not just him. It's the offensive line. It's the way the running game's built. Uh, but, yeah, he's he is a really talented running back, and he's just a sophomore. Yeah, just a sophomore, and you said uh, he gets stronger as the game goes on, wears teams down, and he certainly did that last week. And uh, but that does play right into the strength of Texas, who's allowing you know 2.7 yards a, a carry. Um, you know, but you know this is probably the best back they've seen. They gave up 100 yards to Taj Brooks last week against Texas Tech, but they so overwhelmed the passing game uh, while giving up you know this couple of chunk runs to Taj, uh, kid out of Maynard. But uh, that will be the challenge. But it does seem to play to the Texas strength. Uh, hey Ari, big picture for the Longhorns. I mean, um, you know, obviously they're thinking get a win here. And, and then see what happens on Sunday. What's your level of optimism the Longhorns could find their way into the uh, college football Final Four? Yeah, pretty crazy that that's even a question, right? I mean, you'd think a one-loss Texas who beat Alabama at in Bryant-Denny Stadium yeah. by 10 points, if they won a Big 12 championship, they'd be a shoe in for the playoffs. It's pretty wild. Yeah, I mean, I think it all starts with, with Louisville beating Florida State. I think you got to have Florida State out of there because, you know, that's an undefeated Power 5 champion if they win that game. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not so sure about how, you know, what they would need to happen in the SEC title. I'm, I think I, I would think Georgia to win. That way you'd knock Alabama officially out, even though you'd think Alabama should have been knocked out based on Texas's win over them. Um, and then, you know, Michigan's probably in. I don't think Ohio State has much of a shot. So, I, you know, when I look at kind of the other situations with four unbeatens right now in Power 5, I think it, it kind of starts there. It's all about Louisville knocking off knocking off uh, four State. But it, it's sort of ironic, right? I mean, this is a, a program in Texas that has had this brand that's prided itself on its brand. We've talked all the time about the importance of brand when it comes to the BCS National Championship or the College Football Playoff. And, you know, it's almost as if Texas now is feeling like what it's like to be Baylor, Oklahoma State in its final year in the Big 12, if they are left out, it would be absurd considering it's a one-loss Power 5 champion that beat Alabama on the road by 10 points. Agreed. Now, look, I mean, if there are four undefeated, Zari, I mean, there's a chance of that, right? I mean, you could end up with right, um, right. You know, if Washington beats Oregon and, and Florida State handles business and Michigan and Georgia win, that would just be kind of an outlier in this Final Four thing that you have four undefeated conference champions and you just happen to be the one one-loss conference champion from the other Power Five conference, and that would just be bad luck. Uh, but you're right. If they become, if, they, if there are some other one-loss teams, then it becomes a beauty contest. you got to think the Longhorns have a, have a pretty good chance. I even think if Alabama beats Georgia, Georgia, that would solidify Texas because it would you know, yeah, that win yeah. for Texas all of a sudden becomes even better if Georgia can't if, if they handle Georgia but of course Alabama almost ball lost to Auburn in the Iron Bowl last week and probably should have hey Ari that's good stuff my friend we appreciate it uh jumping in and uh, hope you're well uh you, will you be in Arlington coming up on Saturday yeah I'm gonna go to the game on Saturday um I'm, I'm excited a good buddy of mine is is from uh, lives in Houston and went to Texas and so I'm gonna go with him and Cheer for Oklahoma State simply because I picked them to win the Big 12 when the season started. So why not? You know, why not finish? Then you get to be the 
I love it. And we get to be the prophet. And that's a great pick, by the way. I mean, and you weren't looking very smart in September uh, when they were 2-2 two and two and <laughs> lost to South Alabama. But here you are with the, uh, the bragging rights, A.T., a uh, chance to say, yeah, I told you, it was going to be Mike Gundy and the mullet coming out of nowhere to win the, 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 the Big 12 championship and uh, prevent Texas from finishing it off. Thanks, Ari. Appreciate it, buddy. Take care. Enjoy the game on Saturday. Be well. All right. There's Ari Temkin. He is the host of Big 12 Radio, Channel 375 on Sirius XM, covering the Big 12 Conference, uh, doing all kinds of great work. Follow him on Twitter, at Ari Sports, A-R-I Sports. Uh, on the X, if you're looking for Ari and all his great content, uh, find it there, and we appreciate him jumping in. As we mentioned, great guest lineup this morning without Rod Babers, who's under the weather. Uh, Jerry Hamilton, inside Texas, uh, the senior recruiting analyst, will join us. Uh, his thoughts on this big game and uh, with Oklahoma State and the recruiting impact for the Longhorns as we're now pushing towards transfer portal opening uh, early signing window opens December 20th so Jerry will join us we'll also hear from Steve Sarkeesian coming up his weekly Monday media availability his thoughts on this Horns team that's gone 11 and 1 and has a chance to finish with a championship and complete the mission as he says with that coming back but coming next it's uh, the what the facts uh, from a busy Tuesday on hook em up with Ian Rodby
Aaron Hogan, Rod Babers, Hook Em Up, 1019 AM 1260, The Horn. It is Hook Em Up on a Tuesday, getting ready for the Longhorns' seventh appearance in the Big 12 championship game. Saturday, we'll hear more from Steve Sarkeesian coming up. Longhorns, of course, winning to win their fourth, but uh, seventh trip to Arlington for Texas. Uh, Sark will weigh in. Also uh, talking all things Tuesday, Monday Night Football last night, not much to say. Week 12 in the books in the NFL. Already looking forward to week 13, which kicks off in Arlington. Coming up Thursday night when the Cowboys play the Seattle Seahawks in the first of a critical five-game stretch for the Cowboys. It's a fact. These next five games for Dallas are against teams who right now would be in the playoffs. Uh, that you know They've come off this stretch of three games. After losing to the Eagles, the Cowboys on Sunday Night Football, uh, that heartbreaker, 28-23, the Cowboys have played three really bad teams and demolished them, right? The, uh, the Panthers, the Giants, and the, and the Commanders on thir- Turkey Day. Now they begin a five-game stretch through Christmas against teams that are all, you know, fighting for the playoffs uh, as far as that goes. Six and five, Seattle, then the home tilt with Philadelphia, then they go to Buffalo and Miami, and then they come back home for Detroit the, uh, right after Christmas. So, uh, obviously, big five-game stretch for the Cowboys starting Thursday night on Thursday Night Football. Today is also, uh, T.Y., this is a fact, is today is Giving Tuesday. Do you know that, Giving Tuesday? Uh, we came off of uh, Black Friday where you go out and, you know, spend a bunch of money on Christmas gifts, I guess. And then yesterday was Cyber Monday where uh, like all kinds of deals on online gifts. Uh, and then today apparently has developed uh, since 2019 into Giving Tuesday where you pick a charity or a nonprofit of your choice and you give what you can um, before you spend all your money on Christmas gifts and the holidays. Go ahead and give on this Tuesday. And apparently they, they, it's been become a very you know, popular phenomenon where people you know, give what they can. So it might be a good idea. Do some giving today, T.Y. Okay. I don't well, really have very it. much to give, but I can try. <laughs> that's all right. But uh, if you don't, you don't. But if you do, uh, do that today. And uh, before you, you, you overspend and do all the things you'll do for the holidays, which are officially here now uh, on this, this, this uh, uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, so be, uh, I was looking at the Big 12 statistics. What the facts? How about this, Rod? In Big 12 conference play, the Texas Longhorns are allowing 81 yards a game rushing in their nine Big 12 games. 81 yards a game. They've allowed just six rushing touchdowns all year. Ollie Gordon, the running back at Oklahoma State, had five last week against BYU. So you've got this uh, this running back who could be running his way to the Doak Walker Award facing this defense who stones just about everybody. 2.9 yards a carry in Big 12 play. Obviously uh, pretty darn impressive. Uh, you know, right there for the Texas Longhorns. But, you know, the offensive side of the ball, you know, Oak State's, you know, they average 183 yards, almost 188 yards rushing per game. That's going to be where this game is decided. So if you're a Longhorn fan, you got to feel pretty good about that. I, much like we saw last week with, uh, with Baron Morton at Texas Tech, if you can put this game in Alan Bowman's hands, which Texas has been able to do, you feel pretty good about that. I know the past defense at times this year for Texas has been their 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 Achilles heel, been their 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 they've been leaky there. But man, if you can, I don't say shut down Ali Gordon, just do a nice job on him if you have all year. Don't let him go crazy. Make Allen Bowman, you know, convert second and third and longs. I think you're in a real good spot if you're the Longhorns. I do too. I'm I'm, I'm not too worried about this game, but oh, Texas has disappointed like- me for most of my life, so. <laughs> I'm take out the well, of salt. Maybe, maybe we have to prove it one more time because I agree with you. I mean, I've covered this team since you you were born, and there have been a lot of disappointing losses of late, of course. And uh, they're back, but then they lose a game. This team does feel like it's built with the right DNA, the right championship character um, to find a way, even if it's closer than the, the point spread. Who cares? You know, you're finding a way to win this game. And we'll hear from Steve Sarkeesian talking about it uh, coming up on this Giving Tuesday. We'll also talk to Jerry Hamilton, get some bullish or BS next hour and reset your top headlines, including the SEC. Longhorns now know what dates they'll play some of their biggest 2024 Southeastern Conference matchups, including the re-engagement with the Aggies. Aggies have a new head coach. We now know when the Texas Longhorns will play the Aggies for the first time in a dozen years. I'll get you that on the other side of a quick timeout here at the top of the hour. One hour down, four more to go on Hook'em Up with Ian Rodby.
horn. Guests on the horn appear courtesy of the Vaqueros Cafe and Cantina Hotline. Vaqueros now delivers and offers curbside pickup. For info on placing your lunch or dinner order, visit vaqueroscafe.com. Hook them up with he and Rod P. Brought to you by Bud Light on the Horn. Hook them up is uh, missing Rod Babers today. Uh, he's under the weather. I ran on a pretty high fever yesterday. Uh, coming off the holidays, and uh, we're going to let him rest today, and hopefully he's back tomorrow or whenever he can get back as we get you ready for the Big 12 Championship. So it's myself and Ty Henderson. Great guest lineup, as we mentioned. Next hour, my buddy Mike Craven will jump on. Mike Craven is a senior writer at Dave Campbell's Texas Football. He was in Aggieland yesterday covering – he had a busy day. He was up in Waco in the morning talking to uh, Mac Rhodes, the AD of Baylor, their decision to keep – Dave Aranda, the head coach of the Bears, after a 3-9 and nine season. Change is coming, so we'll get a detail on that. Uh, then he had to make the trip down to College Station for the introductory press conference of one Mike Elko, who is in, according to uh, Mike's reporting, a $7 million a year base salary. So if you're asking what the total price tag on buying out Jimbo Fisher and now hiring Mike Elko will be, uh, he comes in at uh, right about $7 million base salary to start it. Is he the right hire becomes a big question. Uh, we'll also ask our friend Jerry Hamilton coming up bottom of the hour that same question because he is the senior recruiting analyst for Inside Texas. Does great work at that website and on their YouTube channel. Uh, get Jerry's thoughts because, I mean, obviously if you're an Aggie fan, uh, much like you see with Steve Sarkeesian here, you never know. There's no slam dunk. Uh, there are one there are higher, hires that feel better than others. But uh, in the end, if Mike Elko can come in and, you know, reclaim that locker room, uh, which had really fallen apart culture-wise under Jimbo Fisher, uh, he knows – most every, you know, a lot of the players in that locker room having been the defensive coordinator there up until 2021 and had built a heck of a defense. Uh, that, that earned him the Duke job where he did a great job with the Blue Devils, 16 and 9 in two seasons. And I know people will say, well, you know, just a 7 and 5 record this year, but consider this for, for Mike Elko. You know, Steve Sarkeesian, you know, you know, still people talk about you know, when he took over Washington, right, in the program and um, that he didn't win 10 games while he was the coach of the Huskies. But Steve Sarkeesian took over a program that was 0 and 12 the year before he got there as he began to build that thing back to respectability, and that earned him the USC job. And then we know the personal issues really, you know, collapsed what was going on for him in USC. But Mike Elko went to Duke, where Duke had only won three games, um, you know, in the last three seasons before Mike Elko took over the Duke Blue Devils. Uh, they had only won, um, just won 10 games combined the previous three years. So averaging three wins a season, Mike Elko comes in and they went 16-9. and nine. And um, you know, earlier this year, we saw them before their quarterback got hurt, you know, beat Clemson. Uh, we're playing some really good football, and they just don't have the depth to, to navigate the ACC, especially when your quarterback gets hurt. Um, but, you know, showed that he can turn a program pretty quickly that was really in the dumps, and that's where ba uh, Duke was. So that's what the Aggies are, are pinning their hopes on, that he's a culture guy. I'll ask Jerry Hamilton this question, though, because it's going to come down to the fact that, you know, the staff he builds, especially as Rod said yesterday, the offensive coordinator he hires, because we know Mike Elko will run a stingy defense. Uh, the question is going to be who he calls you know, a young, dynamic offensive coordinator would be uh, on par, and you have to recruit. I mean, we know that. you got to be able to recruit, and that's what Steve Sarkeesian has done. Um, you know, when you come in, what, you know, what staff do you hire? Really, you know, dictates how your success is going to be, you know, your, what your ceiling becomes. And I think Sark gets an A-plus for the staff he built. Uh, and they've pretty much stayed together outside of the wide receiver coach position and the running backs coach position. Uh, every other coach who he hired originally is still here. And uh, I think some would argue he's upgraded the wide receiver coach position with Chris Jackson and upgraded, um, you know, with Tashard Choice, a running back. Uh, along with another 100-yard rusher last week, Jaden Blue, who's way down the depth chart. So they got some good backs, and Tashard's doing a good job. So, again, coaching staff higher, A-plus for Sark. Uh, and then keeping that staff together to build the coaching staff continuity, A-plus for Sark. Um, and then the recruiting side, right? Can you recruit? Uh, you know, staff, one thing to be able to develop and uh, coach players and, you know, do the schemes and the X's and O's, but you got to also recruit the Jimmys and the Joes. And uh, this Texas staff and Steve Sarkeesian have shown a really strong ability to, you know, acquire talent, whether it's through recruiting uh, traditionally or through the portal. Uh, that's, so that's an A-plus, too. And that's, we ask, how did Texas turn it in three years to, from a five and seven first year to now? That's how, and that's will be the question for Mike Elko. Now, Mike Elko a little bit different. I think the uh, locker room at uh, Texas A&M a lot stronger than 
you know, a little more talented than what Texas, but Steve Sarkeesian inherited at Texas. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. So we'll talk to uh, Jerry Hamilton about that and the other uh, conversations around college football. We'll talk to Mike Craven in one hour. Uh, but right now, let's get to your headlines, the trending topics to start your Tuesday morning. Top Gun Rentals and Lot Equipment bring you the top stories. College football, seventh-ranked Longhorns now in full prep mode for the showdown game with Oklahoma State on Saturday in Arlington, 11 a.m. kick. That's where Texas will seek to claim their fourth Big 12 championship, their first since 2009. At his weekly Monday media availability yesterday, head coach Steve Sarkeesian described the team as focused and business as usual as they look to complete the mission. We're headed to Arlington Saturday, you know, 11 a.m., competing for, for a Big 12 championship. You know, quite frankly, that's been our mission and that's been our focus all year, was to be champions this year, and we've earned that right. Um, and we've got ourselves in position to do that. Uh, to think in the last 27 he- years here at Texas, there's only been three conference championships. Uh, and so we, we don't take this lightly. Uh, we know the challenge that it is to, A, make it to the game, and then, B, to ultimately win that game. Uh, so to be the fourth team to do it here in 27 years would, would be a heck of a deal if we could get it done. Uh, it certainly would be get them to 12-1, and one, and then they'll wait and see what happens beyond that. Uh, win or lose yet on Saturday, the game will be the Longhorns' final ever in the Big 12 Conference. Uh, word yesterday that the SEC plans to unveil that schedule for 2024 sometime in De- December. Yesterday, um, there were Chris Lowe of ESPN. Uh, revealed a number of dates on some of the bigger matchups, including Texas and Oklahoma, as they join the now-expanded 16-team lead starting next year. Uh, according to Chris Lowe, Texas will host the Georgia Bulldogs on October the 19th of 2024, which will likely be one week after the annual showdown with Oklahoma at the Cotton Bowl. Um, they will also make a trip to Arkansas, according to Lowe, on November the 16th, and will renew their rivalry with Texas A&M uh, after the 12-year hiatus in College Station on Saturday, November 30th, in College Station to close the regular season. Longhorns 2024 non-conference schedule also includes home games versus Colorado State, UTSA, and UL Monroe. And, of course, that early September road tilt at Michigan. Speaking of Texas A&M, the Aggies made it official yesterday. Introduced Mike Elko as the program's new head football coach. Uh, we'll hear more on him coming up throughout the uh, the program. NFL, quite the stinker on Monday Night Football last night to wrap up Week 12 in Minnesota. Cairo Santos made a 31-yard field goal with 10 seconds left to give the Bears a 12-10 win over Minnesota. Chicago improves to 4-8 and eight without scoring a touchdown in that game. Their defense intercepted Vikings quarterback Josh Dobbs four times. Minnesota falls to 6-6. Six and six. Week 13 in the NFL kicks off this Thursday night in Arlington. Surging Cowboys hosting 6-5 and five Seattle. Pink slips in Carolina yesterday. Panthers fired head coach Frank Reich just 11 games into his tenure as their head coach. Reich, who replaced Matt Rule this past offseason, led Carolina to an NFL worst 1-10 and start. Team also dismissed quarterbacks coach Josh McCown and assistant coach Deuce Staley. And they absolutely will. Brandon Mars and his great team there. Appreciate them uh, bringing you the headlines and the top stories, which include that uh, that schedule. Um, you know, this is this is what Longhorn fans are walking into, and I think the Longhorn program there, as I just said, A pluses for Sark on coaching staff and continuity and recruiting and development, and that's what's led to this team that has a chance to, to finish a 12 and one campaign. And then we'll see what happens with the college football playoff. But uh, we know next year the the stakes ramp up even more uh, with the move to the Southeastern Conference. And I thought it was interesting, Chris Lowe, with that uh, story dropped at ESPN, uh, you know, kind of sneaking out some of the the, the, the big dates. And um, these are big time. This is what you I mean. Texas knows, as I mentioned, they're going to play Michigan in Ann Arbor in September. And it's like they had that huge start of the season tilt at uh, Alabama. And by the way, uh, Ty Henderson, that game in Michigan in September could look a lot like the Longhorn trip to Alabama last week, where, of course, Alabama I mean, Michigan's playing as the number one or two team in the country right now, unbeaten, dominant lines of scrimmage. But much like we talked about Alabama all last offseason, there's going to be coaching staff changes in Michigan. There could be NCAA punishment for the sign-stealing scandal. Uh, there also could be a, you know, an overhaul on them. I mean, there will be a, a, an exit, exodus off that roster. This is the most talented team that uh, – that uh, Jim Harbaugh had built. He's got the, the quarterback, J.J. McCarthy, who's kind of come into his own, and people think he could be off to the NFL draft. They've got seven offensive linemen that could be moving on to the NFL, Blake Corum, the running back. So, you know, when, when you look at teams year by year, 
you know, the Longhorns may be, and again, I'm looking way ahead here, but may be catching Michigan at a good time to make that trip to Ann Arbor. Let's also remember that was supposed to be a home game for Texas when they first came on the schedule, but they flipped that to a trip to Ann Arbor to appease the, the TV partners when the move to the SEC was announced. It's going to be in Ann Arbor now. Uh, but, you know, you might, you might be able to catch Michigan early, uh, you know, kind of rebuilding and reloading, and who knows if Jim Harbaugh's even there next year, Ty. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of question marks up there in Ann Arbor, so – uh, I'm more concerned about the Georgias of the world and the rest of the SEC. Yeah, well, I mean, that yeah, of course. But much like we saw this year, if you can get a big road win early, I mean, that still stands. I mean, the Texas win at Alabama. I think Texas fans would say, I'd rather we would have. That was it was a you know fortunate time to play them when they were breaking in a new offensive coordinator, a new quarterback, new defensive coordinator, and uh, maybe weren't settled. And they haven't lost a game since, but but you don't take that win away. Texas could be walking in to a similar situation um, in uh, you've said it, in Ann Arbor. You said it yesterday. If if Texas beats Oklahoma, they're probably number one in the nation right now. Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, then, you know, if you, if, then that's going to be the, uh, the the galling part of the Longhorns if they get left out of the 14 playoff. And if they if they win, they got to you know, beat Oklahoma State, put a championship on the board. As Ari Temkin said, I think accurately last hour, you know, if you told pretty much anybody in the in the summer that Texas is going to go 12-1, and one, win the Big 12, their one loss would be a narrow loss in the Cotton Bowl, neutral site to, uh, to Oklahoma in a game they led with just over a minute to play and then couldn't hold the lead as Dylan Gabriel took the – the Sooners down the field and put them in the end zone. Um, you know that's your one loss of an of an entire season, and you're a conference champion. There's no way that team doesn't make the Final Four. I mean, what we've known of the Final Four so far, that's a resume that gets you into the Final Four. Um, so, but again, as we said, there's a chance that there are four undefeated conference champions going into the, into uh, you know the, the weekend, and that's that's really where it stands. Now, um, you know, if Oregon, and the problem is if Oregon beats Washington. They'd be a one-loss team who's currently ahead of you, and if they beat Washington, does that give them the momentum and the move to, you know, stay ahead of Texas? Would that be the data point they need? Because right now, by all the metrics and all the analytics, uh, Texas should be ahead of Oregon. Uh, we've said that over and over again. There's really, I mean, Texas has a t- played a tougher schedule. They've got more quality wins. They've got a better r- win, which is at Alabama that Oregon doesn't have. Uh, really, every data point you would look at points to Texas. Sh- they should be ahead of Oregon right now, and they're not. So if Oregon then beats Washington, who's ranked number four in the country right now, or three in the country, you know, that's going to give them a data point that uh, may make them insurmountable for Texas, whether that's right or wrong. Uh, so that they would be the one-loss team in. Georgia wins, Michigan wins, um, Oregon wins, and whoever – because I think whoever wins, Washington, Oregon, is going to be in, and that's unfortunate for Texas. Uh, then it comes down to Florida State uh, with a backup quarterback uh, and a big game with, uh, with Louisville. Uh, to, to, to tell the Texas fate for sure. So, yeah, there's, uh, there's the now and then there's the future for the Longhorns on this Tuesday morning with what's coming, as we mentioned, November 30th for the Texas A&M game next year. So mark your calendars. That will be, unless they change that, and Ty kind of you know threw it out there that maybe they could move that to a November 29th game on a Friday, uh, kind of like old school. But as of uh, the Chris Lowe report yesterday, that game will be coming up on, uh, on the Saturday after Thanksgiving, November the 30th next year uh the trip to Fayetteville Arkansas would be the middle of the month of November um on the 16th and as uh, Ty mentioned Georgia Bulldogs who also will have a new look team but they're going to be Georgia <laughs> next year you know that with Kirby Smart that will be uh the the week after the Oklahoma game how about that in October uh trip to Dallas to play the Sooners uh the second Saturday following Saturday would be coming home to play according to Chris Lowe of ESPN the Georgia Bulldogs in one heck of a road or one heck of a home showcase for the Texas Longhorns. Pretty cool stuff. All right, uh, there you go. There's your top stories. We're brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Let's dive into Rod's rant with Rod not being here. We can execute the rant, can't we, T.Y.? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Find out what happens when people stop being polite and start getting real. You ain't keeping it real. My God, okay, it's happening. Everybody stay calm. Oh, no, you've done it now. It's time for Rod's no. rant of the day. Hold on to your butts. All right, Rod's rant of the day. Apple Leasing brings it to you. And I, you know, I just kind of ranted a little bit about it. But I do think right now as we sit here, it's, it's really inexcusable that Texas is behind Oregon. Um, I, you know, my argument has been it won't matter if Texas, you know, you know, they, they, the problem is if Texas were even – here's the issue uh, for me. Uh, when, when Oregon began 
you know, being ranked ahead of Texas in this college football playoff rankings a few weeks ago. Um, you know, if Oregon had been behind Texas, uh, I still think, um, you know, let's just say Texas was six and Oregon was seven right now, which is what Longhorn fans would like to see. They think that would, and you know, Ohio State, at least in the AP poll, is ahead of Texas. But I think that, you know, and we'll see where the college football playoff ranking has Ohio State. But let's not forget, Ohio State doesn't have a game this weekend. So if Texas wins the Big 12 championship, even if they're, even if Ohio State's ahead of Texas tonight, when Texas, if Texas wins the Big 12 championship Saturday and becomes a one-loss conference champion with that 12th victory in a 13-game schedule, they would move ahead of Ohio State because that would be a data point that Ohio State just doesn't have, and it would it would push them forward. But the problem is Oregon, if uh, if all things are equal, and as we said, there's really no no metric that you look at that suggests Texas should be behind Oregon right now, uh, except for the eye test, I guess. I mean, uh, and and uh, and you know, respecting the West Coast and the quality of football being played in the Pac-12 this year, and what really is the final year that conference exists, um, you know, Texas again. Uh, Texas played and, and beaten this year, Ty, um, or played seven bowl teams. Now, seven teams that are bowl eligible. The most of any of the teams in the top ten in the country right now. Seven teams who have, a, have who will be bowling coming up through the bowl season. Uh, they've got the better win against Alabama. The strength of schedule is better than Oregon's. Yet um, the committee continues to have them ranked ahead. My only argument against and rant on why it really doesn't matter, even if Texas were ahead right now uh, of Oregon and Oregon beats Washington on Friday night, to me, big picture, that would have pushed them past Texas anyhow uh, because Texas's game with Oklahoma State does not bring that, that gravity, right? It doesn't bring that. It doesn't elevate because Oklahoma State's sitting at number 19 in the rankings. They're a two-loss team. Uh, obviously, Washington's the top three team in the country and undefeated right now, and that would avenge the loss. So I think you know the argument about Oregon is, is a good one for Texas fans, but at the same time, if they beat Oregon, because, again, if Washington beats Oregon, then it won't matter. Washington's in as an undefeated Pac-12 champion. If Oregon beats Washington – to me, Ty, and you can agree or disagree, that would be uh, the clincher for them uh, to go in ahead of Texas as the uh, the champion of the Pac-12, and their only loss being a very narrow loss at uh, Washington on a, on, a, on a true road game. I wouldn't be shocked if Texas is ranked ahead of Oregon tonight after like, the, the, the win over Tech. Well, well, that yeah, well, that's a good point, and that's a, a fair point in the rant because you know they they win that game fifty-seven to seven, they wreck Tech by fifty. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, this would be the week to do that, right? If you're the committee and you're going, you know, you're, you're now having this conversation because you're down to brass tacks here, you're down to one week. If you were going to make it, tonight would be the night because you can back it up by saying Texas just won a game by 50 points. That's what we were looking for from Texas was a complete four-quarter performance, a dominant performance in all phases against a, a look, Texas Tech's one of those bowl-eligible teams. They might be very good, but they're a six-win football team who were looking to get to seven last week, and Texas demolished them. So, um, that that's a good point, Ty. That if they come out tonight, well, that would then all of a sudden that would be encouraging. But the question then would become, if you're accurate on that here in Rod's rant of the day, if you're right about that, would Washington remain behind Texas if Texas handles business with Oklahoma State and they beat number three and undefeated Washington? That would become a nail biter for the Longhorns come Sunday morning. I think in that scenario, you would have to hope for a blowout win similar to what we saw last week against Tech for Texas, and then a sloppy win for Oregon, and then just just cross your fingers at that point. And that's, that, right. that's also in that scenario, Florida State would probably win too, so there would be one spot up for grabs, right? That's right. Uh, that's right. And that, that you know, obviously the, the easiest path in would be Florida State because if you consider – you know, Georgia uh, is a five-point favorite over Alabama. Look, if, Georgia, if Alabama beats Georgia, I mean, that's a fair question. Um, if, if Alabama beats Georgia, I think that further solidifies Texas because and I think Georgia falls behind the Longhorns despite the fact that they've won back-to-back -back national championships. If Alabama beats Georgia, Texas beat Alabama on the field by 10 points in their building. Um, and to beat Georgia, to knock off the number one team, that gives credit to Texas, right? That solidifies Texas, and Georgia falls behind the Longhorns in the Final Four. Bama would get the spot for the SEC. Uh, obviously, Michigan, if they handle Iowa, is in. And then the Oregon-Washington you know, Washington game becomes a, a de facto you know, playoff game. And then if Florida State were to lose, then you're in, right? But you need that Florida State thing to happen. You need one of those two things to happen, in my opinion, here in Rod's Rand of the Day on a Tuesday. You need Florida State to take a loss, or you need Alabama to beat Georgia uh, because I think either one with a Longhorn win at Oklahoma State against Oklahoma State would put you into the Final Four um, and, you know, into that semifinal round, which would be coming up on New Year's Day. You'd be either in the Sugar Bowl 
or in the Rose Bowl, uh, playing in the semifinals for a chance to play for the national title. All right, let me uh, play this from Steve Sarkeesian, his media availability yesterday. He was asked, uh, "Do you have a, did, did you have a preference? Like when, you know, because they talked to, Sark talked about how they, they got to demolish Tech on Friday night, so he got to sit back and watch football as a fan on Saturday and uh, was asked when you were watching the, the, the games after you knew Oklahoma had throttled TCU, uh, were you rooting for either to play Oklahoma or to play uh, Oklahoma State here with Sark yesterday? No, it didn't matter. You know, I mean, at, at this point, at this stage, we and we've been on this kick all year. We've been focused on what, what, what we need to do and being enamored with what we need to do. Um, I think in a in an in a unique way, it's it's kind of fitting that we're playing Oklahoma State in the Big 12 championship game, knowing we didn't get an opportunity to play each other in the regular season. Um, with us leaving the Big 12 and some of the great games and the matchups that have been that have gone on kind of over the years and historically, so for us to be able to play in the Big 12 championship game, um, it's kind of fitting knowing, hey, we're, we're going to be playing OU every year moving forward. So that part's kind of fitting. Um, All right, so, yeah, um, they've been playing Big 12 championship games since the Oklahoma game. And, you know, he went on to say there that, uh, you know, probably fitting to get to see Mike Gundy one more time, right? You didn't have to face the mullet during the regular season and a chance to uh, avenge some of these losses, including last year's bitter loss in Stillwater. And as we said, Longhorns 3-7 and in their last 10 matchups with Oklahoma State, so not to be taken lightly, but a chance to, to finish it. And um, the, the revenge tour, as we've called it. Let's hear Sark. He was also asked about well, what we're talking about in Rod's Ramp. Uh, are you a CFP team? Do the Longhorns belong as a one-loss team in this conversation to be in the Final Four? Um, why wouldn't I? Okay, that's a better answer, and I'll move on to the next one. Okay, so I was exhausted by the end of Saturday. I, I don't, I don't I, you know, yeah, I really was a fan. You know, I came in early uh, Saturday morning to, you know, to watch the tape and to, and to get a lot of the – kind of the paperwork stuff done coming out of our ball game. And then I just started to become a college football fan like like I am. I didn't have to change. I mean, I, I loved watching some great games. And there was fantastic games Saturday. Um, but by the end of it, uh, when it was uh, Pac-12 after dark, you know, that little bit of the Pac-12 in me growing up in California, I tuned in to the, uh, to the UCLA-Cal game that night. I was thinking to myself, man, I'm exhausted. I don't know how you guys do it every Saturday. Uh, I only have to worry about one game. You, you, you all have to worry about uh, a ton of games. But great games, great teams. Um, you, you could see the grit and perseverance in some teams that got kind of pushed to the brink. Um, and, and a lot of teams found a way to win games. A couple teams didn't. Um, and now here we go into the next weekend. And, and what is this all going to look like? So um, – I don't, I don't know why I wouldn't think we're a college football playoff contender. Um, we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, after the game Saturday. Uh, but we're in great position. Uh, but what I also know is we have to take care of our business like I touched on Friday. Um, we've got a huge game in front of us here Saturday. And, and there is there is no college football playoff talk if we don't play really good Saturday and, and try to find a way to win that game. And if, if that happens, then then there's another discussion to be had. But a lot of people got to play. A lot of good teams got to play one another. And, um, you know, we'll, the, the dust, like I say all the time to the team, the, the dust's going to settle where it's supposed to. So we'll see what happens. Dust will settle where it's supposed to. And it's fair to say, you can hear Sark, he, he doesn't really want to address it because he wants his team to stay focused on this game because it doesn't matter if you don't beat Oklahoma State. If you stub your toe, start thinking about things you can't control. And that's they've come too far in that regard of uh, finding ways to avoid distractions and eating the poison cheese they talk about. But it does sound pretty clear to me, and I would say this, you can predict this, um, if they win this game and, and were to win it comfortably, double digits or more, you will immediately, because that game's at 11 o'clock in the morning, the Pac-12 championship will already be decided the night before, um, you know, between Oregon and Washington. Uh, Texas plays the early game, which means by 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the afternoon, if they win that game comfortably, you can damn well bet that Sark is going to go lobbying heavily for his team. That's when you'll start to hear Sark pounding tables and lobbying for his team, because at that point you've accomplished it, the dust has settled, and that's when you can start doing your arguing, because that, you know, you get, you get ahead of that, uh, to make your case because the committee will make their announcements the next day that morning before NFL football. So uh, good stuff from right there. I'm Sark right there and Rod's rant coming back. Good stuff as well. Jerry Hamilton, the senior recruiting analyst for Inside Texas, a wealth of knowledge on all things college football and recruiting, plus his thoughts on Longhorns and, and uh, Cowboys and Stillwater and the ire of, of Mike Elko at Texas A&M. All things will kick around with G coming next on Hook Up with Ian Rod B.
Yeah, hook them up with uh, just yours truly and Ty today. Rod out. Uh, running a pretty high fever yesterday. and hope Rod's going to be okay. Uh, be right back in here with us in the, uh, the Onion Creek Studios. Ty's back on the, the banks of 360, and we'll get you through your Tuesday morning. It's a busy one, uh, busy one to say the least, before the top of the hour. Some bullish or BS topics around the landscape that we are bullish on and those we are calling BS on, including last night's Monday Night Football game, which – Unwatchable, unwatchable, uh, and my rant is pretty simple: is uh, you knew that, uh, and you could have flexed it. You know, the NFL adopted a rule to be able to flex Monday night football games beginning in Week 12. Still not understanding why that Texans Jaguars game wasn't flexed to Monday night football. Would have been a much better game, and it was a much better game on Saturday that went to the wire. And uh, last night was pretty much unwatchable with the Bears and the Vikings and some backup quarterbacks. Hey, can we go to the Vaqueros hotline? He is uh, one of our favorites. He is the uh, senior. We're national recruiting analyst for On3 Sports and Inside Texas, a great friend of ours. He's Jerry Hamilton. What's up, G? Uh, not much, man. Not a lot going on this week at all, right? Yeah, not a lot going on. And we got lots to talk about. I appreciate you doing this. Uh, <laughs> hey, listen, um, let me start with this because I want to talk some Texas and Oklahoma State before we get into some recruiting and what's to come with the portal and everything that you're trying to follow and cover uh, at a very high level. What? Uh, well, tell me about Ollie Gordon coming out of Euless Trinity and the type of player he was and what the Longhorns are dealing with. Amazing to me that Ollie Gordon only had 19 carries over the first three games, um, but once Mike Gundy settled on him as the, the, the engine of their offense, he, he might be running his way to the Doak Walker Award. Yeah, very, very interesting, uh, re, you know, per player and prospect. Look, Euless Trinity wasn't the powerhouse they once were when he came out. I think maybe he was overlooked a little bit. With that being said, he was a four-star running back. He was the number 15-ranked running back in the in the country in the on-three industry ranking. He was a guy that Texas offered a, a couple of days before signing day. Um, and Mike Gundy actually kind of laughingly made reference uh, to that yesterday in the press conference when – Asked what you know, what does Oklahoma State do when the blue bloods like a Texas comes in and offers one of their players late? And it was in reference to Ollie Gordon and my and my, Mike Gundy laughingly said, "Oh yeah, you mean twelve hours before signing day?" <laughs> so I thought I thought that was actually pretty funny. But Ollie Gordon is a physical back, a multi-sport athlete. You know, he grew up in that DFW area on the same youth football teams with uh, you know some guys on the Texas team. There's a lot of familiarity in this game. There's a lot of guys from Dallas, a lot of guys from Texas on this Oklahoma State roster as normal. In fact, the, of the 33 prospects that have been drafted in the Mike Gundy era at Oklahoma State, 16 are from Texas, and the majority of those are from DFW area or East Texas. So, yeah, but Ollie was a physical player. He's a long-armed guy. Uh, I can tell you this. What happened there this year was they started the season with a three-quarterback rotation. And Ollie Gordon wasn't the hardest practice player, the, the guy that was going as hard as other people in practice. And I think, to, I, I think Mike Gunning and that staff had to get him to go, totally buy in. Um, they also had to stop the three-quarterback system, and they decided on Alan Bowman. And all that happened about the same time. And even though they had that loss against Iowa State, that's when they started to come together. Um, and, and when he settled on Bowman, and when they changed the run game from more of a zone scheme to a pull two power scheme, I mean, and that's where they've gone, and that fits Ollie Gordon. Uh, and, and I think Mike Gundy's done a great job of getting that kid to maximize what he can do this year. And like you said, Aaron, he's probably going to win the Doak. Yeah, Doak Walker Award. It might have been Jonathan Brooks running to that uh, award had he not gotten injured yeah, against TCU. Was, um, and then the season he was having, but we've seen this Longhorn backfield, and that's you know that's another side to this game. You know, you know, it's amazing we're you know going to be going to drill down on this the Longhorn first trip to the championship game since 2018, and Quinn yours should be the story. But we're going to talk about these running backs. I mean, uh, Tashard Choice. I mean, Steve Sarkeesian. They're doing a heck of a job. You co you cover you cover these guys on the recruiting trail coming out of high school. But uh, so not surprising for you to see a guy like Jaden Blue or a guy like Savion Red stepping in and running the way they were. I mean, this has been pretty impressive as the Longhorns with C.J. Baxter going down was down to their you know third, fourth, fifth running backs, and they still ran all over Texas Tech. No, they did, and, and, and the thing about it is, is they're all different backs. That's the good thing for Sark, right? I mean, C.J. Baxter fits that inside zone scheme. I mean, he fits it, and he's got great hands, and he's really good in pass pro for a young back. Jaden Blue, more of the home run hitter, right? You want to get him in space. You want to get him the ball on the edges. Uh, now, you got if you block it clean inside for him and he gets a crease, yeah, he makes a play like you saw against Texas Tech. 
Um, he doesn't necessarily fit the inside zone run scheme. And people are like, well, he's running tougher. Yeah, he's running tougher. But I'm, we're thinking more SEC next year and this large humans that are lined up across your from your large humans and how does that play into it. But if they can get Jaden Blue in space, they can get the ball out of the backfield. Uh, and they can hit. He can hit that home run on those a few uh, occasional carry. While he is running tougher, he's never going to be a downhill power back. But he has got a lot of home run, uh, big play, chunk yardage play uh, ability in him. Savion Red just run. I, I say runs pissed off. I mean that's that's what yeah. he does. That guy is angry on contact. He drops his pad. He is going to ma- He is not the fastest guy. He probably. He might would lose the 40-yard dash contest among the running backs, but that guy runs with a physicality that you rarely see in a great running back field. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, I think the – and the guys coming in, Aaron, Christian Clark, tremendous talent out of uh, Phoenix area. I think he is a big-time guy. I think he fits the scheme perfectly with an NFL running back body type. Jarrett Gibson – Florida's still trying to fight Texas there. Jarrett Gibson, 5'10", 207 pounds, a downhill back, really fits the scheme as well. Uh, so Texas has uh, two more guys on the way that are really talented as well. That's why we love talking to Jerry Hamilton. Jerry, we, we get in some debates because there are Longhorn fans uh, talking. You know, they, they go into the Big 12 title game. It's their last game in the Big 12, regardless of what happens beyond it. And uh, we saw the SEC schedule and the dates kind of trickle out yesterday from Chris Lowe at ESPN and the, the showdown here with Georgia uh, in, in October, the, the game with Arkansas at Fayetteville, the game with A&M on November 30th. Uh, and, and there are still some Longhorn fans who feel like, hey, uh, why are we moving to the SEC? Why did we make this call? Why didn't we just stay here now that uh, you know the four corner schools are joining and they've made the additions? We'd be better off here. You've made it clear in our visits that you know this, these recruiting halls the Longhorns are, are bringing in wouldn't be happening if the Longhorns were not moving to the SEC starting next year. 100%. I mean, look, Cedric Baxter would not be at Texas right now. As great of a, a, a relationship builder and coach to Shore Choice is, he wasn't coming to Texas if they were in the Big 12. And that's opened up the state of Florida for Texas in recruiting. Um, it's opened up the really Louisiana more so. It's just a different response you get from kids. And then I, I, let's be real, like Brandon Baker, the offensive tackle from modern day, who's going to sign with Texas here in a, in a few weeks and enroll early. He pretty much came down to SEC schools plus Oregon and Nebraska. So it wasn't even Pac-12 out there. It was SEC or Big Ten. I mean, these kids, DeAndre Carter, his teammate, who Texas lost down on the offer, he's going to play in the SEC from modern day. This thing carries from coast to coast because these kids have grown up watching the SEC dominate college football, whether people think some of the teams are overrated or not. And look, I'm just talking from a kid's point of view. They see every national championship. They see the awards. They see the NFL draft. And when you put those three things together, you have a powerful force in recruiting. So why did Texas move to the SEC? So they can maximize their force. And I think it's a powerful force when they're winning. And, and, and Sarkeesian, look, I mean, would Arch Manning have still gone to Texas if Texas was in the Big 12? I mean, maybe, but maybe not. The whole family's played in the SEC. I mean, it's an SEC family if there ever was one. Two at Ole Miss, one at Tennessee, radio shows. I mean, everything's SEC with that family. So Derek Williams, last year out of Louisiana, would he have come to Texas if they're staying in the Big 12? I mean, look at the schools he was really considering. They were SEC schools. That's just where this is at. And in the state of Texas, um, you know, these kids know if you go and talk to them, you know, when they get that initial list of schools when they're 16 years old or 15, when they start getting recruited, I'm telling you five out of seven, five out of the top seven and most kids' lists are SEC schools. Then you throw in an Ohio State, maybe if they like out West USC. That's just the reality of where recruiting is. And Sarkeesian built the staff uh, knowing Texas is going to the SEC uh, to make the most of it. Uh, great stuff with Jerry Hamilton. Longhorns uh, will play their final Big 12 conference game ever coming up on Saturday. Hey, uh, Jerry, the uh, the hire of Mike Elko at Texas A&M, uh, and how does it resonate with you, and uh, how does it resonate with recruiting? I know he mentioned the Texas high school coaches yesterday at his intro press conference. He's going to try to rebuild some of those relationships. Uh, that's the main rival and the, and the main recruiting rival, along with Oklahoma. How does Mike Elko resonate with uh, with recruits, you think? You, you know, I think it, what's interesting is when a coach is hired, I always I'll, the first thing I do is, okay, at, let's see what happens after he fills out a staff. Who does he put on that staff? Because that is so key in recruiting. 
Um, and I think because Elko was at A&M and he understands the state, um, you know, I think he's, uh, he'll keep Elijah Robinson, which is a key for uh, defensive line and keeping those guys on the team because there were a lot of Twitter goodbyes being written uh, a few, about 48, 72 hours ago um, that weren't published, but they were being written. So keeping those guys, the ones intact that they want to keep in the program, I think that's big. Uh, but I, I, it, it'll be interesting to see who he fills out his staff with. Like I said, I don't think – He's coming in green with not an understanding of, of the staff he needs to put together to, to maximize recruiting in Texas. Uh, so I, I think I think they'll I think they'll do fine. I think Mike Elko has enough of a feel to do fine. Him himself, I, I mean, you know, to be determined. There's just not. I, I think he's I think he's good with coaches. Um, how's he going to resonate with kids? I think that really comes down to how many games you win. I mean, he needs to have a good first season at Texas A&M. I mean, he's not coming in with a bare cupboard now. I mean, this. Uh, you know, they, they, it, there's a lot of talent on, on that on that team. They've just got to piece together some of the positions in need. Um, they got to keep their quarterbacks healthy. They got to better on the offensive line. But I mean, there's a lot of defensive line talent. There's some good young players in that secondary if they all stick around. Um, there's some good young running backs. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with an Evan Stewart if Damian Craig's not on that staff. Maybe Evan Stewart comes back to Texas A&M. Not out of the question because I think if Damian Craig w- w- is retained, there's no chance he comes back. Um, so we'll see we'll see what happens with Elko's offensive staff. And I think he understands and knows all these things that I'm talking about. So it gives him an opportunity to have success. Jerry Hamilton. Last thing, Jerry, you talk to these coaches uh, all over college football and the high school coaches. Is there any way to put into perspective how busy this December gets starting Monday, whether you're playing in the playoff and you're Sark or not, or you're getting ready for a bowl game? The portal, you're trying to close a, a, you know, the 2024 recruiting class on December the 20th. That window opens uh, while you're trying to get ready for a bowl game, while you're trying to re-recruit your own roster to keep them out of the portal. Uh, you, you know, that's why we see these staffs continuing to grow with people. You just need as many hands on deck to yeah. handle the next couple of weeks starting Monday. Yeah, you have to have an NFL type of personnel department these days. There is no – Mike Gundy talked about it in his press conference yesterday. Um, he said all our coaches after the game Saturday – they won't go back to Stillwater. They'll scatter to go recruit. I mean, that's where we're at. I mean, that Big 12 championship game ends an hour and a half later. You're on the road recruiting. I mean, just think about that. You know, they go back with your team. You're hitting the road recruiting. The portal is madness. I mean, just, I mean, like the linebacker from Vanderbilt, the team captain put his name in the portal. Uh, Will Howard <laughs> put his name in the or, or announced he's going to put his name in the portal already. I think it's going to be, I'm not sure it's going to be wild this year, but I think it's going to be a little bit more so than last year. Um, I, I think this is the first year that I think we're really going to test the limits of, uh, of the portal. Uh, because just when you see the, the, the captain of the Vanderbilt football team put his name in the portal, I mean, that's just – that's the thing you didn't think you would see in college football four years ago. And I know, look, he's, put, he's been there a while, and he, he's got an t- opportunity to go win. And I mentioned he's a flyer Mount Marcus kid. Uh, so I think it's going to be crazy. These coaches, I mean, look, this, these next three weeks for them, like you said, Aaron, and if you're in the college football playoff, I mean, just think about yeah. dealing with all that. And the craziest thing, Aaron, <laughs> is let's say Texas wins Saturday. And let's say they get in the college football playoff. There's going to be kids exiting the program at Texas on a team preparing for a playoff game. That's how wild <laughs> college football is right now. Yeah, because they got to, you know, if they're on the depth chart down and they want to make a move, they're going to have to jump in early. Uh, it is crazy times, but always good stuff with Jerry <laughs> Hamilton. They have, to ju- they, have to jump in to, they have to jump in to get a spot somewhere. You can't wait until no, uh, January 2nd. I mean, you're, you're, you're no. too far behind if you're a kid that's leaving a school. Man, I'm looking for the, the spot for you, and that's uh, the way college football works now. Like it or, or like it or hate it, uh, that's the task. Longhorns will be fine with that just as they're playing the college football playoff uh, or maybe getting ready for the Cotton Bowl or the Fiesta Bowl, depending on how things fall on Sunday. Hey, Jerry, thanks so much. Uh, Chess Jerry at Inside Texas, of course, on 3 Sports, on their YouTube channel as well, on Texas Football. He's got a show coming up at 8 o'clock on uh, Coffee and Football, which is always great. Jerry, thanks so much, my friend. Appreciate you jumping in. You got it, man. Talk to you sooner. All right, there's Jerry Hamilton. There you go. There's your layout. Uh, recruiting, bowl games, uh, portal. <laughs> it's crazy times. He also gave a good thumbnail on Ollie Gordon, this Longhorn running back room, and the Longhorns move to the Southeastern Conference. We'll come back. When we do, we will uh, hit some bullish or BS topics, including 11 games into a tenure now firing NFL head coaches. 11 games in. Are you bullish or BS on that? Plus the top stories uh, coming back. Uh, uh, Mike Craven will join us in the 8 o'clock hour. Mike, of course, the senior writer at Dave Campbell's Texas Football. He was at Mike Elko's introductory news conference yesterday. Get his thoughts coming back. Let's hook him up with Ian Rodby.
Aaron Hogan, Rod Babers, Hook Em Up, 1019 AM 1260, The Horn. Appreciate Jerry Hamilton. You'll also, I think, appreciate Mike Craven coming up next hour, right after the headlines. Craven with the uh, Dave Campbell's Texas Football, my co-host on the Eyes on Texas podcast that we do. Uh, he was busy yesterday. He was up in Waco talking to uh, Mac Rhodes, the athletic director there, about the decision to keep uh, Dave Aranda make some serious coaching staff changes, then headed down to the introductory press conference of Mike Elko. So we'll get his thoughts on this uh, coaching carousel <laughs> in college football in the state of Texas. Also his thoughts on Texas and Oklahoma State and the Big 12 championship game. Uh, but t- time for some bullish or BS. With Rod being out this morning, it's Ty and myself, Ty Henderson, back at the Horn headquarters. Ty, are you, uh, are you bullish or BS on this decision to fire Frank Reich in Carolina? Uh, you know, I mean, I know in the NFL, it's a performance based job. I get it, but 11 games into a tenure, uh, you know, they just fired Matt rule, uh, last year and, um, you know, Matt rule had been given several years and to try to build that he could never find a quarterback. And now they hire Frank Reich, who was fired last year in Indianapolis where he had done a pretty good job. Uh, and then, you know, the owner wants to bring in Jeff Saturday and move on from the, you know, the get themselves in line to draft a quarterback, which they've done now with Anthony Richardson, and, and make a change there, which is fine. But all right, bullish or BS on 11 games for a head coach to get to, to, to show himself in Carolina? Uh, I mean, after last year, I, I, I don't, I, and, and the ownership change. I mean, he did pick the fire my rule, kind of hastily picked a veteran head coach in Reich. So I, I, I don't know. I, I think he needed to, it needed to move on at this point. Bryce Young really hasn't Already? looked like he – he hasn't looked comfortable at all. I feel like there's been a lot of animosity uh, well, I, with the well, C.J. That, Stroud thing. Well, then that's just bad ownership, I and mean, Dave Tepper needs to have, make a better hire. Because uh, obviously the underlying conversation is that he wanted C.J. Stroud and the owner wanted Bryce Young. And, you know, the, the, that, that, you know to, to your point, if that's forever going to be a wedge, then <laughs> you probably just cut the wedge now uh, because you're not going to have C.J. Stroud. Houston's going to have him, and he's con- you know, competing for the – you know the, he's going to be the rookie of the year, might be the MVP, and he looks like the next big-time quarterback in pro football. Meanwhile, Bryce Young has not developed and has not looked anywhere close to that. It's a Grand Canyon between those two quarterbacks. So, you know, maybe you're right there, but it does seem – I mean, Dave Temper's a you know, hedge fund billionaire guy. He's got the money, but he's already – he's still paying Matt Rule. Uh, these coaches and these guaranteed – who's not bullish on these guaranteed buyout contracts? I mean, I know it's a tough profession. We just talked about it with Jerry Hamilton. But if you can get yourself to uh, where you're getting paid not to coach, that's pretty pretty impressive, right? I mean, come on now. Uh, Matt Rule's getting paid. Now you got to pay out Frank Reich's contract, who's still being paid by Indianapolis, who fired him last season. This guy, you know, he, he, don't feel sorry for him, but the industry and Dave Tepper, uh, shame on those guys in my mind. Uh, I mean, what can you do at this point? Well, they're billionaires. They've got to make money. Uh, but, no, he's out. But, I mean, look, again, to your point about uh, Bryce Young, if Bryce Young is going to be the quarterback, then you need a coach that wants to coach Bryce Young. And if there's a thought that Frank Reich, you know, that's going to be, as I say, that's going to be a wedge that he wanted C.J. Stroud. I, I don't – look, he th- – there's animosity to it without a doubt. But at the same time, 11 games into a season, I just really tough to tell what your regime is going to be, what your program will be. Um, I am calling BS on the owner, but at the same time, you know, you're I also could, calling BS on the owner if he's getting involved and who's going to, you know, you hired these people to draft the quarterback. And then clearly the owner's wrong, but he can't fire himself. And um, he should have drafted C.J. Stroud. All Houston Texans fans are thrilled that they didn't. And they're going to send Christmas cards to Dave Tepper starting this year and every year. But uh, same time, they're going to bring in someone else to try to develop Bryce Young. They also have no weapons, by the way, guys. Let's not think consider them. I mean, they don't have any weapons. They traded their only good receiver, DJ Moore, uh, to, to the Bears. I mean, it's uh, Bryce Young with nothing. And, um, you know, what a mess. I'm calling BS on that whole situation. But uh, thank you, Dave Tepper, for Houston Texans fans. We'll come back. When we do, we'll reset these headlines. We now know, at least preliminarily, the date of the Longhorn game with Texas A&M, the first game in a dozen years coming next November. We'll get you details on that, plus other a couple other big Longhorn SEC games in 2024. Uh, and, of course, the big game coming Saturday. It's Texas and Oklahoma State. We'll continue to preview the Big 12 championship game. It's a busy Tuesday on 101.9 AM 1260. We're streaming on the Horn app and at hornfm.com. It's hook them up.
We're rolling. Take A. We're two, rolling. Take over. Double double. Come. Ian Rod B. No Rod B today. Rod is uh, under the weather. We're rooting for him. Had a high fever. He was running yesterday afternoon, so elected to uh, not test it. And uh, good for him. Hope he's getting some rest. And uh, you know, hopefully for you. You know, everybody uh, everybody gathers at the holidays. Family comes in town. You go to see family. And a lot of times you uh, catch a little bug or something uh, on the other side of that. Let's hope the best for Rod as uh, we'll get details and when, when he can get back. Uh, we're also, speaking of details, here on Hook'em Up, we're finalizing our details for our plan this weekend. Longhorns are getting prepped for the game in uh, Arlington uh, with Oklahoma State. Um, we are also going to be up there. We're, as you just heard from Jerry Hamilton last hour from Inside Texas, we are again going to be partnering with Inside Texas on some stuff we're doing with them on a Friday afternoon for to bring some, some coverage of, for them and for us here on the Horn, which we're looking forward to uh, with Patrick Davis and the crew Friday afternoon on your way up. And then uh, have a really good plan that's coming together for Saturday. Uh, and we're going to be telling you about that coming up just as soon as we, we put the final touches on it. But uh, we are going to be in up in Arlington uh, Saturday morning with live broadcast and live coverage on right near Cowboys Stadium, AT&T Stadium. And as a matter of fact, the place that uh, we're finalizing where we're going to be, uh, Ty, uh, shuttles people to and from the stadium. So you can come join us for pregame coverage in the morning, get some uh, kegs and eggs, as they say, grab a bite, uh, and then shuttle uh, over to AT&T Stadium. I'll get you details on that place called Jay Gilligan's uh, right there in Arlington, over near um, you know old downtown Arlington, but also near UT Arlington, the UT Arlington campus. That's where we're going to be posting up, but I'll get you details on times and everything. But uh, pretty cool that you could come hang out and uh, shuttle over. He told me, uh, the owner there, Ty, told me that uh, last week for the Cowboys game on Turkey Day, they shuttled, you know, Two, two, three thousand people over to the game and back, which is a good way to do it if you don't want to you know, pay the freight and all that goes on with Cowboys and AT&T Stadium. So uh, pretty cool. So we'll get you details. Be, be advised of that. Uh, and we'll also have so as much coverage as we can bring is what we're talking about for the Big 12 Championship game. Longhorn's first trip since 2018. So, yes, if you're making your plans – Head up to the Metroplex. We will get you details on. You can come follow us and be around uh, ourselves and our friends at Inside Texas and uh, on Friday afternoon, and then again on Saturday morning for the Longhorns' final ever Big 12 contest. You getting fired up for this game, Ty? Are you getting geeked up? It's uh, it's a championship, Matt. I'm remaining calm. I, uh, I, I I think I think we'll take care of business. It's a business okay. trip. Are you also getting geeked up for uh, Thursday night? Thursday night when the Cowboys in that same stadium will open up a critical. You know it's. Because uh, somebody texted us, by the way, this is pretty cool on the text line. We always appreciate the text, 447-3776, the messages. This says, guys, it's going to be a good October next year. Because we told you that Texas, according to Chris Lowe of ESPN, will get you the full rundown of that coming up here in the headlines. But uh, Georgia, the Longhorns with Georgia, has been announced as an October game, October uh, third week of October against the Georgia Bulldogs here in Austin. And as the texter points out, next year in October, OU weekend, ACL Fest for two weekends, F1 weekend, and now you can go ahead and add – the Georgia Bulldogs to the October rundown, um, you know, very well, maybe a three time defending national champion. I mean, Georgia is that good this year. They're playing as the number one team in the country right now. Think about that Ty. You could have, because the last team was the last team to go three times Was it Minnesota back in the thirties. Isn't that right? That uh, the last time a team went three in a row, because remember when Texas beat USC in 2005 at the Rose bowl, USC was trying to win a third straight and Texas derailed that. We can also point out that back in the mid nineties, Texas derailed Nebraska in the first ever Big 12 championship game, and Nebraska was seeking three straight national champions. Texas derailed that. Uh, wouldn't it be something if the Longhorns could find their way into the college football playoff with that game looming next October? What if the Longhorns did it again, Ty? What if it's a, what if it's a trifecta for the Texas Longhorns? Got to get in first, but that could be some history made if uh, – uh, you get to face Georgia and knock them off on their run to three in a row. If you don't beat or face them, then you're going to face them next October, which is pretty cool to look forward to on the calendar. Start saving your nickels right now, by the way, for that month. I'm not scared of anybody right now. You're not? I'll tell you that much. I, I, I don't, I, Michigan's the one team that I think could, could definitely out-physical Texas right now. But any of the sure. – Georgia, Alabama could beat them again. Not, not afraid of any of the Pac-12 teams. 
Well, I think I, Texas I, would stand up to any of them. I do. I think, but at the same time, you know, you, once you get the matchups, you start breaking them down, tendencies, weaknesses. But uh, you know, well, the one thing for Georgia, if you're not watching this, their their passing game is is really strong. I, mean, I think they could have a chance to advance to the Texas secondary. But we'll talk about that game when we, if we ever to get to it. We do know that it's come on the schedule for next year, uh, without a doubt. This says, as an Arlington native, Jay Gilligan's is a well-known local spot, great location, good call. See you there. That's from our buddy Craig Castleberry. Yeah, we're gonna be at Jay Gilligan's coming up uh, on Saturday morning. Uh, we're trying to decide if it's going to be 9 o'clock until 11 or you know, or 8 until 11. So a couple of formalities to figure out there. But uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're looking at Jay, Jay Gilligan's. This says UT Arlington, one of the most unattractive college campuses in the country. Well, you know, well, we're not going to be on the college campus. Right near it, uh, between UT Arlington and AT&T Stadium is where Jay Gilligan's is, right in that little strip in downtown Arlington. So looking forward to that. We'll also tell you where we're going to be Friday afternoon on this Tuesday morning as we finalize our plan. Speaking of plans, coming up, uh, we'll be at the turn at the bottom of the hour. We'll hit that coming up. Also, go behind the burn orange curtain. Here's from Steve Sarkeesian from his Game Week news conference yesterday on a Monday. And, of course, uh, Mike Craven will be joining us here coming up from Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine. Talk about his busy day yesterday. The coaching carousel in the state of Texas is spinning right now. Let's get to the headlines, though. Top stories to start your 8 o'clock hour. Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment bring it to you. Start with college football. Seventh ranked Horns now in full prep mode for their showdown with Oklahoma State on Saturday in Arlington. Texas will seek to claim their fourth Big 12 championship, their first since 2009. At his weekly Monday media availability yesterday, head coach Steve Sarkeesian described his team as focused and business as usual as they look to complete the mission. We're headed to Arlington Saturday, you know, 11 a.m., competing for, for a Big 12 championship. You know, quite frankly, that's been our mission and that's been our focus all year, was to be champions this year, and we've earned that right. Um, and we've got ourselves in position to do that, uh, to think. In the last 27 he years here at Texas, there's only been three conference championships. Uh, and so we, we don't take this lightly. Uh, we know the challenge that it is to, A, make it to the game, and then, B, to ultimately win that game. Uh, so to be the fourth team to do it here in 27 years would, would be a heck of a deal if we could get it done. Win or lose that game on Saturday at 11 o'clock. The game will be the Longhorns' final ever Big 12 Conference game. Uh, word yesterday that the SEC plans to unveil the conference's entire 2024 schedule sometime in December. Uh, the first that will, of course, include Texas and Oklahoma in the expanded 16-team league. Ahead of the full release next month, ESPN's Chris Lowe revealed a number of dates from some of the bigger matchups, including three for the Longhorns. According to Lowe, Texas will host the Georgia Bulldogs October 19th of 2024, as we mentioned. Likely to be one week after that annual R Red River showdown with the Oklahoma at the Cotton Bowl. They will also make a trip to Arkansas November 16th in a re-engagement with their old Southwest Conference rivals. And they will renew, according to Chris Lowe, the rivalry with Texas A&M after 12 years on a hiatus in College Station Saturday, November 30th to close the regular season. Longhorns 2024 non-conference schedule also includes home games with Colorado State, UTSA, and UL Monroe, plus that early season road game at Michigan. Speaking of Texas A&M, Aggies made it official yesterday and introduced Mike Elko as the program's new head football coach. Elko left A&M to take his first head coaching job at Duke after the 2021 season, went 16-9 and in two seasons in Durham. Blue Devils had won just 10 games in the combined three previous years. Elko won 16-2. and NFL, quite a stinker on Monday Night Football last night. Kind of expected this to wrap up Week 12 in Minnesota. Cairo Santos made a 30-yard field goal with 10 seconds left. That gave the Bears a 12-10 win over the Minnesota Vikings. Chicago improves to 4-8 without scoring a touchdown. Their defense intercepted Vikings quarterback Josh Dobbs four times. Vikings fall to 6 and six. Week 13 in the NFL kicks off this Thursday night in Arlington. Surging Cowboys hosting the 6-5 and five Seahawks. Pink slips in Carolina yesterday. Panthers fired head coach Frank Reich just 11 games into his tenure there. Went 1-10. Uh, of course, Reich replaced Matt Rule this past offseason. Team also dismissed their quarterbacks coach Josh McCown and assistant head coach Deuce Staley. All right, uh, we've heard Sark there completing the mission, business as usual, business trip. I said this earlier, but I believe it. If uh, if they win that game on Saturday, and the Longhorns are a two-touchdown favorite, um, you know, because we get all the texts and all the conversation with you folks about, you know, should Texas be in the CFP or the college football playoff team? Uh, you, and we'll hear more from Sark coming up in our Behind the Burn Orange Curtain segment. Sark is, you know, honestly dismissing it. He, you know, he's going to defend his team, but he wants to keep his team focused on this week, knowing how much trouble they've had with Oklahoma State. And he, he, he said for sure, he said, why wouldn't I think we're a college football playoff team? But he didn't, you know, bang the table. He's not lobbying for his team yet because he knows they've got another game to win. Um, you know, if they win, that, that's an 11 o'clock kick on Saturday. 
if Texas were to win that game and, and come close or even you know, you know double digits, not as emphatic as the Tech game, but if they win that game, uh, you, can, you can damn well bet that Sark will begin to lobby immediately uh, for his team. That's when you can start doing the, the politicking and should. Uh, because, you know, you've made your case now. Uh, the, the dust had settled, as Sark had said. All the puzzle pieces played, and then you start to lobby for your football team. Uh, you, can, you can expect that to happen. But first, you've got to win the game. With that in mind, let's go to the Vaqueros hotline. He is the senior writer at Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine, doing an incredible job of covering college football, coast, uh, you know, border to border here in the great state, top to bottom. He's all over it. He's our man, Mike Craven. He's also my co-host on the Eyes on Texas Multicast, which we will have out tomorrow. We'll record our newest episode coming up today. Uh, what's up, Mr. Craven? Uh, nothing much. Uh, nobody got fired between the time I went to bed last night and the time I woke up, so it was pretty good. Pretty good, pretty good. Yeah, you, you've had a busy couple of days. I mean, you knew this was coming with the carousel, and uh, you were in Waco yesterday, you told me. Then you had to travel down to College Station, which isn't that far of a drive, to cover the Mike Elko press conference. Let me start with uh, what you learned in, in Waco, and then we'll get to the Aggies and the Longhorns in the championship game. But uh, what did you make of, uh, of, De- of what's going on in Waco? Dave Aranda will stay, 3-9 and nine campaign, but uh, massive change is coming to how they run the operation, it feels like. Yeah, I think he's going to go back to being defensive coordinator, Dave Aranda, where he's calling the plays, where he's coaching the schemes, where he's in those meetings all of the time. And they're going to look for an offensive coordinator with an explosive offense, but also one that's had some head coaching experience. Um, You know, and this isn't a unique thing. There's plenty of colleges around the country where there's basically a head coach for the offense and a head coach for the defense. It feels like they're going to go that way. And And another big part of it is they're going to get into NIL a little bit more. Baylor, you know, a small Christian university, I, I don't think that they wanted to get into the waters of NIL too much. But you look around, even in the Big 12 without Texas, without Texas, uh, without Oklahoma, there's still plenty of, of places in there spending a decent amount of money on players. And if Baylor wants to keep up, they're going to have to get into that pool. I think they realize that. So those are the changes that we're going to see in Waco. All right, so uh, we'll watch for names uh, of a dynamic offensive coordinator with uh, head coaching experience. That's a, you know, and there, there are those guys are out there for sure. But uh, Dave Aranda, uh, what, Mac Rhodes, the AD there, you, you still you know, feel like they're they're confident in, in Dave Aranda. He won a Big Twelve championship in his second year, but uh, uh, you know, a, a fall without Matt, you know, without Matt Rule's players and Joey McGuire moving on um, to, to 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 Texas Tech and take a lot of that recruiting staff. There's still confidence in Aranda in Waco. I think so. And, you know, you talk to Dave, he's a, you know, you like him. You, you want to like him. You want him to succeed. And, and I think, you know, watching what happened with Dana Holgerson at Houston versus what happened with Dave Veranda at Baylor is likability and the, the ability of, of bosses to go, well, I like this guy coming to work. I like working with this guy. I want him to do better. Let's see if he can have one more year. Another part of it's the money. You know, I think A&M buying out Jimbo for $76 million warps our brain into thinking that's not a ton of money and all of these colleges have $20, $30, $40 million laying around um, to go buy out a coach. You know, Dave Aranda's at a private school, so we don't know the exact number, but I'm told it's around $20 million. They just finished their their development center or finishing up their their player development center. They just built a new basketball arena. Um, They finished an indoor practice facility. Like They've done a lot right in the last year or so at Baylor, and I just don't think their fan, but their donor base was up to, hey, let's get another $20 million raised and then another $10 million for the next coaching search. I think they're going to try to get Aranda back in his comfort zone of being the defensive coordinator, try to bring in a guy who's been a head coach to run the offense, and then they're going to reassess after the 2024 season and see where Baylor's at. Mike Craven, Dave Campbell's Texas football senior writer, uh, went from Waco where he got that news. Dave, Dave Aranda still liked by his bosses. Safe to say at Aggieland, Jimbo Fisher wasn't very liked by a lot of people. Um, and that's where the $80 million buyout comes. And now the move to Mike Elko. Uh, just your thoughts, Mike. Obviously, we all heard and saw the reports that Mark Stoops was the choice and maybe flew to College Station and was told to go back because of fan and you know, you know know regent and booster backlash at the hire. And now Mike Elko is in. Uh, what was the scene there yesterday? Uncomfortable? Uh, what, what, what was your read of what went on over the weekend and what was announced yesterday? No, I mean, I, I think everything was fine, and they, they were having a good time yesterday. I mean, uh, General Welsh, who's their interim president, probably going to become the president at, at Texas A&M shortly, kind of made a joke at the very beginning, kind of saying the quiet part out loud. And he goes, turns out hiring a big-time college football coach is hard. Um, and it can be, <laughs> right? I mean, there's a lot that goes into this thing. There's a lot of opinions in the room. I think we try to we, we act like 
Steve Sarkeesian was the one and only choice for Texas, and everybody that was in that room bet on Steve Sarkeesian. That's not how it goes, right? Like, there's differing of opinions. There's 10 or 15 power brokers making these decisions, and they're not all going to agree. And also, they're all used to being told yes. Like, not many of them are used to being told no. Like, they get what they want all of the time. And so uh, I think with A&M, they still have a problem with leaks, right? I mean, that all that stuff kind of goes on, I think, in a lot of coaching searches. But we don't ever hear about it. The fact that we heard about it is probably a bad sign. Uh, but Mike Elko checks every single box that they wanted. You know, they looked around at the SEC, and they see Nick Saban and Kirby Smart as the two top dogs. Well, those guys are defensive coaches. And so – I think they wanted to go back to their roots, get a defensive coach. When Mike Elko was at A&M, they were 34-12 and 12 under Jimbo Fisher. When he wasn't there, they were 12-12 and 12 under Jimbo Fisher. I think they see Elko as, like, the glue guy, as the program guy, as the blue-collar uh, dude. And I think with Texas coming into the conference, that's the uh, mentality and that, that's the perception – uh, that they want there at A and M, so I think it was a good hire. I just think the way that they got to the hire makes it look like maybe it wasn't as good of a hire. That's an interesting one. as usually you do, Mike. You put it in great perspective. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, people with opinions, and uh, you know if the if the stoop stuff doesn't get leaked, you know maybe he was just flying in for an interview to finalize, but somebody wanted that out, and it um, really led to the backlash, which led to Mike Elko, which may in the end. Uh, be the right hire anyhow. Pretty clear for Mike Elko that uh, he can coach defense. I don't think there's any doubt about that. He he knows most of that locker room, that he still has a ton of talent on the defensive side. You know, his his ceiling and his uh, fortune there is going to be predicated on the staff he hires and the offensive coordinator he hires from this point. Yeah, no doubt. It'll be interesting to see if he brings in Johns from Duke, who's a, who's a good young offensive coordinator that a lot of people like, or if he goes outside. I mean, he's got a budget. I mean, they – they handed that to Adam's credit. They handed us his contract info as soon as the press conference started. I mean, the whole thing, uh, his six year, you know, seven million dollar base salary, what the incentives were. He, he can make up to ten point five million. And then the other part was the assistant salary pool. He has an eleven million dollar assistant salary pool, and so he's going to be able to go get whatever offensive coordinator he wants, probably, or at least most of them. And so it'll be interesting if he stays uh, with guys he knows or if he goes out and gets kind of a big-name splash OC uh, to lead this thing. Uh, And then you're right about the familiarity. He talked about how it's rare for your first-team meeting for you to know half the roster. And I think that's one of the reasons that he was hired. 2024 is a big year for A&M. They had a 12-year start on Texas. They're now in the same conference. They're hosting that game on November 30th. They don't want to get embarrassed. And to have a guy come in and to keep most of that roster intact gives them the best chance to compete with Texas and compete in the SEC in 2024. I think that was a big part of why he was uh, why he was hired as well. Yeah, well said. Uh, what about uh, Ross Bjork? I mean, is there some I mean, there's some talk that uh, wasn't his guy and he got got overruled and. Um, you know, what's your thought on Ross Bjork and his standing now at the top of the uh, the athletic department there at A&M? Yeah, that one's going to be interesting. You know, they've had a lot of turnover. Ross talked about how he's had four different presidents in four and a half years there at, at, at AD. I, I do think it's one of those things at A&M that without that sure fire, like condensed leadership at the top, it's allowed a lot of other parties to become pseudo leaders, like a lot of fraction, uh, factions within that back room there at A&M because they haven't had just a consistent president um, to be the guy or the gal there um, to be the boss. And so I don't think he has as much power as a lot of athletic directors. And I do think that some of the Mark Stoop stuff goes back on Ross. And I think some of the contract of Jimbo goes back on Ross. Right. And so uh, this is a big hire for him. Elko needs to work out. If Elko doesn't work out quickly, I'd imagine he's on that block as well. Uh, there's Mike Craven, senior writer, Dave Campbell's Texas football. Before we talk some Texas and Oklahoma State and your thoughts on what's coming Saturday, um, the, your alma mater, UTSA, Jeff Trailer, he was a candidate at A&M and interviewed for that job. Uh, Houston has come open with Dana Holgerson after a 4-8 and eight season being relieved. Uh, is he the natural choice there? We talked about Gary Patterson as well. I know you've written some stories on top candidates you're hearing out of the U of H. Yeah, I mean, I think UTSA may have dodged a bullet here. Without Arkansas opening up, without Baylor opening up, A&M going more national, uh, Jeff Trailer may be the head coach of UTSA in 2024, and that's something that I don't think I would have predicted about a month ago just because I thought some more jobs were going to open. Houston's going to be interesting because Houston doesn't have as much money as a lot of the programs in the Big 12. And so 
I think Trailer's choice right now is do you stay at UTSA and try to win the American and maybe get into the playoffs a couple of times out of every five years? Or do you go to Houston and where you're going to have to be under-resourced and catching up to the rest of the Big 12 and maybe 8-4, and 9-3 and three is going to get you fired, where 8-4, and 9-3 and three at UTSA may not be celebrated, but it'll keep you going. And so uh, I, I think UTSA is going to be okay there on the Houston search, although you never know what's going to happen with coaching carousel stuff. So if I'm Houston, my first call is Willie Fritz at, at Tulane. He was at Sam Houston. He knows the area. Uh, he knows East Texas. At Tulane, you're recruiting Houston a lot. He's just a ball coach. Like, the dude's won at, like, four or five different college levels. And so he would be my first call. I would absolutely call Jeff Trailer. But they'd be silly not to just kick the tires on Gary Patterson. I mean, he led TCU into the Big 12. He's kind of done that whole not having as much resources as everybody you're playing, and he loves that. He relishes that uh, kind of work. He wants to get back into coaching. And so I imagine he gets an interview. He gets some feelers out there and see uh, how interested he is and if they could afford him and and what he thinks about NIL and the transfer portal. Because that's kind of the thing with some of these older coaches, right? You just want to know – how they feel about modern football and if they're going to adapt to it. Cause you're not going to general four-star general your way to wins anymore. You need to be more of a player coach than Gary was. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if he gets back into it, kind of how he's changed as a, as a leader. Yeah. And you kind of feel, I argued this yesterday, Mike, that uh, if you get Gary Patterson, it's, it's his last job, right? I mean, he's going to stick and stay there and help build that program. Like he did TCU with a fertile recruiting base. Uh, if he's willing to go, <laughs> excuse me, and play in the NIL space, but at the same time, you hire Willie Fritz, and he, you know, kills it at Houston. You know, be another stepping stone spot for him because he's on the rise as is. Uh, but uh, will be interesting because I think Gary Patterson you know, could be there ten more years and be your coach for for quite a while. Trailer and Fritz, you know, might be a shorter term situation for Houston. Uh, either way, great stuff from Mike Craven. Mike, you were at the game on Friday when Texas demolished uh, Texas Tech fifty-seven to seven. As we told folks, you grew up going. You know, you pretty much grew up in the Texas athletic department. Your your grandfather was the longtime team doctor there, Doctor Craven. Um, and so you've been to a lot of football games there. I've heard from a lot of people that that was as good a game experience and game electricity that maybe we've ever seen at DKR. What was your read on the uh, the game, and, and then and then what what would you, what you experienced in the building? Yeah, I mean it's hard to disagree with that. I had gone to the Kansas game earlier in the year, but it was during the day. Like there's just with the drones and the light show and the LED and everything. Like I that was amazing that that was the Friday after Thanksgiving. Like I've probably gone to. 150 Texas games in my life, and that's got to be top five uh, experience that I've ever seen. What Del Conte and that group has done behind the scenes with Bevo Boulevard and you know having Bob Schneider at Texas City Limits, like it was a packed house. I remember when Matt got there and you know the whole come early, be loud, stay late thing. That was a plea. That was like please, please do that because y'all don't do that. Please come early, stay loud, be let. And and now you don't have to have that rallying cry anymore. And I think. Texas is SEC ready on the football field. And after what I saw Friday against Texas Tech, they're SEC ready in the stands. And that's going to be a big part of, of the success over the next year or two. Yeah, we talked about that yesterday, that uh, that was the vision. CDC said when he got here and people were talking, well, why are you doing all this when the team's no good? Let's get the team good. He was like, no, nope, my job is to make the experience a great one. We want to look like Austin. We want to be like Austin. We want it to be a celebration of Texas football. And then it's Sark's job to coach the team. And uh, he's done a heck of a job of building the roster. And now it's really come together. And I think that Friday night was kind of a culmination of both of those visions. And, uh, you know, maybe a, a, a you know signing post for where it's headed. Big picture. What about the game Saturday? Now, Longhorns are a two-touchdown favorite. Oklahoma State has gone 7-1 and in their last eight. Not always pretty, but uh, Mike Gundy can flat coach. What's your, your level of concern for the Longhorns on Saturday to get a championship? Yeah, I wasn't that concerned about Texas Tech because it felt like the thing Texas Tech did the best was the thing Texas was best at stopping. And I feel like this Oklahoma State game is essentially the same thing. Ollie Gordon's great. I've been watching Ollie Gordon play football for three or four years. He was awesome in the DFW area at South Grand Prairie. I was actually watching an Ollie Gordon playoff game against Allen when Sark's news got announced that he was going to be uh, the Texas coach. That was that year the playoffs went into the following calendar year because of COVID. He's awesome. Uh, but Texas is incredible on the defensive line front. I mean, Tavondre Sweat, Byron Murphy, you're not going to run against those guys successfully. Like, if, if your key to victory is running through T- Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy, you ain't winning. And I just don't see how Oklahoma State passes the ball enough to outscore Texas without the run game. Mike Gundy said in his press conference, in his career, he had been very good when he's one-dimensional. and They're going to have to figure out a way to run the football 
I, I know Tech was able to put up some numbers, but at no point during that game were they controlling it with the run game. If Texas gets a lead like they did uh, against Oklahoma State like they did against Tech, I just don't see the Cowboys built in a way to really push Texas. I think this was a better matchup than, say, a rematch with Oklahoma or another team with maybe a more uh, passing-centric identity. Uh, they, they match – styles make fights, and this style matches up really well for Texas. Yeah, that's uh, well said. And, I, you know, had I been Oklahoma and Dylan Gabriel and, uh, you know, the ability to run and play that spread veer and really get after Texas, which they did in the Cotton Bowl, uh, you'd be a little more concerned. But at the same time, it's Mike Gundy, 7-3 and three in the last 10 against Texas. And, um, you know, he's has something up his sleeve. So we look forward to that game. Mike, real quick, while you were at the game and you talk about top five experience, what about when Arch Manning came in the game? That was pretty surreal. You know, this is a third-string quarterback. Only came in because Malik Murphy got run into on the sidelines on a kickoff and uh, banged up his shoulder. So Arch is in the game. That was – I mean, what a hero's welcome he received. That was pretty cool. Yeah, to take everybody behind the curtain, when a game is a blowout like that, all of us up in the press box are writing our stories. Like, we're getting a head start. We're writing our stories. So most of our heads were down looking at our computer, and then all of a sudden the crowd went crazy as if something – I didn't know if McConaughey had taken his shirt off or what was going on. Like, the crowd <laughs> was going insane. And you look up and you see Arches out there, and we all stop writing our story, right? We just watch the rest of the game because you don't know what's going to happen. And it's just like such a, a thing we've all thought about for so long and written so many words about uh, that you just went there and you watched it. It was, it was awesome to see the crowd stick around and then the crowd have that type of reaction. And, and you just, you get reminded what the Manning name and what the lore and the, the pressure that that kid must be under. Um, it was, it was something, it was something to see a game be a blowout. And then a kid who you've never seen play before at the college level come out and then captivate, the entire stadium and the entire press box. Uh, it's just something about that last name. Yeah, and you, you said it. You guys had your head down. Fans were leaving, and all of a sudden, Arch is in. Everybody came back, and the place was right. packed uh, all the way until the end, which really you know, culminated a great night for Texas and see if they can finish it off with a great game Saturday. Thank you, Mike. I'll see you later, and uh, we'll be recording the Eyes on Texas uh, podcast for our episode this week. Uh, a lot of the same conversation, but even deeper dives. Uh, we appreciate you, my friend. Thanks a lot. All right, talk to you later. All right, there's Mike Craven. Uh, good stuff on all things Texas A&M, Baylor, Texas. Uh, likes the Longhorn. Styles make fights, and this one does seem to fit Texas, much like Texas Tech. We'll talk more about that coming up. Burn Orange Curtain, his thoughts on Oklahoma State, his thoughts on Ollie Gordon, the running back they have to stop. We'll get that coming. Also, we'll be at the turn at the bottom of the hour. That's coming next.
At the Turn is presented by Callahan's General Store, helping to keep your yard in golf course condition year-round for 45 years. It's always a good day to make it a Callahan's day. That's right, 8.30, we are at the turn. If you play golf, you know that's nine holes in, nine holes to go. Grab yourself a cold Bud Light, a cold beverage, maybe grab a taco and, uh, you know, finish the, the finishing nine. That's what we do at the turn, but at the turn, a little golf. Uh, and we told you earlier with Callahan's General Store, uh, we're going to be bringing back, starting in December, the golf course of the month. We did this last year, had a great time with it. We learned a lot about local golf courses and um you know, their history and uh, the inception and what kind of courses they are. Our friend Omar Uresti, who, by the way, Omar is heading out to go to Champions T- uh, Tour Q School this week. But before he does, he's going to be joining me today. And we are going to be recording our golf course of the month for the month of December. Brought to you by Callahan General Source. We'll tell you about that as we do. We'll break the news coming up next month. We'll be out there recording. And every month we feature a different course, and we did it last year for nine or ten courses. We'll do it again this year starting in December and all the way through the spring and the golf season into the summertime. And we know you love playing golf. Tee times are booked all over Central Texas. Hard to get one these days, and new courses or new clubs coming online and whatnot. So we're going to learn more about them to help you understand these courses you're getting out and playing and where they started and who runs them and uh, what are the best holes and those kind of things. It's all an idea of Callahan's General Store to help grow golf. And, of course, Callahan's is your spot to help keep your yard golf course ready year round and so uh, you know I always tell you man if you think you know yard stuff get over to their Callahan's they'll help you they've got uh, all the essentials you need but also uh, the the experts who can help you and guide you because if you're like me man you get in there you're like okay what do I need I'd like my yard to look like a golf course but I don't know how to do that they can not, not only have the the, uh, the the things you need and the uh, the proper feeds and seeds and pre-emergence and everything but the right one for your yard your type of grass all the things that uh, maybe you're you're not sure of where the shady spots are how you do that everything to make your car your golf your uh, yard golf course ready uh, year round with Callahan's General Store but uh, that's the breaking news we are going to be recording today for our golf course of the month and we'll review that coming up early December, uh, what it's going to be. And of course, you'll learn all about it. We'll have videos and best holes, and Omar and I will go out there and play a few and have a good time. That's coming up in December. Brought to you by Callahan's General Store. Eight holes in and nine to go. Presented by the great folks at Callahan's General Store. And they were all asking themselves the same question What is behind that curtain? <laughs> All right, it is uh, behind the burn orange curtain. No Rod Babers today. Hoping he's feeling better. Uh, he's getting better. You know, it's a, it's a rough one. He's got a young kid, young child, young baby at home. And uh, texted me yesterday that he's uh, you know, running a pretty heavy fever. And we're hoping he's okay. We're rooting for Rod. He'll be back as soon as he can, occupying his chair and holding down his side, shutting down his side of the field five hours a day, five days a week here on Hook 'em Up. But uh, hope he's getting some rest and feeling better. Steve Sarkeesian met the media yesterday, and that's uh, will be our behind the burn orange curtain. Uh, hearing from Sark talking about the, this game, you know, we we heard Mike Craven just say that, uh, and I've heard from so many of you folks and t- heard folks over the weekend that that experience on Friday night was as good as any. Um, can we hear from Sark on the the uh, his thoughts? I mean, he reviewed the tape, and here was Sark uh, opening up about uh, the fans, the experience, and what has been created at DKR, not just the football team, but the entire uh, celebration of Texas football. First of all, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the atmosphere at DKR Saturday night. You know, I got a chance having the day off Saturday to watch kind of the TV copy of our game. And, and sometimes when you're in the moment uh, coaching – you don't get a full appreciation and perspective on the atmosphere that it was. And uh, it was awesome. And, uh, you know, we, we can't thank our fans enough for their support uh, all season long uh, at DKR as well as on the road. Uh, but that was, a, that was a great night and, and a very cool send-off for our seniors. I thought it was a great moment uh, for them to get acknowledged in pregame uh, and to have that moment in front of that crowd, something that, We'll be with them for a lifetime. So, again, I, I can't thank all of our supporters enough. Uh, looking forward to seeing everybody in Arlington here Saturday um, for a great showing and a great turnout of Burn Orange uh, in the stands. All right, yeah, it was uh, pretty universal that that was quite a scene. Uh, you heard Mike Craven say he's been to you know, 150 games there and has never seen anything like it. Um, and that's, that's, that's credit to all parties, and it's kind of come together. But uh, more importantly, there's a Big 12 championship game to play on Saturday. As Sark has called it, the mission, right, the mission. Uh, and he pointed out again yesterday, and he may mention it here, every game since the Oklahoma game has been 
a Big 12 championship game in their mind. He writes it on the board to start the week. Like, uh, you know, this is our Big 12 championship game and trying to keep them focused. And that's why I said earlier I don't think he's been lobbying like maybe some fans would like him to for the college football playoff because, you know, they're not there yet. And uh, if they don't win Saturday, it won't matter. And one of the keys to winning Saturday will be stopping uh, the Big 12's top running back, Ollie Gordon. You just heard Mike Craven mention he's been watching him since his days in high school as a big-time player. Here is Sark on his read on, on this, this running back that they got to get their hands around on Saturday morning. Ollie Gordon's a heck of a player, and they have done a great job offensively of leaning into him. And he – really um, signifies who their team is. I, I feel like he gets stronger as the game goes on, like a lot of big physical backs do. Um, a lot of his best runs come in the second half when teams wear down. Uh, he has you know, the hard yards, the tough yards in between the tackles, but yet he has the big play, explosive play ability to create those long runs. Um, and, and they've got a variety of run schemes with him, and they do a heck of a job. Uh, out of the pistol formation where they can get to all their runs and a lot of them look the same. And so your defensive line, your linebackers have to do a great job of fitting those things and then you've got to tackle. And it, generally with, with a guy like him, one guy's not enough. And so our ability to populate the ball Saturday and making sure we're fitting these runs right uh, is going to be really critical. Yeah, he's a big time player. And we, we learned earlier from our buddy Ari Temkin uh, only 19 carries in the first three games of the season for our for for Ollie Gordon. Only 19. That's you know, you know, six a game essentially in the first three, which was not a lot. And they were trying to figure out their identity. And uh, once they realized, and, and if you haven't tracked the Oklahoma State season, they went two and two to start the year, um, and they lost to South Alabama. Uh, South Alabama out of the out of the Sun Belt came into Stillwater and. Knocked them around pretty good. Beat them 34-3, to I think the final score was. Then they turned around and lost their conference opener against Iowa State. That was a more competitive game. After that game, they had a bye week. And they were 2-2. Two and two. Since the bye, they'd gone 7-1. and one. And uh, the only loss was that weird, you know, the, the after Bedlam game where they beat Oklahoma in that, you know, unbelievably emotional final Bedlam game, maybe ever, or certainly for a long time. And turned around, went to Central Florida in a rain on a rainy day, and got beat bad, 34 to three. Really didn't show up. Flat performance, which at that point a lot of people dismissed Oklahoma State. But we told you they still controlled their destiny coming out of that loss because they had beaten Oklahoma and they didn't play Texas, and they had beaten K State earlier in the year on a Friday night in Stillwater. So they owned those two tie breaks, and uh, they ran the, the the table right. They beat Houston. Uh, beat BYU in a comeback, uh, you know, last week. And here they are playing, uh, you know, the Longhorns in the Big 12 championship game. Now, one of the uh, obviously big centerpieces of this game will be Quinn Ewers, the Texas quarterback. Um, this is a good question yesterday by one of the members of the media about Quinn Ewers year to year. We know Quinn last year. I was at the game live in Stillwater watching Quinn Ewers on a very windy day just look – just struggled. Longhorns controlled that game. They got a 31 to 17 and looked like they were going to run away with it with a win in Stillwater. And we know what happened. Um, you know, he, he was inaccurate, kind of got his dauber down a little bit. Uh, there was talk of a thumb injury. And in the end, the Longhorns lost that game. Uh, one of one of several games last year that the Longhorns had no business losing, but lost. Yesterday, Sark was was asked about Quinn Ewers' progress and development year to year. If you take that uh, that game last year in Stillwater to where he is now, uh, Sark has seen plenty of development here as Sark's uh, answer to that question. Well, you know, that that's part of the, the – games like that are part of the – the growing pains of playing the position, you know, when you get on the road and you get in a hostile environment um, and early on things are going your way and then things start not going your way for a variety of reasons. You know, in that game, we had a couple opportunities for some big plays and we didn't pass protect very well for him. Then we had a couple opportunities for some big plays. We didn't catch the ball very well for him. And then all of a sudden he misses a couple throws and those types of things can snowball on you. And I think the biggest thing that I've, I've learned, and I think Quinn has learned, and that I've learned about him is his demeanor. When things at times this year haven't gone great, for example, you know, the interception Friday night when he was trying to hit the fade to, to A.D. Mitchell, I thought his, his poise, his composure really showed through, uh, and he was able to come right back and, and still execute at a high level. A year ago, 
it might have been more of a challenge to to rebound from that type of a play. But uh, I think that that he's learning how to respond to those things, to learn from them, and then put them to the side, and then focus on. Um, the next task, the next play, and what's asked of him. So I think there's a mental maturity side from him that uh, you're seeing a lot of growth, a lot of maturity. All right, uh, there's Steve Sarkeesian. And that, that, that's a good question, good answer, right? And that's, you know, I, I already hear people, you know, media folks here in Austin and, and around the country already giving up on Malik Murphy. Like, if Mal you know, Malik Murphy's no good. Like, they, 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 they've established that in their brain because Malik, you know, struggled and, uh, you know, looked lost at times when he got his two starts. He looked good at times, too, but, you know, uh, but, you know, big question's going to come on Monday. You know, the Longhorns will play Saturday, and then they'll find out their bowl fate on Sunday. And then Monday the transfer portal opens, and we'll see. There's a lot of talk that Malik Murphy may jump into that portal. But either way, point of that is, and you listen to Sark, who played the quarterback position at a high level at, in college at BYU, you know, you, 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 the, 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 a couple of games does not determine a quarterback. Um, you know, at the college level. I mean, when Malik Murphy got onto the field, he hadn't played a game since he was in high school. Uh, you know, playing high school football in the state of California. And all of a sudden he's in the game uh, when Quinn Ewers got hurt. Uh, and, you know, take that back to what he just said about Quinn. I mean, you've got to go through that. You just do. Uh, you know, the talent's there. That's why you recruit these players. They have to, they have to take lumps. And if you're, a, you know, coaches don't, but media folks do and fans do, you just immediately give up on a guy. There, I mean, again, there's, there's, there's people here in Austin that are like, well, Malik's no good uh, because of what we saw. Well, gosh, I mean, think of Quinn last year. I, you know, I argued last year um, pretty adamantly that in that game against Oklahoma State that Sark should have made a change. He should have gone to Hudson Card in that game, and I think they would have won that game. Uh, but, you know, Sark put the development of his quarterback ahead of that. And you can criticize Sark all you want for that. You can say that you know, wins are the most important thing. But at that moment, for the, for the growth of the program and the growth of their, their quarterback, you know, he felt it was more important for him to stay out there and, and deal with that. And he wanted to see how he reacted to it. Even if they lost the game, uh, it was something he had to go through. And now you're seeing the improvement, and Sark just mentioned it. You know, you come in, make an early interception against Texas Tech, and it doesn't phase you at all. Um, you know, if Sark pulls him in that game, and doesn't let him finish it, and doesn't let him take the lumps, who knows how he develops, right? You lose confidence that way, too. So, uh, argument to be made. And, and clearly, Sark this year was, I don't want to say he was kind of giving away games last year, but there's an argument to be made that he was putting the development of his players and the development of his quarterback ahead of, you know, maybe what was best in that in the immediate moment, third and fourth quarter of football games. And we're, we'll see it here if it pays dividends because Quinn Ewers has a chance to do something no quarterback at Texas has done since 2009 when a guy named Colt McCoy led Texas to a Big 12 championship. He's, it's the last time it's happened, and Quinn Ewers has a chance to, uh, to, to solidify that and be a 12-win quarterback. Heck, there's hardly people talking about him losing his job to Arch Manning next year. And, you know, you're really going to you know, bench the guy that leads you to a Big 12 championship? You haven't won one in 15 years. Uh, that would believe that would be his job at that point, but uh, that's the conversation. But uh, good stuff from Sark. We'll hear more from Sark coming up uh, throughout the, the rest of the show. We got all the way till eleven o'clock. Uh, Sark talking about Culture Wednesdays and how that's really helped to bring this team together. Thought it was a really good answer. Also, more on Oklahoma State and their strengths coming into this football game. Winners of seven of their last eight into the title game. Your thoughts, hit us on the text line, 512-447-3776. We'll also continue to give you details on what we're going to be doing on Friday and Saturday up in Arlington to bring you coverage of the big game. Uh, looking forward to that as well. Coming next, though, it's off the record. Stories you maybe haven't heard, but you need to because they're going to be the conversations you're talking about. It took them up with Ian Rodby.
All right, hook him up with Ian Rodby. It's off the record on this uh, 28th of November. Ty uh, Henderson in our Horn headquarters on the banks of 360 there. You say you've been craving uh, fajitas since 7 o'clock this morning. What's up with that? A little, little food crave? I, I could eat about two pounds of beef fajitas right now if given the <laughs> opportunity. All right, well, if you got two pounds of beef fajitas, then that would be a lot at 7 a.m. or 8.50 a.m., which is if you've had that craving this whole time. Any idea where the craving came from? Or you just have you recently had fajitas or just you woke up and maybe dreamed about some fajitas? Uh, there's a there's a new I know my so there's this place called Fajita Pete's. Uh, my mom Ooh. gets it in Dallas all the time. I know they have a few locations in Austin now, but I just saw recently they're opening one in Westlake. So I've been thinking about it. I checked to see if it's open. It's not not open yet, but I might have to Fajita go to Mottie's or something after this. Fajita Pete's. Okay, they're That's really good. Really good. Okay. Um, you know, Vaqueros right down the road has great fajitas from That's where true. you are when the That's show's true. over at eleven o'clock. Um, you know, Lupe Tortilla, but I would take Vaqueros, man. Go with the Vaqueros. Uh, you might even, you know, go say hi to the great folks over there. Uh, they bring you the Vaqueros hotline. All right. Uh, how about this, Ty? There's a there's a poll on Ranker.com. Um, I don't know if you ever attend Ranker. I know you go to the Reddit rabbit holes, which we're going to tell you about here coming up. But they're having a rank of the most hated TV characters of all time. And any guess on who the who the top of the list is? Any guess? Most hated TV character ever. Currently, now this is Ranker.com, so this is a floating ranking. Is this like an old school answer? Or is this a 2000s and on? Okay. Yes, 2000s and on. Actually, three of the top five are from the same show. I feel like The Office for some reason. No, no. Game of Thrones. Joffrey uh, Baratheon, uh, Game yeah. of Thrones. See, I, I watched um, the Game King of Thrones. Joffrey. I never finished it. Never, oh, well, yeah, never really saying. locked in. And number two. Number two on the list is Ramsey Bolton from Game of Thrones. Number five is Cersei Lannister from Game of Thrones. So they did a great job of creating the uh, the villains. Uh, Shout uh, Tucker uh, on the anime Full Alchemist Brotherhood is number three. I don't even know what that is. Uh, the Governor on Waking on Walking Dead. Um, Livia Soprano on the Sopranos. That would be uh, Tony Soprano's mother, of course. Um, also Todd Alquist on Breaking Bad. Ezra Fitz on Pretty Little Liars, and then someone named Ed Pelletier on uh, The Walking Dead. So any of those ring out to you? And if you have a most fa- hated TV character all time, who is it? Do you have one, Ty? Um, I, the only people that stand out on that list are the Game of Thrones people. And like I said, I didn't really buy into that show. Um, so, I mean, if I'm thinking The Office. Ooh, you hate a character on The Office? I think they're all very likable. I, I really don't like Angela. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Angela on The Office. Uh, we'll take yours. Text line 512-447-3776. Also, always a good debate. Uh, this is uh, um, this came from, let me see where we have this. This came from uh, Reddit, as a matter of fact. 25,000 people took a poll on divisive questions. Um, divisive questions. You ready, you ready to play this there, Tom? I'm going to see where you are on this. Okay. Does a straw have one hole or two? A straw has two straw. holes. 61% say one hole. 39% say two. It's a tube. Uh, according to science, one is the answer. Well, according to science. So one hole. Science has it's been wrong tube. before. Cylinder. Uh, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Yes. Ooh, 55% say no. I'm in the no category. I believe it's an action film that happens to be around Christmas. And a Christmas it happens party. on Christmas. I understand that, but it's not a it's not a Christmas movie. Uh, it's based in Christmas, but you know, Christmas movies are about Christmas. This is about uh, terrorism, right? And uh, you know, fighting the fight. Uh, is a hot dog a sandwich, Ty? No. Twenty five thousand people were asked. No, it is not. Eighty one percent agree with you. No, it's meat between bread, but it's not a sandwich. I think Rod and I had this debate pretty recently, and we agreed that it probably is. But uh, I'm good with hot dog. It's in what its is own the best category. day of the week? Uh, best day What's of the that? week. I was saying hot dogs. Best in day own, of the week. Hot dogs in its own category. Best day of the week, though. Best day of the um, week. Saturday. Yes, 46%. Friday was a close second at 37. Monday was voted the worst day, as you might imagine. Uh, which brownie is better, edge piece or middle piece? Like if you're going to get a, t- a plate mm. of brownies and you're cutting them, do you want the edge or do you want the middle? If they're cooked correctly, the edge, but usually I, I, if I'm messing it up, so the middle. I'm okay. going to say the middle. Pineapple on pizza. Divisive question. 25,000 people were asked. Pineapple on pizza. Does it belong? I enjoy the Haoli pizza from Austin's Pizza, so yes. 
Yes, okay. Well, at 50-50, that's an even coin flip, according to folks. Um, <laughs> could Jack have fit on the door at the end of Titanic? 25,000 people were asked. Could Jack have gotten his butt on that door and had, what's her name, uh, you know, move yeah, over a yeah, little bit? Yeah, Ro- Rose needed to move over a little bit, I think. I think. He, yeah, I killed think. the guy. She, He saved her life, and then he killed her, or she killed him. What are you doing? Come on, man. Uh, I can't, still can't believe Jack Dawson got out, didn't get out of that. They, 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 they did it all. Yeah, come on, man. Uh, PlayStation, I wouldn't know the answer to this question, but PlayStation, by the way, 79% agree that they he could have gotten up on that door. PlayStation or Xbox, Ty? Xbox. For life. You're in the 40%. PlayStation got 60. Is cereal soup? No. Yeah, that's not even questionable, cereal right? Sucks. It's cereal. Only 6% said yes. All right, here, this is important, Ty. This could be an age thing. Is it okay to wear socks with sandals? Yes. No. I, no. You've seen me do that many of times. I wear socks no. with flip flops. No, you can't do that. Socks with like Birkenstocks or flip flops and no. Socks no, and slides, no, no. that's definitely a my generation thing. That's why I wore socks and slides in middle school every single day. Nike Elites. <laughs> All right, so you could weigh in on those. Uh, 25,000 people did. That, that, that's, that's an interesting one. Is a straw. Does a straw have one hole or two? Science says one. Ty wears socks with sandals. I, that's not, that, you'll never catch me doing that. That's not my deal. If you're wearing sandals, you're wearing no no socks. What about what about flip flops with jeans? That's fine. Okay, but especially no in Austin. My mom, I mean, she comes in town from Dallas. She thinks socks. that's sloppy. No yeah, socks. No socks. No socks. You no, know, you can't go to a nice event like that. But you know, you're just hanging out, going to whatever the fajita pizza or whatever. That's fine. Uh, by the way, if you're wearing socks with sandals, like the sock gets in the way of the sandal thing between your toes. It's got to be very uncomfortable. All right, we're coming back. I took him up with Ian Rodby talking Texas Oak State. We'll have your thoughts on those questions. Uh, hoping Rodby gets better just as soon as he can get back here. We're coming back two hours to go. I'll hook him up with Ian Rodby.
It is a Tuesday on Hook 'em Up with Ian Rod B. Rod B out today. We're on a fever yesterday, so I said, hey man, get some rest. Get some rest. We know sometimes you get through the holidays, company, people, you just never know. And let's hope he's okay uh, with our Rod B. He'll get back as soon as he can. Uh, we will carry it for him all the way until uh, 11 o'clock this morning. Coming up, bottom of this hour, excited. I just got a note from my buddy Craig Flowers, the retired colonel. Host of the high ground back in the day, hopefully again on the horn in the future. Uh, he's going to join us and talk some uh, culture, talk Texas, Steve Sarkeesian. And interesting, um, you know, he has known the quarterback of Oklahoma State, uh, Alan Bowman, for a long time. Actually worked with him at the Air It Out camp out in West Texas. And he went to Texas Tech. Uh, Craig just mentioned to me that he wrote a, a letter of recommendation for him to get to grad school at Michigan and had a recent conversation with the, with the Oklahoma State quarterback, uh, so we'll get a preview of what that conversation is about, whatever he can share with us. But uh, interesting. And that's, that's, that's the state of college athletics right now. Uh, Alan Bowman was in that aired out camp, went to Texas Tech. You know, they couldn't keep quarterbacks healthy. And then um, you know, got his degree, though, from Texas Tech while he was there. And got, he's got a graduate degree from Michigan. Great school. But he's still playing college football at Oklahoma State in his final year and has a chance to win a Big 12 championship. So we'll talk to, Coach, uh, to, to Colonel Flowers about that conversation. Also, I want to mention his thoughts on how Sark has, uh, has developed the culture at this program. We know that's, that uh, Colonel Flowers specializes in you know, human intelligence and uh, elite team building and those type of things from his military days, and he's carried that into his post-military career. Uh, his thoughts on how Sark is done. What's your Sark talking about, you know, Culture Wednesdays? He was asked about this. I mean, every week Sark gets asked more and more about how he's, you know, gotten in touch with this team and, you know, genuine bonds, you know, player to player and coach to player. Uh, pretty good stuff. I'm assuming Craig Flowers has been a fan of what he's heard from Sark. Um, not the case down at Texas A&M. They're trying to rebuild their culture. Also ask him about the, uh, the, the Jimbo Fisher departure and the Mike Elko hire because I'm pretty certain that Colonel has worked with Mike Elko before behind the scenes. So that's coming up. Bottom of this hour, we'll also have a, a Rod's rant. Uh, Ty and I will fill in for the rant because we got plenty we can rant about. And we, you, you have plenty we, you can rant about. From those questions we asked, Ty, how about this? In the, uh, in the, in the off-the-record segment, uh, we, asked, we asked who is the most hated TV character. Uh, this Coach Cornut says uh, the Kardashians, all of them. Okay, that's pretty good. I like that. And uh, this one says, um, where did that go? J.R. Ewing on Dallas. Jamie Dutton. Did you ever get into Yellowstone, Ty? Yeah, I stopped watching it once it got all, it got a little too soap opery for me. But yes, it the, did. The early but seasons yes, that, were good. Yeah, that's a good one. They they painted J, uh, Jamie Dutton as a, certainly a villain. Uh, good one. So we'll take those the rest of the way. Uh, this says, hey, Ty, come get some fajita tacos from the corner store in Del Valley. They put you, they get you on some real fajitas. There you go, because Ty is craving. This says, fajita pizza in Cedar Park close to Avery Ranch is phenomenal. And several people said that fajita pizza is the bomb, so that's a good thing. Uh, appreciate that. This says, uh, Texas wearing white uniforms as a home team Saturday. Yeah, I've seen that. That that popped today. You see that, Ty, that uh, even though they're going to be the home team for the Big 12 championship game, uh, I, I think because they have the better record that uh, they got to choose, and they're going to go with the Stormtroopers, Stormtrooper whites, mm. which are some of the best uniforms in college football. I love those. Yeah, I don't. I, I feel I have some bad oh, memories with us wearing those, though. Well, why, the last time ones? we played in the Big 12 championship, we wore those. Maybe not. That's true. That was true. And you were were you at that at that game because because your quarterback your your, your, your quarterback in high school was yes. uh, Sam Ellinger and he was the quarterback of that team. I was at that game myself. Did you attend? Yeah, I was actually in a box for that game. Um, Ooh, you know people. And uh, uh, one of my friends. I was in the me. press box it's, for that game. The, the, that... the game's around my birthday, so I uh, he he took me, and uh, I I would never go to a game like a big game like that and sit in a box though. Again, I didn't enjoy the environment. There was some distracting. Like free, was, free booze, Ty. It was free booze, yes, free food, <laughs> but there was. Some, well, it's not free. It's free to you if you're invited in with well, a ticket. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're, well, they're nice enough. Well, one, it was a mixed box, so there was OU and Texas people there, and there were some young Boo. ladies that were around our age that knew nothing about football, and literally asked me what a first down was at one point during the game in a very intense moment, and I was like, "What am I doing?" You know, I, I need to, I need to focus up and stop. Lock in, yeah, and start. Yeah, well, start look at me. My head. It's amazing that this is the only the Longhorns. I mean, this is their seventh all-time trip to this game. They've been six previous times. And remember, there wasn't a Big 12 championship game from 2011 to 2016, but they the Longhorns didn't win the Big 12 in those years. Um, but, you know, this is their sixth trip. They went the first time and won the first one. Uh, of course, 05-09 won it, 
and won a national championship, played for a national championship those years. And in 2018 was was the last trip, and they lost to Kyler Murray. And that was, of course, they had beaten Kyler Murray in, in Oklahoma in the uh, the dicker to kicker game, um, you know, in, in at the Cotton Bowl. And then they turned around and lost to Kyler Murray and the Sooners in that, that Big 12 title game. And if you if you haven't been up in a while, they do, you know, they put on, you know, we're going to be up there. Uh, the horn. I'm going to get you full details, hopefully tomorrow, with with dates and times and places. But I know pretty much where we're going to be on Friday afternoon. I can tell you this: if you joined us on Friday afternoon for the Texas OU game in October, uh, I'll just tease we may be in a very <laughs> an identical place uh, Friday afternoon doing doing the very same thing. So we'll tell you about that coming up. Just got to finalize it, and also on Saturday morning, uh, we're going to be live in Arlington. Uh, at a place called Jay Gilligan's. Jay Gilligan's is right in Arlington, down in the old main main Arlington area. And here's a little note. You can look up Jay Gilligan's online. They've got food and drinks, and they'll be open by 7.30. We'll be broadcasting live that morning uh, with our live coverage. We'll also have some crew here in Austin broadcasting live, but we will be live. And uh, Jay Gilligan's shuttles to the stadium. Uh, you know, the, the owner there, Randy, I was talking to him yesterday. He said they expect to shuttle, you know, five, six, seven hundred people from that that spot over to the stadium and then back. So you can grab some breakfast, grab a drink, get, you know, get in the shuttle and then come back and there's your car. Right. So, uh, you know, Jay Gilligan's in Arlington is where it will be on Saturday morning. But they do do a pretty good job, Ty, if memory serves of, you know, they, they it's a big 12 title game. So there's a lot of things interactively going on around the stadium. If you're going up there to tailgate, they do have some things going on. It's not Bebo Boulevard, but they do have activations and things happening around the game. It's a it's a championship game, and I there, there's a concert at halftime, is there not? Isn't it like uh, who's the who's the I can't remember who they announced. Ooh, it's a, the, it's uh, a rapper. Yeah, I forget. Like, like Brett Yormark, the Big Twelve commissioner, who you know is, is going to hate the moment when he's got to hand the Big Twelve championship trophy to Steve Sarkeesian and the Longhorns if they can win this game Saturday because it's their final game as a member of the Big Twelve. Uh, but you know they 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 you know you know Brett Yormark coming from Rock Nation and his mind and for marketing, there will be a lot going on. Uh, this is a and it's the Longhorns' you know, last game in the Big Twelve. Pretty cool. So uh, and so if you you have if you have any knowledge of what's going on, I will be digging into that this week. But I will also tell you that you can join us Friday afternoon. It's going to be in downtown Dallas, and you can also join us on Saturday morning in downtown Arlington at Jay Gilligan. So uh, we'll get you full details on that coming up as the week goes on. We're also obviously waiting on Rod's status, Rod Babers, and how he's going to feel and what part of he can be of our of our coverage live and uh, getting you ready for the Big 12 championship game. Uh, also, top headlines. How about this, Ty? Did you uh, see that uh, Jerry Jones Jerry Jones was on uh, doing his weekly radio hit with the fan this morning? and mentioned that he's going to lunch today with Darius Shaq Leonard. Shaq Leonard, the linebacker, uh, released in a cap casualty in a new coaching staff situation in Indianapolis. Uh, but going to lunch with him, sounds like there could be a deal done for the Cowboys to land uh, a big-time linebacker. I've seen him uh, as a Texans fan. You face the Colts twice a year. Darius Leonard, I call him Darius because that's what they called him in the beginning. Now he's Shaq. But Shaq Leonard's a really good player. And see if he wants to be a Dallas Cowboy. You know, well, Jerry said openly, we're, we're going to lunch. And he said, that he, here's what he said. He said, he's been an outstanding player. We want to check on his health. That's what we've been doing right now. This isn't a hard scouting job. We have a pretty attractive situation for any player. So uh, that pretty much sounds like lunch today. Does if the medicals check out, the Cowboys could be adding a, a, you know, a linebacker in a place they need, right? They lost to Marvion Overshone back in training camp. He was going to be a piece to this Dan Quinn defense, and then Leighton Van Der Esch is out for the year. So this, this could uh, be an opportunity for, for the Cowboys if something drops right in their lap. It doesn't really sound like uh, he likes his guys right now. Likes his guys, who? You know, that's what he always says. I like my, we like our guys. We like our guys. Well, and if you can add another guy, who I mean, Darius, Shaq Leonard can play. I mean, yeah, he can but, play. He's got but, speed. There's a reason. I mean, he's not coming in to be a star player. Are you, uh, the reason he was the really, player that you that that he was three years ago. Yeah, but you're not. I mean, the, the reason that the Colts tr- cut him loose is, uh, but from what everything I've read in Indianapolis is, you know, it's a new head coaching staff uh, and a new defense, and maybe he's not doesn't fit the scheme, but he fits what Dan Quinn does. Um, this guy's a three-time All-Pro. I mean, this guy's a really good player, and he's still got some time. You're not, but you're not signing him for a lot of money. That's the whole thing, right? I mean, the the reason the the Colts decided, you know, we're moving on is, you know, he he's going to save him sixteen or seventeen million dollars in cap space this upcoming offseason. That was the reason the move was made. Uh, like, I think it's, I, I I mean, having seen the guy play a lot, I think it's a really good move for the Cowboys if they pull this off today. Yeah, no, but I mean. it's going to be about the medicals. Be about the medicals. Nelly, Nelly is the halftime act, by the way. Mm. Nelly is the halftime act. Uh, somebody said that uh, the worst TV characters, Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift, yes. in their NFL relationship. Nice job. Every person on The View 
is the worst TV character. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Uh, and now that I'm doing the show from the uh, home studio in Onion Creek, Texas, I, sometimes I leave it on because in the morning, Ty, when I get up and start uh, preparing, I watch like the local news, like the daybreak thing. And sometimes it stay. I, I don't change it, and it stays on there. And all of a sudden, we're watching the View. Rod and I. It's like, I've, oh man, I've accidentally watched the View before. It's um, it's that, ir- would, that would be, that would have to be that would have to be how it happens, right? You you accidentally have to watch it because I don't think you would choose to watch that show. What's that? that what's that opinion. show's demographic? Obviously, oh, women. Women. What, women. Yes. What what age bracket? Oh well, I think that's why they have you know. Females of every age group, right? Well, They're trying to attract all of them. I can tell you, there's, the no, there's up... no women my age that are watching the View. I can promise you that. That's probably true. But yes, I, mean, I would guess 40 to 75 would be their <laughs> wheelhouse. Maybe 35 to 75. Look, these are people that wake up and watch Good Morning America, right? I mean, that's kind of how that works. You watch Good Morning America, then you will leave it on the View, and then here comes whatever the soap operas are on. These are people that are home watching TV in the morning. You drink one. We're up. We're, you know, they might be day drinkers. They might gla- gla- grab a, ga- a glass of Chardonnay by, by midday. That, nothing wrong with that, right? If you're, what are you doing? I don't know. Well, taking care of kids and those kind of things. But, uh, yeah, I don't know who watches The View. But we know who their target demo is. Hey, uh, can we get to Rod's rant of the day? We're going to talk to Craig Flowers, bottom of the hour. Should be some good stuff there revealed with the, uh, the retired colonel. Uh, good to hear his voice as well. But let's get to uh, Rod's rant of the day, even without Rod. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Find out what happens when people stop being polite and start getting real. You ain't keeping it real. My God, okay, it's happening. Everybody stay calm. Oh, oh you've done it now. It's time for Rod's Rant of the Day. Hold on to your butts. All right, so Rod does deep dive rants. Uh, I've got several little rants, and we're going to let you get one off your chest or two, Ty, if you've got them. Uh, you know, I'm going to rant on this a couple times again. Uh, uh, the Monday Night Football game last night was absolutely atrocious and unwatchable. The only thing wrong with saying that, I mean, that's just an opinion, an observation of a 12-10 to 10 Bears victory in Minnesota in which the, the third-string quarterback Josh Dobbs threw four interceptions and the Bears won a game without scoring a touchdown. Um, pretty pretty much unwatchable. And another primetime under tie. So hopefully you're taking our advice and making a little bit of money on the side with your cousin taking these primetime unders because you're way up if you are. Uh, but shame on the NFL. I mean, they, they, they knew that game was on the schedule. Last offseason, they created a rule and voted on a rule and, and passed a rule uh, with their TV partners and the teams that allow them to flex Monday night football games that are not attractive matchups uh, for a better game Starting week 12. And guess what? Thanksgiving week was week 12. Uh, they could have flexed that game, any number of games. The Bills game with the, uh, the the Philadelphia Eagles on Sunday afternoon. I mean, Rod and I obviously argued for the Jacksonville-Houston game, which was a battle for the first place in the AFC, North, or AFC South, and it was a great football game. Trevor Lawrence had a great game. C.J. Stroud battled and brought him back, and they you know missed a field goal that cr- banged off the crass bar on the final drive that would have sent it to overtime potentially. That's a hell of a game. Ty, rant, man. Are you kidding me? Why didn't they change this? Why didn't they give us a better game? Because last night there was it was an unwatchable football game for Minneapolis. Um, maybe the Josh Dobbs storyline. Oh, that can't, that can't be the answer. I, it can't be. Give me the give me the CJ Stroud storyline. Give me the uh, Trevor no, Lawrence. How many Texans I mean, the first, fans are there though? We're being real. Well, how many Josh Dobbs fans are there? Good night. Maybe they. Well, I mean, how many primetime games does Minnesota have this year? Maybe that was there. Dude, the one thing I do watch on these TVs in the morning, because Rod always chides me and rants about the fact that I put in my – because on my direct TV package, I've got a six-screen sports mix they have uh, where I can watch ESPN. I've got uh, six different things going on my big screen. Uh, Listen, they talk about C.J. Stroud a lot these days. We know the Cowboys are always on the shows with Stephen A. Smith, and they all have their show, and they they talk about topics. Dak Prescott is obviously in the Cowboys. It's always a topic. But C.J. Stroud is becoming more and more a conversation. Is he in the MVP race? And he's the best rookie quarterback since who? Those kind of things. There was that was a compelling storyline, and I, I, you know, it's okay. Give me the Bills game. You know, give me the Bills Eagles game. And I know that was the 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 big marquee late afternoon game, but that, maybe that's why they can't do it. They, you know, Fox would have pitched a fit if they tried to take that game from him because it was a hell of a game middle of the afternoon on Sunday. But 
Um, you know, again, the Jack, to me, you call me a Texans homer. Uh, the game built, lived up to the billing. It was a tremendous football game. Uh, it was exciting. It was, uh, it was really good. Compare that to last night. And the problem is you made a rule to prevent that, and then the first week you were able to use the rule, you didn't do it. Uh, I really don't understand that uh, NFL TV logic, but uh, Ty disagrees. Ty, do you have a rant for me? What, what's your rant this morning? I do. Um, let me talk a little Dak Prescott. Um, so the news came out yesterday that he is um, with child, or his girlfriend is. Donald True? He's with child. He's having a baby. Oh, Dak Prescott. Mm-hmm. He's, he's having okay. a little girl. So he came out and said that he's been playing so well in the Cowboys 5-1 stretch where he's averaging 312 yards per game, completing over 70% of his passes, has 18 touchdown passes and only two interceptions. He says uh, it's, it's his dad's strength that's putting him over the top Ooh. right now. It's his big deck energy, you know, yeah. that he's, he's put to good use. I like that. Which is now something that child. I, I, I have straight up betted on, on, on or place bets because people have just had babies. Uh, we saw the Fred <laughs> Fred Van Vliet when the when the uh, Toronto Raptors won the uh, NBA championship. He had uh, a child just before the playoffs started, and he went on a career run and kind of you know pushed that team along with Kawhi, Kawhi Leonard through uh, the playoffs. So I don't know. Maybe I'm so see- I'm buying back into Dak Prescott now that I've heard this news. I, I did not I was okay, not aware yeah. that there was. He's known for a few weeks, obviously, but it, they've kept it quiet. So now that it's public knowledge, we could should see some betting lines uh, move here. What do we what do we know about his girlfriend? Do we know who she is? I mean, she's she's very attractive, obviously, and they she put a picture out on Instagram that's that's a it's she's a sexy very picture pregnant. for sure. She's very pregnant, so this thing you know it's her and you, you know, it's, it's 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 tasteful, but it's revealing and uh, it's one of those you know nice Instagram photos. I'm assuming. Do we know who she, who this this lady is? Um, no, I'm any clue? Uh, oh, Sarah Jane Ramos. Okay, it's expecting right, well, the baby girl in March, early March. Baby girl March, so she's kind of halfway there. Okay, well, good for Dak. And look, I've said, and this is not uh, breaking news, but the Dak Prescott and his role run for a, for a, for an MVP. You know, his conversation about that it, it it starts Thursday night because no one's paying attention to the Cowboys. I mean, everybody pays attention, but but in big picture, where they stack, no one's talking about the Cowboys because they're mopping up on bad teams. And both times we've seen them play a good team, they've lost. Um, and we saw them in, in, in prime time against, you know, the marquee game against San Francisco, and they got smoked. Then a couple of weeks ago, they played the Eagles and you know, lost a game they had no business losing, but that leads to the narrative of they're, they're still not able to beat good teams and finish good teams, where the Eagles, the Cowboys outplayed the Eagles, but the Eagles still won the game, and that's Jalen Hurts being a winner. Uh, the Bill, Buffalo Bills can say the exact same thing in their game last week. They outplayed the Eagles and then lost the game in overtime because that, that Philadelphia team's got a resiliency to it and a and a toughness that I think is built from their quarterback. But this is the, the Cowboys' opportunity, whether, you know, Dak with child is – and the big Dak energy is coming, that's great. But you got to prove it against good teams. And this week on Thursday, um, we just talked about the bad primetime game last night. Uh, you get a good one. This was uh, – this this Thursday night Amazon prime game is the Cowboys hosting the uh, uh, Seattle Seahawks. In Seattle, we just saw them get throttled by the 49ers on, on the, the, the last game of Thursday – uh, after the Cowboys had throttled the Washington Commanders. So both teams played Turkey Day. Cowboys won easily. Seahawks got dis- dis- manhandled by the really good 49ers. But this is the first of that five-game stretch Rod and I have talked about a lot. You play this game, then you have extra time. If you can beat the, the Seahawks, whether you sign Shaq Leonard or not, I don't know. But if you can beat the Seahawks on Thursday night on your home field, you then have 10 days to get ready and you know, get healthy as possible for Philadelphia in your return engagement with the Eagles. And that'll be obviously another primetime game. Uh, everybody will watch, just like they'll watch Thursday night. And, you know, Cowboys beat the, the Seahawks, and he outplays Geno, you know, Dak outplays Geno Smith and keeps playing like he is. You know, that conversation is going to be had about Dak and the MVP. And then you get a head-to-head matchup with uh, – think about that, Ty. Uh, from, you go from Geno Smith head-to-head, Pete Carroll, you know, typically a well-coached team, but Cowboys are more talented. Then you get the Eagles uh, and everything that comes with that. Uh, and, and Nick Sirianni, the, the most punchable face in football. And then you turn around and you go to Buffalo and you go to Miami in back-to-back weekends. So you're facing Josh Allen, uh, a team much, you know, the 6-6 six and six team that feels like they're better than that, but that's what they are. And then the Miami Dolphins uh, on Christmas Eve on a Saturday uh, against Tua. And then you wrap up that five-game stretch with the Detroit Lions in a home game in which they'll put Jimmy Johnson into the ring of honor. And that's your five-game stretch. So over the next five, you're facing some of the best quarterbacks and some of the best coaches 
in pro football, this is the opportunity to make your statement, right? I mean, what are they going to be? And, and I'm pretty sure to, to say, Ty, that you know, your, your investment in the Cowboys and how much you're buying them will, will change quite a bit here in the next month, either good or bad. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I think three of those four games you mentioned will be, will be wins. I, I think the, either the Bills or the Dolphins game could go the other way, but I think they get the Eagles at home. I, I, yeah, any they any time they're playing at home, if they can somehow, if the Eagles can start dropping a few, that game uh, on Sunday Sunday was huge for the Cowboys. If the, the Bills could have won that game, I, I, they need home field advantage going into the playoffs. I think I, th- I think the Cowboys probably have the number one home field advantage in the NFL right now. Think so? All right, well, that's interesting. I mean, I like the look uh, of the statistics of it. Philadelphia is pretty tough to beat there. I mean, yeah, I, true. I, I, but I do agree. I mean, you, you'd much rather be playing San Francisco or Philadelphia in your building, right? I, it's not, it's not so much about, like, the actual crowd like helping uh, obviously it does in in both situations but I, I i think just dallas plays so much better at home yeah just they play fast they play fast on defense it's loud more comfortable and look i mean if you if you don't like the cowboys and, and they play well these next two games seattle and philadelphia you can ready be ready for the national because because if they win this game thursday night they'll be nine and three if they beat the eagles in prime time a week later rod uh ty they're going to be you know 10 and three with a win over the Eagles, if they're able to win that game, and then they'll just be one game back of Philadelphia at that point in the division, the the, the Dallas Cowboys hype train is going to take off into December. You can expect that, right? Now, if they lose, then the same narrative we talk about. They can't be good teams will continue. If they win a couple of these games, look out, uh, because uh, there's nothing like the, the media and the national narrative when the Cowboys are good and people start pushing that uh, that conversation. And that Cowboys have a chance to put themselves. And if they do, uh, things we've talked about, like Dak Prescott should be in the MVP race. Uh, Deron Bland should be the leader for Defensive Player of the Year with six you know, re- interception returns for touchdowns. Those things will, will je- for, for sure pick up momentum. C.D. Lamb, as the guy you're talking about, is one of the best receivers in the league, the way he's playing. But you have to go do it in these big marquee games. No one's really paying attention uh, to what they've done to these bad teams. And can I give you this number, Ty? Here is the number that the Cowboys have to deal with. Uh, in their eight wins, the Cowboys, the, the eight wins have come against teams who are 25 and 52, okay? 25 and 52, and they've outscored those eight teams by 199 points. So, again, those teams are 27 games under 500. So that's who they're beating. There are two losses um, to teams over 500 or by minus 37 points. So the next three weeks or five weeks they're playing – Six and five Seattle, six and five, uh, six and six Buffalo, nine and one Philadelphia, seven and three Miami, eight and three Detroit. So that's the task, you know. Go get it, Dallas Cowboys, uh, and that'll be Rod's rant uh, with the Dallas Cowboys. A little bit in there. Hey Ty, by the way, a little, little quick rant. Then we'll talk to Craig Flowers at the bottom of the hour. Are, are, were you surprised to hear that the Lake Travis uh, Westlake game this week, the Battle of the Lakes, uh, for a, for a, a trip to, to move forward in the state playoffs, is being played in Pflugerville? Was that a good choice? What uh, what's your rant on that? Uh, I mean, it'll be sold out. That's for sure. I, I'd rather play. I'd rather play at a stadium. I, I've never been can, to that stadium, so I don't know. I've never been at that stadium. I'd rather play somewhere where you can have it completely packed, opposed to going to DKR and just having like okay. the bottom. You know, it's the it's it's uh, even even when it's we one played of those new stadiums. I'm, even when we played but, at like NRG be. and those bigger stadiums, college stadiums, I I I didn't like it because it just it kind of took the high school vibe out of it. I'd, I'd rather the state championship be at Waco ISD Stadium and have that <laughs> have that thing packed to the you. brim because it'd be outside. Logistically, cool. obviously, it doesn't work, but I I, I think that's cool. No, oh, I, I I think you're right about that. But no, that's a good rant right there. You'd rather have it be at a packed high school stadium versus a, a you know, even there's 40,000 people at DKR, it's, you know, a fourth empty at that point, or two-thirds empty. All right, we'll come back when we do. Craig Flowers, the um, uh, the retired colonel, will weigh in. He had a recent conversation with Alan Bowman, his thoughts on the Aggie situation, and Steve Sarkeesian and his culture building. We'll talk to all things with our, our man, Colonel Craig Flowers. Coming back on Hook'em Up with Ian Rodby.
Aaron Hogan, Rod Babers. Hook them up. 1019 AM 1260. The Horn. Yeah, took them up with no Rod Babers today. Rod under the weather. Hope he can get back here tomorrow or later in the week. We'll man the ship until he does. Coming up uh, for the top of the hour, a little round of who said that tie and I'll play. Always fun. Some good audio from around the sports world. Also, the fabulous fifth hour. If you missed our conversation with uh, Ari Temkin, uh, Sirius XM's Big 12 radio, he had a really good conversation with us in our, in our first hour talking about uh, his assessment of Texas and Oklahoma State. And let's remember, uh, Ari will remind you, he picked big. He picked Oklahoma State, Ari did, uh, to win the Big 12 championship way back at, at Big 12 media days and into the season. And as we talked about, uh, he – he has a chance to be a prophet here because not a lot of people were picking Oklahoma State. Uh, they've got uh, Ollie Gordon and Mike Gundy doing one of his best coaching jobs to turn around a 2-2 two and two start into a 7-1 and one finish. And here they are playing for the Big 12 title. So you're from Ari. Ari, of course, host, host of uh, Big 12 Radio on Sirius XM, so covering the conference uh, wall-to-wall. So we'll get his thoughts. Also, if you missed it, Jerry Hamilton, our uh, Longhorn Insider with uh, Inside Texas, uh, all things Texas and Oklahoma State with, with the G-Man uh, coming your way in, in our next hour. But uh, right now, can we go to the Vaqueros Hotline, very familiar voice and p- person to these airways. Uh, the high ground, of course, a staple of our Saturday morning lineup back in the day. Hopefully we'll be again soon. Uh, he is the, uh, the retired colonel, our man uh, Jay Craig Flowers. Hello, Jay Craig. How are you, my friend? <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, doing well. It's uh, it's great to be back on these airways in the capital city of the great state. Yeah, man. I can't wait to maybe hope, hope to revive that show at some point into the new year. That would be uh, no tease there, but that would be fun to be able to do. You bet. Uh, how are you? Can I say one thing? Can I, uh, since I talked to you last, I have had my, uh, and this is not a commercial, but we both had our teeth restored by our brand, Dr. Greg Eckert. And when you did it, uh, yeah. I said, you know what? I'm going to do that. I need to do that. Can I just say thanks to Dr. Eckert? Thanks to you for taking the leap. And now I'm, I'm 50, about to be 51 and have the, the teeth restoration. And you told me how much I'd love it. And thanks for, thanks for the, the sage advice, my friend. You know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I thought about that this morning when you texted me asking me to come on at the, the bottom of the 9 o'clock hour. And, you know, I, I sent Greg Eckert, uh, Dr. Eckert, a, a text uh, a couple of weeks ago because – you know, it, it, it really changes lives. It's, you know, I'm, I get to speak a lot, and, and I wanted him to read the text out loud to his entire team. He, he is as advertised, and uh, as you experienced, it's a life-changing deal, and uh, he is just the, the best in the care and uh, just a remarkable, a remarkable man and uh, so grateful to have met him. Yeah, you do a lot of public speaking. I obviously do a lot of public speaking and videos and those kind of things. And it's just amazing. It really does uh, change your, your your want to smile and uh, how you feel confident yeah. about that smile. And it really does change. And uh, so you're still doing the uh, the public speaking and uh, leadership training and those type of things. Um, now, let me ask you this. You mentioned, and I'll let you tell the story, but you had a, a good conversation with the Oklahoma State quarterback, Alan Bowman, recently. And I'll tell folks that you knew him from the Arid Out camps out there in uh, – um, you know, West Texas that you've been such a part of for such a long time with lifetime Longhorn David Thomas and Coach Wardis. And so you've known this young guy since he's a you know high school high school player, and now he is you know 23 years old. What was your what's your memory? What, what, give me your thoughts on Alan Bowman. Then what was your conversation with him about? A completely different man than uh, the, the young boy that uh, grew up in the air it out experience, along with Cody Hodges, who led the nation in passing for Texas Tech. Alan Bowman known him since the eighth grade. Um, he's six foot four, two hundred and five pounds, something like that, out of Grapevine, Texas, and uh, was he's a very different young man today than he was when he became famous for the horns down in the end zone. When he was playing for uh, Lubbock, and of course, all roads lead through Lubbock. But he is a uh, a very different cat now, and he manages the game very differently. He'll be twenty four in March. Uh, he called me last week out of nowhere, just sitting there. I'm, I'm in a in a men's grill at a country club, going to play some golf, and there's Alan Bowman calling. He's he now has different what I call in a there's a great book called Mindset. His seeing skills are very different, and let me give you a couple examples. If you watch the Oklahoma State game uh, last uh, weekend against uh, BYU, uh, his receivers and his running back made at least three mental errors, perhaps four. And back in, when he was an 18, 19 year old, uh, he would have behaved very differently after those mistakes that were not his fault. Uh, but 
he has matured to the point now where he recognizes that uh, blaming and complaining or defending just doesn't matter. Uh, that gets to the culture of the individual. And when he called me last week, uh, you know, he was pretty chatty about uh, how excited, in fact, that his mindset is completely different than it was several years ago. Uh, you'll see a, a guy that's very poised that, that, you know, the cliche is the game has slowed down, but really his seeing skills have sped up, which is going to be important when you, when you see what, you know, what, what Baron Morton went through last week against the Longhorns, because um, in many ways, y- your eyes better speed up against this Longhorn defensive front because they come at you quick, like, like nobody I've ever seen uh, this year, but Alan Bowman is a different leader on that team and he went through some some spring training where he wasn't taking the the, the reps with the number one. Uh, Coach Gundy, you know, had an idea that perhaps uh, Bowman would not be the starter. Uh, it was clear to me and many others that uh, he was going to be to include the locker room. And now he's become uh, the, the number one. And I think you're going to see a very different quarterback that you saw just a few years ago when he you know, famously sat in the end zone, having uh, been the been on the back end of a, of a great comeback by uh, the, the Texas Longhorns in Lubbock. He's, he's just a different cat. So when you see him fail, he won't get frustrated. It's similar to, you know, what I heard Sark, Sark talk about uh, in body language and behavior, which gets to, you know, probably something else you want to talk about is culture. But I'm, I'm proud of Alan Bowman, what he's become as a young man. Uh, we'll see if he has enough in the tank to even make it a close game. Longhorns favored 13 and a half, I believe. Yeah. Hey, uh, Craig, that's great stuff. And now, now uh, Alan Bowman has a graduate degree from Michigan where he transferred and now he's playing. And, yeah. you know, I think we all can remember how we were when we were 18 versus 23 or 24 years old. Uh, and to, to have all that experience, you can't coach it, you can't teach it, but then perspective. And you have always been great teaching me and our audience about uh, leadership and you know, I think, you know, Longhorn fans are now hearing Steve Sarkeesian speak on culture uh, and how he's, you know, you know, he and his team have been you know, very deliberate about how they build their culture. He talked yesterday about Culture Wednesdays and, and sharing and being open. And, you know, when they do have Culture Wednesdays, he's always made a point to be the first to speak uh, when they do that and do culture exercises and the first one to be vulnerable and say something that uh, maybe you wouldn't expect your head coach to say. Uh, and that's been deliberate and intentional by him. Uh, you know, Longhorn fan, we always, the text line fires up. And people love hearing from Sark talking about those things. Uh, and you can compare that to what we're seeing down at Texas A&M with Jimbo Fisher. We certainly saw it at Texas before with Tom Herman. You know, it seems like those two guys, you know, did everything wrong when it came to culture. It does feel like, in addition to adding good players and developing good players, that Steve Sarkeesian is doing a real good job when it comes to, to developing the culture and the character and looking for character and making sure that matters. Well, Ryan Holiday, a great Texan, wrote a book called Ego is the Enemy, one of the ones that I recommend. And whenever I'm asked if I would consider working with a coach, uh, even in the SEC, one of the things that I mention is, okay, I need to spend at least an hour alone with that head coach to determine if this is somebody that that, uh, is humble enough and willing to grow uh, and I don't care what age he is, and that's what you see, you know, out of Alabama uh, with with Nick. He's he's always learning, and there are some coaches who just refuse because of their ego um, and because of a lack of willingness to be vulnerable. Because quite frankly, they're they're afraid to being discovered, perhaps as a fraud, and that's just the truth. And there are coaches where I've just said, no, I'm I'm sorry, I. I'm not going to be able to work with that particular coach. And you're familiar with a couple of them. So uh, what I've enjoyed watching about, you know, Sark is, is he does start with himself. And what we know about great culture is that members of the team, uh, they have extraordinary situational awareness, self-awareness, and then they take an action. And that action may be um, the first to to raise their hand and accept responsibility, even if they had nothing to do with the issue that occurred. And then when there is success, they're the first to deflect credit. And you often hear them speaking about we, us, and our, as opposed to I, me, and, and my. And 
Um, you see that. I've seen that develop now over the last uh, 18 months uh, with the Longhorn program. And, and that takes a lot of patience, a lot of discipline. And, you know, that they'll ask, wow, how does that guy do that? And then the answer often is, I don't know, but he's out here every day. So you've got to, if you want 225 pounds of character to show up as part of your culture, you've actually got to rep it. And there are many programs that use Wednesday. I don't know why Wednesday is such a popular day of the week, but there are a lot of programs, not just in football, but I know a D1 baseball program that uses Wednesday as well as their character rep day and they're practicing behavior they're practicing being vulnerable and accepting responsibility and the, of course that starts at the top and the, the biggest threat to that is an ego uh, ego is the enemy and uh, yeah you got to rep it and then uh, as you heard sark say that the natural transition is then as that uh, culture starts to build it's the players who start to police the players and the players police the locker room because it's been um, you know, it's been shown to them because Sark's willing to do it. His coaching staff is willing to do it and take take blame and take acceptance, and that's the important part. And then uh, the players just uh, – that's that's the culture. And I thought Sark said it well a couple of weeks ago when we talked about it's not a sign on the wall. It's not a T-shirt you wear. It's, it's as you said, it's, it's every day. It's just how you operate. Now, let me ask you this. So for our Aggie fans out there, uh, Jimbo Fisher clearly had lost control of that team. And, you know, there's a lot of reporting. He was chasing stars and chasing five stars and not really – at all coaching uh, character and coaching rep and didn't care uh, who he brought into his locker room. What do you know about Mike Elko? I know you've worked uh, in the past with the A&M athletic department in a lot of different vari- and phases, but do you know Mike Elko and what do you think about him? Big picture is uh, taking over that program. I, I do not know Mike Elko, but I have watched him from afar uh, with what he did at Duke. I think he learned a great deal uh, while he was at, a&M, and I think he became very humble and vulnerable, sometimes uh, as a result of a negative experience under some toxic leadership. And, you know, I think that when you reflect back on what Sark has gone through his entire life, sometimes it takes a significant emotional event to, for one to discover, you know, exactly who they are and how they want to build programs and behave themselves. So I think they've got a, a, a good guy there in, in Mike Elko, and I think that they are going to recruit talent and character. But if you only recruit talent, you, you may win one or two seasons, uh, and you may get another great job offer. But if you only recruit talent, eventually uh, you end up being fired for behavior because the toxicity has a tendency of attracting more toxicity, and it just starts to build just the opposite of what of what Sark has done. And the Longhorns got to be careful here with all this high excitement in the yard sale, also known as the portal, in that they are careful of who they bring in uh, to this culture that they've been so intentional about building. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, ideally you want five-star talent with five-star character. That's rare. That doesn't occur, especially with 18 to 24-year-olds that are still developing their prefrontal cortex but um, you've got to look for it, and if you look for it and you commit to it, uh, it ends up attracting uh, even more high-character guys, and eventually th- this thing starts uh, rolling in a way that everyone wants to come to your program, not just because it's a winning program, but because it's developing young men of character who win in life and also on Saturdays. Remember the three questions that the most elite teams on the planet ask when they are recruiting are can they do it are they tactically skilled enough will they do it do they have the discipline and the final question and you got to get a yes to all three of these to be selected is will others do it with them Uh, and so many times particularly in the sec where it just costs more um, that third question is a is a no but we don't care will others do it with them no but we don't care because he's a five-star athlete. And then once you do that, you perhaps have introduced toxicity into a, a culture that you're trying to cultivate. So big challenge out there in the next coming weeks, but nothing more challenging than the game ahead. And uh, Alan Bowman's a different quarterback than they faced in Lubbock a few years ago. There you go. That's why we love talking to Craig Flowers. Got a nice Texas man. I didn't realize how much I missed listening to Colonel Flowers on Saturday mornings. Uh, We do too. Thank you, Craig. The difference between toxic leadership and uh, genuine 
leadership, and I think it's something we can all borrow in our day-to-day lives and our jobs and our, our families. Uh, do you want to be a toxic leader? Do you want to be a genuine leader? It's a question we can all ask. And as you said, there are books out there. There are um, you know, investments you can make if you want to learn more about that. Uh, there certainly are, are plenty of options to become a more genuine leader. Just because you aren't right now, uh, Colonel, in whatever phase of life you're in doesn't mean you can't become one. Oh, leadership is, is, is developed. People may be, you know, we're born with a personality. Uh, that's why we chose the pet that we have. Oh, he's got a great personality. We didn't choose the pet. The pet chose us. Well, if you don't, if you don't train and develop that personality and develop leadership skills and behavior skills, you're going to have a, a dog with a great personality that craps all over the house. So you've got to <laughs> actually train uh, leadership and character if you want it to show up. If you don't care about it, you just want to throw a bunch of talent out there and see what happens. Well, don't be surprised if when you need character the most, it doesn't show up because you haven't you haven't trained it. Uh, next week, I uh, know you'll. You'll want to cover this. Uh, it is the final football game of the regular season, and that's the 124th Army-Navy game in this year in Massachusetts. Awesome. Uh, well, we'll certainly bring you back next week to preview that because it's always a, a different conversation. I did see the uniforms, the uh, the cadets of the Army team will be wearing. They're pretty cool, <laughs> really cool unis. Uh, they always come up with something special. Uh, something special there. Thank you, Craig. Appreciate it, my friend. Uh, relaying the conversation with Alan Bowman, who the Longhorns will face on Saturday. Uh, leadership talk from the College Station and here in Austin. Thank you, my friend. Good to hear you. We'll see you on the high ground. There it is, Craig Flowers. Coming back, uh, we will play some Who Said That. Also, top of next hour, we'll play. I'll play the cut that uh, Sark talked about yesterday, the Culture Wednesdays, and um, you know, more insight on, on how Sark has been, as he said, intentional and deliberate with how they build their culture. And it's an important point that Craig Flowers just made. You know, when you're going into the transfer portal, you don't want to be bringing in people. They may be talented, but they got to fit what culture you've built because those are the guys that come in and ruin it and take it a totally different direction. Uh, we'll talk about that. And Sark, I think, has been clear that we, we're going to be looking for that, not just talent, but people who fit what we built here. We'll come back, hit that. Plus, who said that? And as we said, Jerry Hamilton and Ari Temkin next hour. Let's hook them up with Ian Rodby.
Appreciate Craig Flowers. I think in the uh, fabulous fifth hour to come, you'll appreciate uh, hearing from Ari Temkin of Sirius XM's Big 12 Radio, his assessment of this game. And, of course, he picked uh, Oklahoma State to win the Big 12 championship, one of the few I ever heard, picking Mike Gundy's team way back before the season started. They've got a chance to win it. Texas, of course, a two-touchdown favorite in this game. You just heard Craig Flowers talking about their their quarterback, a mature player the Longhorns will face, also Ollie Gordon. Also next hour, Jerry Hamilton uh, will join us. G uh, from Inside Texas, their senior national recruiting analyst, how uh, the Longhorns recruiting efforts are going and the portal opening it up. His thoughts on this Texas game, really good stuff. Uh, but also on the horn uh, every afternoon in a round of who said that, I think you will know this voice, hopefully you're listening every afternoon. Who said this with Rod Babers and uh, Ty and myself? Who is, who is this there, T.Y.? Frank Reich, who does not deserve the fate that he has now suffered in back-to-back seasons to become the first coach in the Super Bowl era since the merger to be fired in the middle of a season in back-to-back seasons. This man does not deserve having that on his resume. He was hired to go to Carolina and hook himself up to, at the time, you know, a future quarterback that nobody knew the name of, to try and take a team that had just missed the playoffs last year, despite bouncing their head coach in the middle of the season last year in Matt Rule. Now they have the same number of losses through 11 games that they had in 17 games last year. And the the numbers are not pretty. They are not pretty, especially since this team went all in to go get Frank Reich, in their mind, the best quarterback in last year's draft in Bryce Young out of Alabama. So it ain't pretty, but it usually is not going to be framed and placed in the Louvre in your first year as head coach in the NFL, especially when you go get the guy in the draft and he may not be ready to win in the league because more often than not, they are not. Usually there's going to be a lot of hiccups, especially when in acquiring the rights to draft the quarterback you want. You trade away your best playmaker on offense to catch the ball (laughs) from him. Right. Yeah. (laughs) And if you're the owner who said There we go. Who said it there, Ty? You know who that is, right? Rich Eisen. Yeah, Rich Eisen every afternoon here on the Horn after Jim Rome. And there you go. I mean, that's what I said in the rant earlier. I mean, uh, uh, whatever you think of Frank Reich, the owner is, is an idiot here. Uh, he's a billionaire, so it's his team. He can do what he wants, but um, ridiculous. You know, he's proven to be an impulsive decision maker, the owner, which typically doesn't work very good. You, you targeted this coach. I mean, he was one of the first hires last year when the cycle began because people felt like he got a bad, a raw deal in uh, in Indianapolis when you know their crazy owner per se hired Saturday out of the ESPN booth. Come coach his team. I mean, we're making these decisions, and then by all accounts. You hire this guy, Frank Reich, and he wanted C.J. Stroud. You, as the owner, decided you wanted Bryce Young because you know more about football than your football coach. And C.J. Stroud's playing to an MVP level right now, certainly rookie of the year, and looks great. Bryce Young's struggling, and you're going to fire the coach? I blame yourself. Listen to what what, uh, Colonel Flowers just said. Look inward. Uh, Don't make another rash decision. Uh, Stick with the coach you hired. You hired him for a reason, and then, you know, I mean, I, I just that. It's your money. Do what you want with it. But uh, don't expect the Carolina Panthers to be any good anytime soon. In addition to trading D.J. Moore away, who would have been the top target for Bryce Young, they also traded this year's number one pick. So they don't have one. So who's going to want that job? Name me a coach who wants to coach the Carolina Panthers. Now, good luck on that search there, Dave Tepper. Uh, you've put yourself in a terrible situation, but it's your own doing. We'll be back. Fabulous fifth hour to come on Hook'em Up with Ian Rodby.
the fabulous fifth hour here on Hook 'em Up with Ian Rod B. As we told you all morning, Rod not here. Rod uh, getting through some uh, some illness that he's dealing with. Had a heavy fever yesterday. Let's hope the best for uh, RB, and uh, we'll keep you posted as we can. Also keeping you posted as we can into the fifth hour of our plan this weekend. You're making plans to get up to Arlington and uh, be a part of the Longhorns' first trip to the Big 12 title game since 2018. A chance to finish with, uh, man, what a what a season capper it would be to, to, to uh, finish off a 12-1 and season, uh, to, to, you know, win the Big 12 championship, make it a bookend. Of course, won the first one with the win over Nebraska way back in the 90s, and then the last one, two in between in 05 and 09. Not enough, I think that's fair to say, but at the same time, uh, would be a nice way to, to, to launch off into the, uh, into the Southeastern Conference and certainly launch off into whatever comes beyond Saturday. And as I've said, I think Sark, you know, he, he's, he's been – hesitant I think to go all in on lobbying for his team and the CFP he was asked about it yesterday and said why wouldn't I why wouldn't I think our team is but I really believe he wants to keep this team singularly focused on this game uh, understanding that uh, Mike Gundy's won seven of the last 10 matchups of this the, in this matchup including last year's game where we, we, we I was at the game I was in Stillwater Longhorns were the better team I mean, we wasn't close um, to me uh, as far as talent on the field but Oklahoma State with Mike Gundy and Spencer Sanders at the time found a way to win that game. And don't think Mike Gundy's not going to have something up his sleeve here. He's, you know, found a way to go from 2 and 2 to 9 and 3 and win 7 of 8 and put them in this game. Uh, you know, they're a two touchdown underdog, but I don't think that matters to Mike Gundy. So point being, if you're Steve Sarkeesian, you have a chance to win this game and you know then then I think right after the game on your post game news conference on the field on ABC you immediately begin to lobby for your team. You immediately to begin to, you know, scream from the rooftops about your team, the one loss, the best win in the country, your you know, narrow last-second loss to Oklahoma, your rival on a neutral site. Um, that's not a bad loss at all. Uh, Oklahoma's a top-15 team right now in the country, and they beat you by an eyelash. And you beat Alabama. You have the best win of anybody. That will be the message from Sark. But uh, I do believe it's going to come and will begin right after because uh, that next morning, Sunday morning, is when the college football playoff committee will announce the Final Four. Uh, and that's the one that matters. There will be another one revealed tonight. And, Ty, you were saying you believe it's going to be uh, uh, tonight it will be uh, that Texas will move ahead of Oregon. Is that uh, right? Uh, I think that would be make a lot of Longhorn fans happy if Texas were to move ahead of Oregon based on a 50-point win over Texas Tech on Friday night. I think so. Uh, I mean, a win over a common opponent. Uh, Tech struggled with Texas Tech in Lubbock. Uh, obviously, that's right. Playing there is different, but uh, and it was way months before. But uh, you know, I, I think the the committee that will give them enough reason uh, to to move. I think the you're right out. about that. I, I uh, but I mean, the question is, if you go ahead of them tonight, will it matter if they beat Washington, and will that give them the data point they need to move back in front of Texas? Big picture. That's a scenario, and I'll be eager to see that tonight when it comes out. The college football playoff rankings. Uh, will be revealed for the, the penultimate rankings. And uh, I think we'll all be eager to see where that stands. I mean, obviously, Ohio State's going to tumble. Does Texas stay ahead of Ohio State as a one-loss team? They're not in the AP poll. What does the committee believe tonight uh, will be, you know, much awaited. But the most important ones are obviously Sunday morning. And the Longhorns, you know, have to, to put that final data point, clinch a championship, and then begin to make the case because you just said it. I mean, the, the, the Longhorns in Oregon now have a common opponent who was Texas Tech. And I know it says 38-30 to 30 on the scoreboard with Oregon over Texas Tech, but that was a 31-30 to 30 game. Uh, and Texas Tech had a chance to go win that game, and there was a sack fumble uh, return for a touchdown that made it 38-30. to 30. Um, It was a very close game. Texas just beat Tech by 50. So, you know, again, it's different times of the year, but you know, wins matter. Uh, on the field matters. And Texas has more quality wins than Oregon. They've got the best, better road win without the Alabama game. Uh, seven Longhorn opponents are bowl eligible, including Texas Tech, who they just beat by 50 points, and they share that common opponent. Uh, and obviously, if they were to beat Oklahoma State on Saturday, that would be a nine-win team that's uh, playing for a championship. So a uh, lot stacking up, but you got to go win this game. Before we get to a conversation we had earlier uh, with our buddy Ari Temkin of Sirius XM's Big 12 Radio, his thoughts on this Longhorn game. Of course, Ari used to work with us here in Austin, covered the Longhorns closely. Now he lives up in Dallas uh, and does great stuff there, but working for Sirius XM. I wanted to play this cut from, from Sark before we get to, uh, for, to Ari, because Sark, we just talked to Craig Flowers, you know, expert in leadership training and elite team training, and uh, spoke, uh, you know, Sark, he, Craig was, was impressed with the way Sark has gone about intentionally building his culture in comparison to some other you know, previous Texas coaches and certainly Jimbo Fisher. But uh, let's hear Sark. He was asked yesterday uh, about 
you know, Culture Wednesday. Somebody asked him, what are Culture Wednesdays? What is it about? How does it work? And how has it impacted your locker room? No, so we started um, Culture Wednesdays not this past summer, but the summer before. So going into season two. Um, so my, my, my thing is, you know, the old adage, you know, trust equals time plus consistency. And so I think one of the things you're always trying to do as a coach is build trust from coach to player, player to coach, and then player to player. Um, and But it's hard to build trust when you don't really know each other yet. And so I've always tried to do culture activities um, after year one because then you start to really get to know people and personalities and things and you start to get an idea of, of uh, who's really invested in what you're trying to accomplish and, and maybe who's not totally on board, which, which that's okay. I, I totally understand all that. So we started that a year ago and I thought that uh, the guys really responded well to it um, and they, they enjoyed it. And then we started doing those culture activities on – you know, Fridays before games. And I was a little bit more sporadic a year ago with that. I just did it kind of the weeks I felt like we needed it. But coming out of the season uh, last year and in my exit meetings with the players, they all referenced those culture Wednesdays. They all referenced those activities that we did about, you know, what was something that you really enjoyed this year and what would you like to see more of? They all wanted more of that. And so back to the drawing board, doing my self-audit, okay, how can we incorporate more of that and what different activities can I do? And so we've all got coaches in the profession um, that we've got different relationships with. And so I leaned into a couple of those guys on different things and sharing ideas that we do and that they do. Um, and so we really try to take it to another level this summer. And we've taken it to another level this fall. There's never a game when I don't do a culture activity Friday night, you know, before we go to the hotel or go get on a plane to, to go to a road game. And inevitably, it's forged a real connection because guys are really starting to know one another. Um, and guys are sharing things with one another. Um, that takes courage, right? Um, but also sharing things with one another that maybe they normally wouldn't. Like, how simple it is to write a note to somebody in the room that inspires you and why. And you write them a handwritten card and you hand it to that person. Well, that's really powerful for you to write as a person, but imagine the feeling it is when somebody hands you a card and you read why you inspire somebody else because you of your work ethic or the type of teammate that you are um, or your ability to persevere through an injury um, or your ability to be a scout team player knowing you're not playing on Saturday, but you know that you have an impact on us winning a game. And so all those types of exercises, I think, have grown us to be tighter together. And um, sounds like from the sounds of what the players say, that we're, we'll, be, we'll be doing more of them as we continue to grow. So that, that's pretty cool. All right, Steve Sarkeesian, uh, evolving as a person himself, and that's something uh, you know Craig was clear to say. If you you are one type of leader and you want to become a better leader, you have to rep it and you have to work on it, and you can. Uh, and Sark, of course, you know ego is the enemy, as as Craig said. Um, you know Sark was a young hotshot coach, right, coming through with the uh, USC and uh, gets a you know had a, offered an NFL job when he was in his early 30s with the Raiders. Um, he was a hot thing, and obviously that came crashing down with his personal issues at USC, and he's been open about that and dealt with that and then climbed his way back, and here he is, and now realizing how important it is to, to in invest that back into your football team. Pretty good story, uh, pretty good stuff, and the Longhorns would like to finish this thing with a championship. With that in mind, uh, some inside thoughts from uh, our man Ari Temkin. Ari, former colleague of ours, good friend of mine, but he is now you know, the host of Big 12 Radio on Sirius XM, Channel 375. Talked with him earlier about this matchup, Texas and Oak State.
to look like because he's an athletic freak. Yeah, uh, good arm, show, show the speed to get to the corner in that game uh, in his work in the fourth quarter of the big win over Texas Tech. Ari Temkin is with us. Ari, you, you gave us the great stat. I did not realize that uh, on, on Oklahoma State. Ollie Gordon, who may win the Doak Walker Award, he's kind of a fringe Heisman candidate, candidate right now after his five-touchdown performance in the win over BYU Saturday. Um, you know, he only had 19 carries in their first three games. Uh, he has burst on the scene here. Um, you know, well, what's the story here? Is that a Fort Worth? He's a guy that uh, wasn't the – highest recruit but man give me your give me your thumbnail and scouting report on ollie gordon and what makes him special yeah from Ulysses trinity um texas apparently got in on him late and he was firm in his commitment to oklahoma state he's a tall running back runs with great balance about six foot one um and look i mean i you know he's you know the idea here is and sark mentioned this yesterday you know he gets stronger as the game goes on i think it's more about you know how he maintains his level and yet other teams you know, disappear. He had five touchdowns, as you mentioned last week, but all five came in the second half in overtime. He had three touchdowns the week before that, and their win over Houston all in the second half. So when you look at the second half of games the last two weeks, he's had eight touchdowns uh, out of his 20 in the last two weeks. And uh, I mean, two weeks ago against Houston, they went away from him in the first half. It was kind of bizarre. And uh, and they, they found themselves in a hole, but they, they were able to dig out in the second half by just handing him the football. He's He's been, again, nothing short of spectacular. He's the main catalyst and reason for why this team is here. And it's not just him. It's the offensive line. It's the way the running game's built. Uh, but, yeah, he's he is a really talented running back, and he's just a sophomore. Yeah, just a sophomore, and you said uh, he gets stronger as the game goes on and wears teams down, and he certainly did that last week. And uh, but that does play right into the strength of Texas, who's allowing you know 2.7 yards a, a carry. Um, you know, but you know this is probably the best back they've seen. They gave up 100 yards to Tosh Brooks last week against Texas Tech, but they so overwhelmed the passing game uh, while giving up you know this couple of chunk runs to Taj, uh, kid out of Maynard. But uh, that will be the challenge. But it does seem to play to the Texas strength. Uh, hey Ari, big picture for the Longhorns. I mean, um, you know, obviously they're thinking get a win here and, and then see what happens on Sunday. What's your level of optimism the Longhorns could find their way into the uh, college football Final Four? Yeah, pretty crazy that that's even a question, right? I mean, you'd think a one-loss Texas who beat Alabama at in Brian Denny Stadium yeah. by 10 points. If they won a Big 12 championship, they'd be a shoe in for the playoffs. It's pretty wild. Yeah, I mean, I think it all starts with with Louisville beating Florida State. I think you got to have Florida State out of there because you know that's an undefeated Power Five champion if they win that game. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not so sure about how you know what they would need to happen in the SEC title. I'm I think I I would think Georgia to win and that way you'd knock Alabama officially out, even though you'd think Alabama should have been knocked out based on Texas's win over them. Um, and then you know Michigan's probably in. I don't think Ohio State has much of a shot. So, I, you know, when I look at kind of the other situations with four unbeatens right now in Power 5, I think it, it kind of starts there. It's all about Louisville knocking off knocking off uh, Florida State. But it, it's sort of ironic, right? I mean, this is a, a program in Texas that has had this brand that's prided itself on its brand. We've talked all the time about the importance of brand when it comes to the BCS National Championship or the college football playoff. And, you know, it's almost as if Texas now is feeling like what it's like to be Baylor, Oklahoma State in its final year in the Big 12. If they are left out, it would be absurd considering it's a one loss power five champion that beat Alabama on the road by 10 points. Hey everyone, it's Patrick Davis to tell you about a change we're making in the afternoons here on The Horn. We've heard your comments and texts asking for us to start earlier. So starting December 4th, the sports complex will be moving to 4 to 6 p.m. every weekday. Can't wait to get started with you on your commute an hour earlier and get the text line lit up talking Longhorns, Cowboys, Texans, Spurs, and more. So don't forget the new start time for the sports complex, 4 to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, starting December 4th, right here on The Horn. Hey, what's up, folks? This is your lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. We know Austin is a beautiful city, thanks in no small part to the skilled craftsmanship of our good friends at Ironworkers Local Union 482. They don't go to the office. They're the ones who build the office. They've been helping shape great Austin since 1935, and you see the labors of their love all over this great city in exquisite landmarks like DKR Stadium and the Pennybacker Bridge. And as the city continues to grow and thrive, so does Ironworkers Local Union 482. And right now, they're hiring over 3,000 
50,000 people. So if you're interested in a new opportunity, maybe you're frustrated with your work choices, maybe you're frustrated with your career path, maybe you just want to feel challenged, maybe you want to feel valued by your employer, you can become a valued member of Iron Workers Local 482 and accept the challenge of becoming the best version of yourself while helping shape Austin's economic development. Right now, they're hiring over 3,000 people. So if you're interested, reach out to them online today at ironworkers482.org. You can maximize your talent today and go online at ironworkers482.org. Make up. Aaron Hogan, Rod Babers, Hook Em Up, 1019 AM 1260, The Horn. Appreciate Ari Temkin. Uh, he mentioned uh, he'll be at that game on Saturday. I know a lot of you will as well. And The Horn will be at the Big 12 Championship game. Why wouldn't we, of course? Got to be up there. Friday afternoon, we've got a spot we're going to tell you about uh, starting tomorrow morning. We've got to put some final touches on the, on the, on the plan. But uh, we will be coming to you live from downtown Dallas uh, on Friday afternoon. Much very similar and maybe the same spot we were uh, last uh, October uh, when Texas played Oklahoma. Uh, if you like good barbecue, you might want to come join us. We'll tell you what time and where we'll be on, on Friday afternoon if you're making the trip up. And then on Saturday morning, we're going to be in Arlington, right in the belly of the beast at, at Jay Gilligan's. Jay Gilligan's is a really cool spot, and we've gotten several texts from folks who grew up in Arlington or, or you know, went to UTA or have been up there that, that uh, highly recommend Jay Gilligan's, and that's where I will be broadcasting live on Saturday morning. Uh, time still to be determined. We're trying to decide if we're going to go 8 to 11 or 9 to 11, but either way, we'll be on live with a, with a couple to three hours of pregame coverage ahead of that game. One note on Jay Gilligan's, they will be open early, like about 7.30, and uh, they do a shuttle over to the stadium. So if you uh, are going to the game and you want to you know, come see us and hang out and have some breakfast and uh, grab a drink, you can then jump on the shuttle and head over to Cowboy to uh, AT&T Stadium from there. And, of course, it will bring you back after the game uh, for your, you know, pick up your vehicle and whatnot. So Jay Gilligan's, if you're looking forward, it's, a, it's, it's in Arlington. Kind of old Arlington, as they call it, between UT Arlington, the campus, and, and Cowboys Stadium. So uh, that's where we will be, and we're looking forward to it. We're going to have uh, some our friends from inside Texas, uh, Bobby Burton, Jerry Hamilton. Those guys will uh, be a part of it Friday afternoon. Myself and hopefully Rod Babers is feeling better and will join us. Patrick Davis, Ty Henderson, and the Horn Crew. So, uh, uh, you know, it's the first time in five years. So we've got to do it up and do it right, and we will here on the Horn starting on Friday and into Saturday. Uh, here on the horn. So good stuff right there. Speaking of Jerry Hamilton, he is uh, the senior national recruiting analyst at Inside Texas. He'll be a part of our coverage on Friday afternoon, which we're excited about. I had a chance to speak with him earlier this morning about all things recruiting, all things Texas and Oklahoma State, and uh, we appreciate him joining us. We start with this because I'm going to talk some Texas and Oklahoma State before we get into some recruiting and what's to come with the portal and everything that you're trying to follow and cover uh, at a very high level. What? Uh, well, tell me about Ollie Gordon coming out of Euless Trinity and the type of player he was and what the Longhorns are dealing with. Amazing to me that Ollie Gordon only had 19 carries over the first three games, uh, but once Mike Gundy settled on him as the, the, the engine of their offense, he, he might be running his way to the Doak Walker Award. Yeah, very, very interesting, uh, you know, per player and prospect. Look, Euless Trinity wasn't the powerhouse they once were when he came out. I think maybe he was overlooked a little bit. With that being said, he was a four-star running back. He was the number 15 ranked running back in the in the country in the on-three industry ranking. He was the guy that Texas offered a, a couple of days before signing day. Um, and Mike Gundy actually kind of laughingly made reference uh, to that yesterday in the press conference when asked what you know what does Oklahoma State do when the blue blood like a Texas comes in and offers a 
one of their players late, and it was in reference to Ollie Gordon. And my and my, Mike Gundy laughingly said, "Oh yeah, you mean 12 hours before signing day?" <laughs> so I thought, I thought that was actually pretty funny. But Ollie Gordon is a physical back, uh, multi-sport athlete. You know, he grew up in that DFW area on the same youth football teams with. Uh, you know, some guys on the Texas team. There's a lot of familiarity in this game. There's a lot of guys from Dallas, a lot of guys from Texas on this Oklahoma State roster as normal. In fact, of the 33 prospects that have been drafted in the Mike Gundy era at Oklahoma State, 16 are from Texas, and the majority of those are from DFW area or East Texas. So, yeah, but Ollie was a physical player. He's a long-armed guy. Uh, I can tell you this. What happened there this year was they started the season with a three-quarterback rotation. And Ollie Gordon wasn't the hardest practice player, the, the guy that was going as hard as other people in practice. And I think, I, I think Mike Gunning and that staff had to get him to go, totally buy in. Um, they also had to stop the three-quarterback system, and they decided on Alan Bowman. And all that happened about the same time. And even though they have had that loss against Iowa State, that's when they started to come together. Um, and, and when he settled on Bowman, and when they changed the run game from more of a zone scheme to a pull through power scheme. I mean, and that's where they've gone, and that fits Ollie Gordon. Uh, and, and I think Mike Gundy's done a great job of getting that kid to maximize what he can do this year. And like you said, Aaron, he's probably going to win the Doak. Yeah, Doak Walker Award. It might have been Jonathan Brooks running to that uh, award had he not gotten injured yeah, against TCU. Was- um, and then the season he was having, but we've seen this Longhorn backfield, and that's you know that's another side of this game. You know, you know it's amazing we're you know going to be going to drill down on this the Longhorn first trip to the championship game since 2018, and Quinn yours should be the story. But we're talking about these running backs. I mean, uh, Tashard Choice. I mean, Steve Sarkeesian. They're doing a heck of a job. You co- you cover you cover these guys on the recruiting trail coming out of high school. But uh, so not surprising for you to see a guy like Jaden Blue or a guy like Savion Red stepping in and running the way they were. I mean, this has been pretty impressive as the Longhorn with C.J. Baxter going down, was down to their you know third, fourth, fifth running backs, and they still ran all over Texas Tech. No, they did. And, and, and the thing about it is, is they're all different backs. That's the good thing for Sark, right? I mean, C.J. Baxter fits that inside zone scheme. I mean, he fits it, and he's got great hands, and he's really good in pass pro for a young back. Jaden Blue, more of the home run hitter, right? You want to get him in space. You want to get him the ball on the edges. Uh, now, you got if you block it clean inside for him and he gets a crease, yeah, he makes a play like you saw against Texas Tech. Um, he doesn't necessarily fit the inside zone run scheme. And people are like, well, he's running tougher. Yeah, he's running tougher. But I'm, we're thinking more SEC next year and the large humans that are lined up across your from your large human and how does that play into it. But if they can get Jaden Blue in space, they can get the ball out of the backfield. Uh, and they can hit. He can hit that home run on those a few car- uh, a, a, occasional carry. While he is running tougher, he's never going to be a downhill power bat. But he has got a lot of home run, uh, big play, chunk yardage play uh, ability in him. Savion Red just run. I, I say runs pissed off. I mean that's that's what yeah. he does. That guy is angry on contact. He drops his pad. He is going to ma- He is not the fastest guy. He probably. He might would lose the 40-yard dash contest among the running backs, but that guy runs with a physicality that you rarely see in a great running back field. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, I think the – and the guys coming in, Aaron, Christian Clark, tremendous talent out of uh, Phoenix area. I think he is a big-time guy. I think he fits the scheme perfectly with an NFL running back body type. Jarrett Gibson – Florida's still trying to fight Texas there. Jarrett Gibson, 5'10", 207 pounds, a downhill back, really fits the scheme as well. Uh, So Texas has uh, two more guys on the way that are really talented as well. That's why we love talking to Jerry Hamilton. Jerry, we, we get in some debates because there are Longhorn fans uh, talking, you know, they, they go into the Big 12 title game. It's their last game in the Big 12, regardless of what happens beyond it. And uh, we saw the SEC schedule and the dates kind of trickle out yesterday from Chris Lowe at ESPN and the, the showdown here with Georgia uh, in, in October, and the, the game with Arkansas at Fayetteville, the game with A&M on November 30th. Uh, and, and there are still some Longhorn fans who feel like, hey, uh, why are we moving to the SEC? Why did we make this call? Why didn't we just stay here now that, uh, you know, the four corner schools are joining? and they've made the additions, we'd be better off here. You've made it clear in our visits that, you know, this, these recruiting halls the Longhorns are, are bringing in wouldn't be happening if the Longhorns were not moving to the SEC starting next year. 
One hundred percent. I mean, look, Cedric Baxter would not be at Texas right now. As great of a, a, a relationship builder and coach to Shard Choice is, he wasn't coming to Texas if they were in the Big Twelve. And that's opened up the state of Florida for Texas in recruiting. Um, it's opened up the really Louisiana more so. It's just a different response you get from kids. And then I, I, let's be real, like Brandon Baker, the offensive tackle from Modern Day, who's going to sign with Texas here in a, in a few weeks and enroll early. He pretty much came down to SEC schools plus Oregon and Nebraska. So it wasn't even Pac-12 out there. It was SEC or Big Ten. I mean, these kids, DeAndre Carter, his teammate, who Texas lost down on the Auburn, he's going to play in the SEC from modern day. This thing carries from coast to coast because these kids have grown up watching the SEC dominate college football, whether people think some of the teams are overrated or not. Now look, I'm just talking from a kid's point of view. They see every national championship. They see the awards. They see the NFL draft. And when you put those three things together, you have a powerful force in recruiting. So why did Texas move to the SEC? So they can maximize their force. And I think it's a powerful force when they're winning. And, and, and Sarkeesian, look, I mean, would Arch Manning have still gone to Texas if Texas won the Big 12? I mean, maybe, but maybe not. The whole family's played in the SEC. I mean, it's an SEC family if there ever was one. Two at Ole Miss, one at Tennessee, radio shows. I mean, everything's SEC with that family. So Derek Williams, last year out of Louisiana, would he have come to Texas if they're staying in the Big 12? I mean, look at the schools he was really considering. They were SEC schools. That's just where this is at. And in the state of Texas, um, you know, these kids know if you go and talk to them, you know, when they get that initial list of schools when they're 16 years old or 15, when they start getting recruited – I'm telling you, five out of seven, five out of the top seven in most kids' lists are SEC schools. Then you throw in an Ohio State, maybe if they like out West USC. That's just the reality of where recruiting is. And Sarkeesian built the staff uh, knowing Texas was going to the SEC uh, to make the most of it. Uh, great stuff with Jerry Hamilton, Longhorns. Uh, we'll play their final Big 12 conference game ever coming up on Saturday. Hey, uh, Jerry, the uh, the hire of Mike Elko at Texas A&M, uh, and how does it resonate with you, and uh, how does it resonate with recruiting? I know he mentioned the Texas high school coaches yesterday at his intro press conference. He's going to try to rebuild some of those relationships. Uh, that's the main rival and the, and the main recruiting rival, along with Oklahoma. How does Mike Elko resonate with uh, with recruits, you think? You, you know, I think it, what's interesting is when a coach is hired, I always I'll, the first thing I do is, okay, at, let's see what happens after he fills out a staff. Who does he put on that staff? Because that is so key in recruiting. Um, and I think because Elko was at A&M and he understands the state, um, you know, I think he's, uh, he'll keep Elijah Robinson, which is a key for uh, defensive line and keeping those guys on the team. Because there were a lot of Twitter goodbyes being written uh, a few, about 48, 72 hours ago um, that weren't published, but they were being written. So keeping those guys, the ones intact that they want to keep in the program, I think that's big. Uh, but I, I, it's, it'll be interesting to see who he fills out his staff with. Like I said, I don't think he's coming in green with not an understanding of, of the staff he needs to put together to, to maximize recruiting in texas uh so i i think i think they'll i think they'll do fine i think mike elko has enough of a feel to do fine him himself i, I mean you know to be determined there's just not i, I think he's i think he's good with coaches um, how's he going to resonate with kids i think that really comes down to how many games you win i mean he needs to have a good first season at texas a and i mean he's not coming in with a bare cup board now i mean this uh you know, they, they, it, there's a lot of talent on, on that on that team. They've just got to piece together some of the positions in need. Um, they got to keep their quarterbacks healthy. They got to better on the offensive line. But I mean, there's a lot of defensive line talent. There's some good young players in that secondary if they all stick around. Um, there's some good young running backs. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with an Evan Stewart if Damian Craig's not on that staff. Maybe Evan Stewart comes back to Texas A&M. Not out of the question because I think if Damian Craig w- w- is retained, there's no chance he comes back. Um, so we'll see we'll see what happens with Elko's offensive staff. And I think he understands and knows all these things that I'm talking about. So it gives him an opportunity to have success. Jerry Hamilton. Last thing, Jerry, you talk to these coaches uh, all over college football and the high school coaches. Is there any way to put into perspective how busy this December gets starting Monday, whether you're playing in the playoff and you're Sark or not, or you're getting ready for a bowl game? The portal, you're trying to close a, a, you know, the 2024 recruiting class on December the 20th. That window opens uh, while you're trying to get ready for a bowl game, while you're trying to re-recruit your own roster to keep them out of the portal. Uh, you, you know, That's why we see these staffs continuing to grow with people. You just need as many hands on deck to yeah. handle the next couple of weeks starting monday 
Yeah, you have to have an NFL type of personnel department these days. There is no – Mike Gundy talked about it in his press conference yesterday. Um, he said all our coaches after the game Saturday, they won't go back to Stillwater. They'll scatter to go recruit. I mean, that's where we're at. I mean, that Big 12 championship game ends an hour and a half later. You're on the road recruiting. I mean, just think about that. You know, they go back with your team. You're hitting the road recruiting. The portal is madness. I mean, just, I mean, like the linebacker from Vanderbilt, the team captain put his name in the portal. Uh, Will Howard <laughs> put his name in the or, or now he's going to put his name in the portal already. I think it's going to be, I'm not sure it's going to be wild this year, but I think it's going to be a little bit more so than last year. Um, I, I think this is the first year that I think we're really going to test the limits of uh, of the portal. Uh, because just when you see the, the – the captain of the Vanderbilt football team put his name in the portal. I mean, that's just – that's thing you didn't think you would see in college football four years ago. And I know, look, he's put, he's been there a while, and he, he's got an opportunity to go win. And I mentioned he's a Flyer Mound Marcus kid. Uh, so I think it's going to be crazy. These coaches, I mean, look, this, these next three weeks for them, like you said, Aaron, and if you're in the college football playoff, I mean, just think about yeah. dealing with all that. And the craziest thing, Aaron, <laughs> is let's say Texas wins Saturday. And let's say they get in the college football playoff. There's going to be kids exiting the program at Texas on a team preparing for a playoff game. That's how wild <laughs> college football is right now. Yeah, because they got to, you know, if they're on the depth chart down and they want to make a move, they're going to have to jump in early. Uh, it is crazy times, but always good stuff <laughs> with Jerry they Hamilton. Have to ju- they, have to jump in to, they have to jump in to get a spot somewhere. You can't wait until no, uh, January 2nd. I mean, you're, you're, you're no. too far behind if you're a kid that's leaving a school. When your money's on the line, put it on the line with MyBookie, a trusted sports book that gives you tools to win. At MyBookie, it doesn't matter if your team is up or down, you can easily cash out or bet the game.
Oh, time for what's popping. Appreciate uh, good conversations this morning. Really good. We'll have those all posted if you missed uh, Jerry Hamilton, Mike Craven earlier this morning, Dave Campbell's Texas football. Interesting conversation. He was at the Mike Elko introductory press conference yesterday down in College Station. And uh, also, of course, Craig Flowers jumped on. Just heard Ari Temkin. Good stuff today. Uh, if Rod is not back tomorrow, uh, and we hope he is, our buddy Nick Shuley is going to come on in. Uh, Nick Shuley, of course, uh, with our live music set list ATX, but also with the Clark Field uh, Creative and all the things he does with the Texas NIL space, is going to jump in with us if Rod is still not feeling well. Ty, of course, will be here as well. Uh, but a lot of good conversations there. Talk about this game. But, man, uh, you just heard Jerry Hamilton say it uh, from inside Texas. Uh, crazy that you really do have to have like an NFL front office staff to handle what's coming. And it's part of um, you know the, the, the blitz of – of dates that come, it's for every program. But you know the the, the date to be that is important for Texas is the De De December second, because that's the Big Twelve championship game. If you win that, uh, you're going to hear Steve Sarkeesian immediately begin to lobby for his team to be in the fourteen playoff if an, if a spot opens up, because uh, clearly if Florida State, uh, Oregon or, or if Florida State, Washington, Georgia, and Michigan win Saturday and Friday night. It won't matter. I mean, Texas is going to be out. There's no lobbying to do because that's four undefeated conference champions out of the Power Five. It's never happened before in the in the history of the Final Four here, the college football playoff. Uh, so if that happens in your Texas and they slot you at five, then you'll just, you know, you know you'll, Longhorn fans will be shaken and frustrated because, man, because um, as Ari Temkin said this hour, I mean, think about a 12-win Texas team uh, with a conference championship, a win over Alabama by 10 points at Alabama not getting in. That, that would be unthinkable when the season begins. But if those four undefeated teams win, then, you know, you, you have no control. But if one or two or if there are some losses in there, if there's some chaos, then you have to politic and you have to lobby. And the Longhorns have a really strong case, especially if they finish off Oak State and do it impressively on Saturday. Uh, they would have a really, really strong one-loss resume, maybe the best one-loss resume. And uh, so we'll see the college football playoff rankings come out tonight. Ty, our producer, Ty Henderson, is of the opinion that tonight Texas will leapfrog Oregon, which Texas fans have been asking for uh, all this time, that they should be. Um, you know, Oregon got a win last week, but over a bad team. Texas beat a bowl-eligible Texas Tech team 57-7. to And that bowl-eligible Texas Tech team, Oregon beat them by inside a touchdown at the beginning of the season back in September, same night that, uh, um, you know, last time the uh, – the Texas, with the same night Texas was beating Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Oregon was playing Texas Tech in Lubbock and won by eight points. But as we said, that came, those seven of those points came on a, on a very, very late touchdown that you know, kind of covered a spread for a lot of, it was a bad beat for a lot of gamblers because uh, it was 31 to 30 uh, at the time of that. And Texas Tech was trying to go win the game and ended up as a, as a fumble for a touchdown. So uh, that will be tonight. We'll see. And if Texas does move ahead of Oregon, and then there is some chaos in the top four. You know, does Texas stay ahead of Oregon if Oregon were to beat Washington? You know, that's the other p puzzle piece you have to put in there. Uh, one of the things for Texas is they're playing a 9-3 a and three Texas uh, Oklahoma State team who's ranked 19th right now. We'll see where they're ranked tonight coming off their comeback win over BYU. Probably don't move a lot there. Uh, but so that's how slim the margins are uh, for this. And so if you're a Longhorn fan, Ty, you've, you've rooted for Longhorns your whole life. This would be very frustrating to go 12-1 and one narrow loss to your rivals in the Cotton Bowl, beat Alabama, yet not get to play for a national championship. That will change next year with the 12-team playoff, at least for this season. And this team that's, that's you know, got, got, got some special in it, that would be frustrating if you end up playing like a two-lane in the Cotton Bowl or something, you know? Yeah, that'd be terrible. It'd be all for nothing. <laughs> be all for nothing. Yeah, well, you'd have a Big 12 Conference Championship, and I, you know, I, I hope that doesn't happen for Sark and this team. But it, you know, there's a real possibility. Now, you know, the the real controversial part will be if if another one loss team sneaks ahead of them, and who will that be? You know, the candidates would be. You know, you can already hear the arguments, right? Oregon would be one. Uh, Ohio State is one that people are going to push for. They have a huge fan base, and they've been, you know, they were in the Florida Final Four last year. I don't think they have an argument, by the way. Cause Oregon's argument would be actually pretty strong if they beat Washington, third-ranked team in the country. Um, but, you know, then you start really drilling down on the, uh, the strength of schedules and quality wins and bowl victories and all those things. Uh, it's very close with Texas and Oregon, especially if Oregon beats Washington. And how about this, Ty? Oregon is a nine-and-a-half point favorite in that game. I mean, you, they played, and it was a hell of a game in Seattle – way back in October, uh, and, you know, the, the, 
nine and a half. That seems high, but that's how uh, even Vegas has a really high power rating on Oregon, and they know Washington's kind of just just skating by here, surviving games like they have the last couple of weeks. Um, so nine and a half, that's a lot. What's your what's your lean on that, Mister? What's popping? Uh, I think it'll be closer than that. I do too, but you know, I mean, th- this is this is part of why, for whether Longhorn fans are frustrated or not, why Texas is why Texas why Oregon has been ahead. There's a, there's a there's just a, a predominance within the committee that Oregon's just better than Texas, right? At the end of the day, that's what it's about. Uh, best four teams that Oregon. Whatever stat and metric you want to put, you have to use the facts and the data to create your opinion. But at the same time, there's the eye test, and Bo Nix is completing you know 80% of his passes this year. Um, you know he's their loss at Oregon or to, to to Washington came when they you know, all those fourth down non conversions didn't take points. Almost Dan Lanning cost his team that game. So they're a really good team, offense to defense. Uh, and and I but I think Texas is a really good team, obviously, offense to defense, and that's going to become the argument between Oregon and Texas. I don't think Ohio State will have an argument because if Texas beats Oklahoma State, they'll be a you know 12-win conference champion. Best Ohio State can do is an 11-1 and one, didn't even play for your conference championship. That's going to eliminate them, and we'll see where they are tonight when the, the new rankings come out. Uh, Georgia, if Alabama were to beat Georgia, uh, Ty, how about that uh, argument that they've won two back-to-back national championships, uh, they lost to Alabama in the championship game, after a great regular season, uh, would Texas move ahead of Georgia or would they keep Georgia ahead? They'll be the push. I think Texas should be ahead of Georgia in that scenario. Um, so those would be the one-loss teams that you're concerned about. Obviously, if, if Iowa beats Michigan, they're dropping. Uh, you're going to drop behind Texas if Texas wins. So, uh, And you know, obviously the most likely thing to happen that could benefit Texas as a Big 12 champion is Florida State, as everybody, all of our guests, and we've all mentioned. If Florida State with a backup quarterback can't beat Louisville, and, and Ty, how about this? Even if it's close, right? Even if it's a really close game, is there any chance under the theory of best four teams that Texas could get in with a really impressive win over Oklahoma State like, a, like they did last week, like a big dominant performance while Florida State scuffles and but beats Louisville? I, I can't imagine it. A 13-win conference champion from the ACC not getting in, but there will be those, especially in Longhorn land, who would argue, wait a second, we're trying to get the best four teams. And with Jordan Travis, yes, they're one of the best four teams. But without him, they are not. What's your uh, what's your say on that argument, my friend? I mean, that would be pretty outrageous, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to see it happen. You think that would be outrageous? Well, again, if you go to the mission statement and the creed of the college football playoff, um, it's to get the best four teams, not the most proven teams. That's really not it. It's not even about that. Who are the best four teams? And that's always been the criteria. If Texas is a conference champion, one loss to Oklahoma, and they are healthy, right? And they are a healthy football team with their starting quarterback. There's going to be a case to be made that they're the better representative than even a 13 and 0 Florida State team. I don't think it's outrageous. I don't think it would happen though. I really don't. I don't think it's an outrageous thing. But I do think the, you know, the health of your team will be should be taken into consideration. Uh, but I think you're right, Ty. That it. Uh, Outrageous, I won't go, but unlikely would be an adjective I would use on that for Texas. But uh, that's what they're trying to get to. And then to Jerry Hamilton's point here and what's popping to wrap up a, uh, a Wednesday, uh, Tuesday edition. Looking forward to a Wednesday. Hopefully Rod Babers can rejoin us. If not, Nick Shuley will be here. Um, you think about that, Ty, the, uh, the, the, the staff of a college football program right now. Uh, if you're Texas and you win this game, no matter what happens, you're going to a big bowl game. You're either going to be you know, heading to the Sugar Bowl or the Rose Bowl for the semifinal. Uh, on January 1, or you're prepping for a New Year's 1 Bowl, which would be Cotton Bowl or Fiesta Bowl. Um, Your opponent will be determined on Sunday after the Final Four is revealed. Either way, you're preparing for a big game uh, right around the New Year. Uh, At the same time, you are then dealing with the portal. And as Jerry said, when when he says people, whatever game, now look, I mean, if Texas is preparing for the Final Four, I think there's going to be some guys on the Texas roster who maybe would consider entering the portal that will hold off and wait. Same time, if they're going to the Cotton Bowl or the Fiesta Bowl, you may see an exodus from Texas. And it's not like huge name guys, I don't think. I think it's going to be guys who you know, know another really, really good recruiting class is coming in, and they're already behind the depth chart. And let me see if I can go play and play more somewhere else uh, once this portal opens. And I'm thinking, obviously, of a Malik Murphy, uh, the backup quarterback. If he sees the writing on the wall with Arch Manning, he heard that ovation. On Friday when Arch Manning came in the game, he knows that Quinn Ewers is already leaning to, to coming back next year. You know, Malik Murphy very well could jump in the portal on December the 4th and try to get ahead of the curve. Uh, guys like that, Jaden Blue or, or some of these running backs, 
who are looking at it saying, you know, C.J. Baxter is here now. They've got two more big-time running backs coming in, Texas does, as Jerry pointed out. So maybe somebody in that running back room considers uh, the portal and not playing in the bowl game or even the Final Four. Uh, that's just the nature of where we're at right now. I mean, name guys that you're kind of counting on in your head as a fan that are going to be here that maybe explore other options, not because they're unhappy, and you talk about the culture of Texas, but because it's just a better opportunity where they can play more. Uh, that will be interesting, and that's going to be happening all over the country. By the way, Ty, some breaking news. It looks like, according to this report, uh, Mac Brown has found his new quarterback because, you know, Drake May is going to the pros, right, the North Carolina QB. Uh, he's headed straight to the NFL and will be a high draft pick. Uh, how about this? Max Johnson, Texas A&M quarterback, transferring to North Carolina. And it says here under this uh, that the Heels have found their new quarterback. Max Johnson, who came from LSU to A&M, now in the wake of the Jimbo Fisher conversation, is moving to North Carolina where he'll be in competition to replace Drake May. Does that do anything for you? No. Not popping? Nothing. Not no, popping. It's the opposite of popping. Not popping. Uh, agree with you on that. What's popping tonight for you, Ty? You've got uh, your Sex Panther pick of the night. Brought to you by my bookie and the great folks at my bookie. Is there a, a game you're looking at where our 50 days of football is over, unfortunately? I don't even know. I don't want to call what we saw on Monday Night Football. That's not football. It's a terrible game. Should have flexed that game for sure. But uh, what's your pop and pick tonight? We've got NBA. We've got college hoops. What are we looking at? Mm, I think I'm just going to put some more money on Texas to win the national championship. Well, you're just going to keep funneling it uh, to win the national championship. That is, what are the odds of that right now, by the way? It was plus 900 it? yesterday. Okay. Probably, well, Fifth that's best good. odds. And, and to win the natty. Okay. So, and, and, and as we said, that's a bet right now that's uncertain whether they're going to get a chance to play for it. You know, they got to get in first. And uh, – um, so, yeah, you're trying to take the odds. If you think something's going to happen, they're going to get in, and then they're going to win the whole thing, which is pretty pretty ballsy, my friend. What about the Houston-Dallas game tonight in the NBA? Mavericks-Rockets. Uh, Mavericks favored by three and a half. Does that do anything for you? That gets you ginned up a little bit? We got the, the, the I-45 rivalry? Uh, I know Luka's a little banged up. Is he? Do you know if he's playing in that game? Luka Doncic uh, cleared to play. Clears to play okay. in that game. Rockets are eight and six with Ime Udoka. They're playing some pretty good basketball, right? I remember they started like zero and three or zero and four. Now they're eight and six. Mavericks are ten and six on the young season, and um, so that's a that, that's a, that's a worth watching situation tonight for your uh, your Spurs and your Mavericks. So keep an eye on that. Texas basketball back at it later in the week when they played Texas State. Uh, so that that popping. So you're just going to put money. You're what you're you're really serious about this. I know you were, you told me you're pretty much flat broke right now. So you're what do you? Using to wager, you pawning things now. I'm. Uh, these are hypothetical wagers. I'm letting people okay. know. <laughs> <You don't... laughs> and, and I said before right. the year, Texas was going to win the national championship. I said they're going to be undefeated. I was wrong about that. But I, I can still feel it. It's our year. You can still feel it. Got to make like sure we that. don't play Michigan at any point. That'd be that's that's a key factor for me. Avoid Michigan. Avoid Michigan. Um, well, that can happen, right? It depends on where you land, that you can uh, avoid Michigan until the championship game or have someone knock them off in the semifinal so you don't have to deal with them. All right, T.Y., great stuff, my friend. Thank you to all of our great guests today, Craig Flowers and Jerry Hamilton and Ari Temkin and Mike Craven, all of those interviews about our, our podcast at our website at hornfm.com. Tomorrow on the show, as we said, we hope Rod returns. If not, we will be cranking it with uh, Nick Shuley and Ty and getting you ready for the Big 12 championship game, hopefully to have uh, more – firm specifics on our plan up in uh, the Metroplex when we get up there on Friday and into Saturday. We'll hit that for you tomorrow. 6 a.m. Our morning by morning, five hour, five day a week conversation continues tomorrow. Coming next, it will be uh, Jim Rome, then the Rich Eisen Show, then Patrick with the Sports Complex. Have a wonderful Tuesday, everybody. We'll talk to you tomorrow at 6 a.m.